JavaScript is the future of the web. The use of JavaScript in the front end has been reaching its peak recently. Nowadays, JavaScript also paved its way into backend development with Node.js. That's why in this course, we'll be diving deep into it to make sure you come out with a good understanding of how it works. So how is this course set up? It starts with basics like variables and data types and gradually moves to more complex topics. There's a lot to cover, but it has been broken up into bite-sized lessons. In each lesson, we'll introduce the topic briefly and provide you with a list of things you should pay attention to. You'll be asked to watch the lectures, expand on things you've learned, solve quizzes, and generally do everything you can to best consume the material. Finally, we'll include additional helpful resources and other potentially useful materials at the end of each lesson. This course doesn't have any prerequisites, but don't think it's easy because of that. It's going to teach you the basics as well as the most advanced JavaScript topics. With this course, you're also getting access to a private Slack community. Make sure to join, bookmark it, and visit it often. There, you can ask any questions you might have you're going to receive the instructions to join in one of the next lectures. So how can you get the most out of this course? This is an extensive course. It covers the whole of JavaScript. With that in mind, here are my tips for getting most out of the course. First, follow along the lectures. Don't just watch, actually do the work. It is crucial that you replicate each and everything shown in the video. Try out the exercises on your own. Don't just skip to the solution. It is absolutely okay if you don't know how to solve something. We learn by making mistakes. And thirdly, join the Slack community. Ask questions, help others, and collaborate. With that said, let's go to the next lecture of the course. You browse through the course curriculum for a bit, and you couldn't seem to find any projects. That's because there are none. The main premise of the course is to get you up and running with any framework or technology you'd like. As you finish the course, you'll be able to start mastering React, Angular, Vue, Node, or absolutely any other framework and library using JavaScript. All of these frameworks are built on top of JavaScript. That's why to learn any of them, you must master JavaScript. And that's exactly what we do here. Other courses throw in a few small projects like building calculators, countdown clocks, or background color changers. But these are, to say at least, funny. These are not real projects you can showcase on your portfolio. These are not projects that are going to land you a job if you show them to potential employers. These are not the projects you're going to learn from. For that reason, this course doesn't throw in any unnecessary details and small projects that you would never use. It capitalizes on teaching you complex topics in depth so that you can be ready to take the next step in your career. As I mentioned, this course is going to help you master JavaScript. And after you do that, all the other doors are going to open for you. You can jump into React, for example, and start building large and extremely useful applications. Or maybe you decide that backend is more your thing. So with all the JavaScript knowledge that you gain from this course, you're going to start learning Node.js to create complex systems and APIs for applications such as e-commerce stores or even social media networks. In the next lecture, you're going to receive the access code for a special 24-7 community where you will be able to ask any questions you might have during the course, or you can use it for networking with fellow aspiring developers. Let's start making you a professional developer right now. Before starting with the course, let's first set up the needed tools and environment so that our workspace will be comfortable and convenient for performing the best JavaScript work possible. Throughout this course, we are going to use Google Chrome. It's the best browser for web development. It has the fastest engine and is used by over 82% of people. It's one of the best choices out there. So if you don't already have it, here's how you can download it. Just go to google.com slash chrome. There you will be greeted with this page and you can just download it for any operating system. One of the best reasons to use Chrome is because of its amazing developer tools. Developer tools allow you to do a range of things from inspecting currently loaded HTML, CSS and JavaScript to showing which assets the page has requested and how long they took to load. You can open DevTools in any browser by right-clicking the site and clicking inspect right here. 
this is going to open the developer tools. You can also use the shortcut Command Option J on Mac or F12 on Windows. So you can see this is the Chrome DevTools. Now let's close it and try using the shortcut. So one more time, Command Option J on Mac. Let's see if it's going to open it. And it does. And you can do the same thing on Windows with F12. That's it. Let's close these warnings here and let's explain what developer tools are. In essence, developer tools window is very intuitive and you will easily get used to it as it has all standard bars like console, elements, sources and so on. We're going to use them throughout this course. Let's test out the console section. In there, you can execute JavaScript code. And that's the place where all of our console logs are going to be visible. We're going to use it a lot. This is going to be the first line of code that we're going to write. So you can say console.log and then wrap it in parentheses. And inside of there, in quotes, you can write anything you want. People usually do hello world. So if you take that and press enter, you can see we've just written our first line of code and we can see it right there. Of course, we are going to do much more interesting stuff later on. With this, we now have the ability to see websites we can create. But using which tools can we create them? Code Editor is a program that lets you write and edit code. Theoretically, you could use Notepad, which you get with your Windows or Text Edit on Mac, to edit and write code. But people have created much better alternatives, which give you a lot of settings themes, code highlighting, easy navigation through documents, and much, much more. You're free to choose from various code editors available, like Atom, Sublime, Brackets. But in this course, we'll bet on Visual Studio Code created by Microsoft. It has the largest community, great support, and a huge variety of extensions, plugins, and themes which you can use and experiment with. So how can you download Visual Studio Code? You can just Google Visual Studio Code Download. And as you can see, you can download it on Mac, Linux, or Windows. Let's open the link and see what we have in there. We can close the console. As you can see, with just one click, you can download it for your operating system and the process of installation is going to be pretty straightforward. Once you install it, we're going to go through a quick Visual Studio Code tutorial. Once you start the program, you should see a nice interface and something like a welcome file opened. In the right part of the file, there's a section called Learn. There you will find all the info from keystrokes to how to change your theme. Feel free to explore and play around. However, now I want to show you how to create a basic HTML file and integrate it with JavaScript. First, let's exit the full screen right there. Then you can open File Explorer or Finder if you're on Mac and you can create an empty repository or that's just going to be a folder. I created mine, it's called Introduction to the Course 01 and you can just drag and drop it right there to Visual Studio Code. Once you open it, you'll see that we have this timeline, you may have a lot more stuff here, but the only thing that we're concerned with is this part with the folder name. You can expand that Right now, you can create a new file by right-clicking, clicking New File, and then you can type the file name. In this case, it's going to be script.js. That's immediately going to open the file for you, and in there, you can say console.log, and then again in quotes, hello world. This is the same line we've written in the console before. You can save it by pressing Command or Control S. If the file is not saved, on top right, you should see the circle right there, but when you save it, the circle is gone, that means the file is saved. The question is, how can we run that file? Well, here we need the browser. And what does the browser need? It needs HTML. So we can come here one more time, create a new file and call it index.html. Inside of here, we just need a basic HTML structure. You can type HTML and then Visual Studio Code is going to give you a few options. You can just select the HTML5 and this is immediately going to generate basic HTML structure. The only thing we need to add is a connection to our JavaScript file. You can add it just above the closing body tag, so right there. You can type script and right here before the closing of the opening tag, you can type 
src, which is going to be equal to script.js. This now means that our files are connected. You can now right click the index.html file and then click reveal in finder or in file explorer. Now this is going to pop up and you can just double click the index.html, which should open it in the browser. Of course, we just have the empty page, but if you click inspect or just open the Chrome developer tools, you should be able to see we now have the console, which should mean that our page is successfully connected to JavaScript. What can you see in the console? Hello world, right? That's what we expected. You've just created your first basic JavaScript program. Congratulations. We will set up all the basics of Visual Studio Code, but before we start learning, we want our environment to be as good as possible so that we can learn and write code quickly. For that reason, we are going to install a few extensions which provide extended functionality. Some make our team prettier and some allow us to see live changes in the console as soon as we save the file. So let's install them one by one. The fifth icon on the left side should be the extensions tab. So you can find it right here, extensions tab, and then in there, you can install the extensions we need. The first extension on our list is called One Dark Pro. That's going to be this theme that you can see right there, because right now the colors could be a bit different for you. You can click it, and then that should open the extension page. Right there should be a button install. Once you install it, it's going to ask you whether you want to switch to it and you can just press enter. As you can see, our code editor instantly looks a bit more modern. The second extension on the list is called live server. You can search it up, live server. Once we find it, it's going to be the first one on the list. And again, you can click install. Now, if we go back to our index.html file, you can find it on the left side, right click it, and you should see this message, open with live server. You can click it and we'll be using that to test our JavaScript code. A new empty browser window is going to open up. Don't forget to open the console by right clicking and then clicking inspect. And now we should see the same thing we saw before, but in this case, it's always going to update whenever we add something new, as you can see, live reload enabled. In the next video, I'll show you how to have the console opened side by side to the editor so we'll be able to see all JavaScript responses in real time. In this short video, we'll talk about our workflow. It's important that you know exactly how we are going to do something so that you can replicate it or practice by yourself. This course is going to be divided in sections. In between sections, we are going to have special projects, but more on that later. The workflow is going to be as follows. First, we are going to open an empty folder. We just did that before. As you can see, if we collapse this, you can see that we opened our empty folder, which now has two files. After you open your empty folder in Visual Studio Code, we are going to create those two files, index.html and script.js. Really important step, of course, is to connect them by adding the script tag in the HTML file and you can easily do that by adding this line right there. To make sure your files are connected, you can add a simple console log in the script. If it shows in the browser, that means that we've successfully connected it. After we do that, you're going to go to index.html and then just click open with live server. That's going to open it so that we can see changes in real time. So how can we open the console and the code editor side by side? First, open the console by right clicking and then clicking inspect. On the top right, you're going to see three dots right there. I hope you can see them on the screen. And there you can find the dock side. You're going to choose the first option, undock into separate window. This is going to open the console in a completely new window. So what we can do on Mac is unfull screen this and just do it like this, open the console, Put it on the side but now we have some extra space here so what max allow you to do is to just open it full screen go back and then open the visual studio code in full screen as well and then just merge them together so find the actual dev tools find the code and just drag it onto the side right here that's going to enable us to have both open at the same time don't worry the process on windows should be even easier you can just take the window of the console, 
and drag and drop it to the left side. That's it. Really, really simple. With that out of the way, we now successfully put our console to the left side and the code editor to the right side. If these warnings bother you, don't worry, this comes from Chrome itself, but we can remove them by going to this settings icon and then selecting selected context only. So if you tick that, the errors should be gone and that's it. Now, how can we test it? Well, because we are using live share, you can just type console.log. So we can just add another console log and let's just say test. We add that test and remember, we need to save the file. So currently you can see this dot here. That means the file is not saved. So if we save it and do that, you can see that our console is immediately updated. That's great. One more thing that you can do is with control or command plus or minus, you can bump up the font size. Feel free to do it as you like it. You can do the same thing for Visual Studio Code as well. I like to keep it like this. And with Control or Command B, you can completely collapse this thing, or you can just press here. Now we have just our console, the font is big, we can see all the changes, and that's it. We've spent some time to set this all up, but it's going to save us a lot of time in the future, because right now our environment is completely set up everything works and our workflow and learning process is going to be amazing. That's all that we need for now. Go and grab a cup of your favorite drink, cool down your brain and let's dive into real programming. Welcome to the first section of the course. In the next few videos, we are going to explore topics of variables and data types, two of the most important concepts in any programming language. Variables are used to store information to be referenced and manipulated in a computer program. They also provide a way of giving variables a descriptive name, so our programs can be understood more clearly by the reader and ourselves. It's helpful to think of variables as containers that hold data through the entire application. The sole purpose of variables is to store data in the memory. These three boxes represent three different variables. Let's say this variable is called box one and it stores the value of Bob. The second variable can be called anything. It can be called test and the test stores the value of true. The third box, which is the third variable, stores the value of a number 35. As you can see, variables in JavaScript are containers which hold reusable data. In other words, they are units of storage, like some sort of a box into which we can put data. Using the following steps, you can create and use variables. So first, we need to create a variable with the appropriate name. Secondly, we have to store value in it. Thirdly, we have to retrieve and use the stored value. And optionally, you can change the value and then reuse it again. Now, let's open our Visual Studio Code and see it in action. As always, we have our Chrome opened. Then we're going to have our Visual Studio Code and we're going to create a folder which is going to have two different files in it. We have index.html and script.js. I call this file 02 variables and data types. We're going to drag and drop it here. As always, make this full screen and then in there, don't forget to link this to the script and let's say console log. In there, we're going to say welcome to variables. And that's going to open the browser for us. In there, we don't have anything in the browser, but if you inspect it, then you should be able to see the console open. If it's not opening in the new window for you, go click these three dots and then click undock in separate window, and then just drag it to the left side of your actual window. That's it. We have the console open on the left side and the Visual Studio Code on the right side. In here, you can click this wheel and click selected context only to remove the errors. And if you save it, we should get welcome to variables. Great. Now we're good to go. So the values that we store in our variables can come in the form of predefined data types. The computer needs to know of which type is our value so it can manipulate it properly. The lecture on data types is coming really, really soon in the course, and it's going to explain all the details about them. So how can we create a variable? We need a var keyword. So let's create var. In there, the second thing we need is the variable name. So let's say variable name, just like that. Then after the equal sign, we put the value which we want to assign to this variable. 
Right now, let's take the value of this console log. Welcome to variables. Let's copy it, paste it here. That's it. So right now, what we can do is we can take this variable name, which is a variable, and put it in the console log. Remember, variables store some values. In this case, we put the value of a string, more than later, in here in this console log. If we save that, you can see currently it's not saved because of this circle. If we save that, you can see we get absolutely the same thing in the console. We've successfully used our first variable. Just a simple note, you're always going to see me adding semicolons at the end of lines, as you can see here on line one and line three. Also, if you don't know what lines are, on the left side, you can see we have different lines. So our programs later are going to have 10, 50, 100 lines. So whenever I say something is on line one or line three, you can just see it on the left side. So we use semicolons. They are optional, but omitting them can lead to undesired consequences. It's a good practice to always put them at the end of the line, and you'll often see me doing that. In the next video, we are going to see two more additional ways of creating variables. In earlier versions of JavaScript, variables were solely declared using the var keyword, followed by the name of the variable and a semicolon. So let's see, var variable name, equal sign, the value of the variable, and then the semicolon. This is how we would do it. After ES6, which is a newer version of JavaScript, we now have two new ways of declaring a variable. We can take a look at both of them one by one. The variable let, so we can exchange this var to let. The variable let shares lots of similarities with var, but unlike var, it has some scope constraints. The scope is out of scope of this introductory video, but we will explain it in greater detail in a later video. The only thing that you need to know right now is that let is the preferred way of creating variables in modern JavaScript. So we would do it like this, let variable name and then the value. We also have something known as a const. So let's write it right there, const. Const is another variable type assigned to data whose values cannot and will not change throughout the whole script. So if we say const variable name is going to be equal to this, we can never reassign variables. What does it mean to reassign variables? Well, let's first go back to let, as we said, that is the preferred way of writing variables. And now let's try to reassign the value. So we can then reference the variable name right there, variable name, and then we can make it equal to something else that is not its initial value. So let's say hello. So right there, I'm going to say variable name is going to be equal to hello, and then we are console logging it. Remember, to see the output, we need to save the file. So right now, I'm going to save the file, and in the console, we get hello. So how did this program execute? First, we declared a variable, we gave it a default value. Then we reassigned the variable, or just we gave it a different value right there to the same variable, and then we console logged it. If we added another console log right there before we changed it, so let's say we want to console log it first and then we want to console log it after the reassignment, we can save that one more time and you can see we first get welcome to variables and then we get hello. If we were to do that with const right there, const variable name and in here we are redeclaring it, you would get an error, uncaught type error assignment to constant variables. That means that we can never reassign values to a constant variable. So if we remove this, now what do you think? Can we name our variables literally anything we want? Well, we have only a few criteria when it comes to creating variable names, also known as identifiers. We have a few rules when it comes to creating an identifier in JavaScript. First rule is that the name of the identifier must be unique. So. As you can see, if we copy this and then paste it, you can see we got an error. We broke the first rule. Identifier variable name has already been declared. That way we get an error. We don't get our console log. So we broke the first rule. If we rename this to variable name two, and then let's say try to console log it, variable name two, and we can even change the value. Welcome to variables two, let's save that. And as you can see, we got both console logs there. We didn't break the first rule, which is never have two of the same variable names.
The second rule is that the name of the identifier should not be any reserved JavaScript keyword. For example, we cannot declare a variable like this. const let is going to be equal to welcome to variables. If we try doing that, let's see what happens. Uncaught syntax error, let is disallowed as lexically bound name. We can also try const var because we know that the var is a specific thing in JavaScript. It means a variable. So we cannot call a new constant or a new variable var because that's already reserved. So if we try doing this, we get the same thing, unexpected token var. Let's try a few more reserved keywords. We know that uh, const const is also not going to work, unexpected token const. And let's say const function function is also a reserved keyword. We're going to see that later. So if I try doing this, as you can see, unexpected token function. That means that we cannot use names that JavaScript itself uses. Those are only some limited reserved keywords like var, let, function, and so on. We are going to explore all of them, but basically you can use anything you want. For example, you can say uh, name, and then you can put this to John or whatever, because name is of course not used by JavaScript. That would limit us a lot. So if we just did this, we are cons logging the name John. The third rule of naming variables is that the first character must be a letter. In here we have a letter, an underscore, so we can do underscore name as well or it must be a dollar sign. So only dollar sign, underscore, or any other letter are valid first letters for a variable. That's it. If you put any other special character at the first place, for example, let's say an asterisk sign, you can see immediately we get an error, unexpected token. That's not going to work. All the other characters besides the first one can be any letter, digit, or an underscore or a dollar sign. So we can say name and then we can put underscore, we can put test and then the dollar sign. That's a valid variable name. We can test it one more time right there and it works. But if we tried something like name and then provide an asterisk, that's not going to work. We cannot use special characters in naming our variables. That's it. So let's go back to the name. Let's just cons log the name. Okay, it works. To recap, there are three different ways to make or declare a variable. There's var, let me write that here. Var, there's also let, so let me write that here real quickly. And there's the const which we have right there. From now on, whenever we are creating variables, we are going to use either const or the let keyword. Const when variable is going to be constant or let when we plan on changing it later on. Also, a quick question for you. Which rule of variable naming did we break right here? Try to answer it right now. Of course, we named three variables the same thing, so we get the error identifier name has already been declared. That means we cannot have multiple of the same variable names. Let's move on to the data types to see what kind of data can we store inside of our variables. In the previous lecture, we mentioned that we can store values in variables and that these values need to be in form of one of the predefined data types. The concept of a value is somewhat abstract, especially to someone doing programming for the first time, but we're going to go through it together, nothing to worry about. As we mentioned, there are a few types of values called data types. Let's go through them one by one, and then we're going to explain each one in detail. We can separate data types of current JavaScript standard in two groups. Strings, numbers, booleans, null, undefined, and symbol are considered primitive data types. And only objects are considered complex data types. So as you can see right there, strings are going to be any textual values. Hello everyone, I'm glad that you're here is one. We can also put hello or the whole sentences or paragraphs. Those are strings. Numbers are, as you can see, five, six, seven. It could be one, it could be 10. It can be any decimal value or any whole number. Booleans are true or false. So Boolean type contains only two values. It can be either true or false. Null is only null, which is weird enough, but we're going to see use cases of that soon. And then undefined is undefined. Null specifies that we have something to store value in, but that value is simply non-existent. And undefined means that we don't have either the variable or the value. 
it's basically undefined, it doesn't exist. And then we have the symbols, we are not going to go through them a lot, they are extremely rarely used. And then the objects. Object is the most important data type, and it is one of the most important building blocks for modern JavaScript. Now, in next few videos, we are going to explore each one of these data types one by one in a separate video. In the following lessons, we are going to use a lot of comments. A comment is text in the code which is not read while we are running the code. Comments make your code easier to read and understand. They can help you and others to read your code. There are two types of comments, multi-line and single line. So in here, I'm going to create a single line comment ironically saying single line comment, which explains that below this code, we are going to explain how we're going to write single line comments. In a single line comment, anything that follows the two forward slash characters, as you can see, forward slash, forward slash. So anything that follows these characters will not be processed by JavaScript interpreter. Single line comments are often used for short descriptions of what the code is doing. So right now we can just say test, or we can say this is a single line comment, just like that. Now let's do a multi-line comment. Multi-line comment starts with a forward slash asterisk sign. Then we can spread on however multiple lines we want, and then we do asterisk and then forward slash. Anything in between those characters is going to be considered a comment and is not going to be processed by JavaScript interpreter. For example, we can say this is a multi-line comment, just like that. As you can see, this is grayed out and is not real code. This is just a comment to make our code more readable. Multi-line comments are often used for descriptions of how script works. To practice creating comments, we can delete this and then document what we learned about variables in the few previous videos. So I'm going to create a single line comment and say creating a variable using var keyword, just like that. And in there, then we can say var, let's say variable name is going to be equal to test. That's it. We just created a variable using var keyword. And as you can see, your comment clearly explains that. Now we can copy this by selecting it right clicking it and then clicking copy, or we can just say command C and then command V or control C and control V if you're on Windows. So right now we can say creating a variable using let keyword. And then in there we can say let variable name. Of course we can console log it later. So console log variable name, great. And as you know, this is going to give us an error. So what we can do is we can also just comment this. What you'll often see me doing is I'm going to comment or uncomment something without actually typing two forward slashes. You can do that in Visual Studio Code by pressing command and then forward slash, or it's control forward slash on Windows. That simply comments the line, that's it. You can also do that on multiple lines. So if I were to comment this and then press command forward slash, it's immediately going to comment out everything. In 99.9% .9 of the cases, I'm just going to use single line comments. There's no need to use multi-line since we can just do command forward slash, which is basically make a multi-line comment using just the forward slashes. So that's it. That command forward slash or control forward slash keystroke is really, really important. You'll remember to use it often. So now since we got an error, I'm just going to comment this out. That's it. Now you can see we get test. Now we can create the final thing, which is going to be creating a variable using const keyword. Then we can just say const here. Now this is not going to work because you can see we have two of the same variable names, but if we comment it out, remember comments are not interpreted by JavaScript engine. So if you just do this and save, you can see we indeed do get our variable name test, but this time using a const variable. We can also write a few rules of creating variable names. So we can say, for example, variable naming. And then in there, we can say first rule is going to be uh, the name should be unique. The second rule should be the name should not be any reserved keyword. And then the third rule is that the name 
must start with either a character with a character an underscore or a dollar sign that's it so these were the comments if you just keep writing comments in your code it's going to make your code more readable some people say that you don't even need comments because the code you write should be clean enough so that everyone can read it by itself that logic is good but while we are just starting to learn how to code comments are going to greatly help you and everyone who reads your code great now with this short lesson about comments we can move on to our first data type which is a string the first data type we are going to learn is called a string so i'm going to delete all of this and create a single line comment which is going to say string so string is a data type used to represent text strings are simply fields of text that's it you already wrote some strings remember when we did console.log and then in there what you typed was the actual string so we said hello world like this console log is a method or a function which prints something to the console it prints a value but this value is of a data type string so you can see in there we have a string that's great we can also store this value of a string in a variable so i'm going to say const example string and then in there i can do the same thing hello world that's it and then remember we can simply say console log example string as the example string is the variable name of the variable that holds the value of our string so you can see right there we do get hello world a string in javascript as you can see must be surrounded by quotes as you can see in here we have a opening quote and a closing quote in javascript there are three types of strings single quotes double quotes and backticks so let's first create a string written with single quotes we are going to create a new variable const single quotes that's just the name of the variable remember this has nothing to do with the actual string it's just the name and we are going to make the value of it a single quote and then in there we can say hello for example that's it we've just created a string with single quotes we can console log it console log single quotes and we indeed do get the value of a string let's do a second example with the double quotes const double quotes again this is just the name of the variable has nothing to do with the actual way of creating a string and we make it equal to double quotes and then we can say basically the same thing but we're going to add two exclamation marks for example that's it to see the value we just need to specify the variable name inside of the console log that's going to print it to the console in there you can see we get hello with two exclamation marks that's it you just created two different variables using strings in two different ways but you may be thinking what's the difference what's the difference between the single quote string and a double quote string there is absolutely no difference they are identical double and single quotes are also called simple strings they are not complex strings we also have something known as backticks so i'm going to call a variable backticks so how do we create something known as a complex string or backticks string we put backticks as you can see it's almost the same as single quotes but it's angled to the right side a bit that should be the key left of the one key on your keyboard try it out if you cannot find it try googling for backticks for your specific keyboard then in there let's say hello and then let's say three exclamation marks just so we can see the difference again we get absolutely the same thing hello with three exclamation marks so why is it a complex string what's so special about the third way of creating a string backticks provide extended functionality they allow us to embed variables and expressions into a string by wrapping them into dollar sign and then curly braces i'm going to comment out these two lines and i'm going to create a new variable const called name for example in this case name is going to be let's say jane so what do we do with this variable name of course we can console log it just so we can see what name is as you can see we do get jane but how do we embed the variable name inside of the backtext string well as we mentioned we can use the 
dollar sign and then curly braces syntax. As you can see, this changed color. And then that means that anything that's put in between the curly braces is going to be executed as real JavaScript. So if you put name in there, we are not going to get hello name, we are going to get hello Jane. To test that out, let's just console log the backticks, which should now include the name. As you can see, we do get hello Jane. This is a convenient syntax that allows us to embed different variables into strings. So when would we use this, for example? Let's say that the user is logging in and he's going to enter his name, for example, John, Jane, or anything else. He's going to input his name via a field. We just hard coded the value here, but this is going to be coming from a field. And let's say his name is John. We're going to say, hello, John, and let's say, welcome. And as you can see, we got hello, John, welcome. But let's say that some other user enters, her name is Jane, and we got hello, Jane, welcome. This is really useful. So let me ask you a quick question. If we have an empty backtick string, and in there we say two plus two, and if we simply console log backticks, what do you think the output of this code is going to be? We save it and you can see two plus two as a string. But how would we make this into four? How would we make JavaScript know that we need to interpret this as JavaScript logic and not a string? Remember, we put it into dollar sign and then wrap it in curly braces. Once we do that, we can get four. That's it. So when should we use single quotes, when double quotes, and when backticks? You can use single or double quotes whenever. So whenever you have just a name or just a static value in there, you can choose between single and double quotes. Sometimes I'm going to use single quotes, sometimes double, but you can stick with just one. For example, just hello there. Whenever you want to do something dynamic, then you switch to backticks. So then you switch to this little backtick syntax. That's it. It's really important to note regarding data types that we can inspect the type of each value by writing type of before the value. So in here, we can write type of and then backticks. This is actually going to give us a data type of that actual value. So you can see that the type of, of backticks is a string and the type of, of single quotes is also a string. So there's absolutely no difference between those two approaches. Again, use single or double quotes whenever, and then use backticks only when you want to apply some extended functionality. The second data type on our list are numbers. JavaScript is really friendly when it comes to numbers because you don't have to specify the type of the number. We call this behavior untyped. JavaScript is untyped because determining whether a number is an integer or a decimal is taken care by the language's runtime environment. For example, in traditional programming languages like C, we'd have to declare the type of the number we'd like to use like this. int whole number would be five. And then if we wanted to use a float or a decimal number, we would have to say float. So we have to declare a different type of the number for five, which is a whole number, and float for a decimal number, for example, 0 0.5. In JavaScript, we can just use plain old const or let and use any number we'd like. For example, we can say const whole number, make it equal to five, or we can use const decimal number and make it equal to 0 0.5, for example. We just learned that the number type represents both integers which are whole numbers, and floats, which are decimal numbers. That's great, JavaScript makes it easy on us. Let's console log those numbers. So let's say console log whole number, and also let's console log the decimal number. Decimal number, just like that, great. As you can see, we get five and 0 0.5, we can change it to 5555, five, 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 for example. We can have really, really large numbers. We can say 10, we can really do anything we want. And you can put this as small as 0 0.33333 or really anything you'd like. JavaScript doesn't care. As long as it's a number, you can declare it as a normal variable. There are many operations for numbers. For example, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, and so on. So let's try to do some of them. In here, I'm going to create a const, let's say, number, let's say first number. First number is going to be five. 
And then let's say const second number is going to be, let's do 10. Great. In there, we are going to create a new constant, which is going to be a result. So we just created a constant variable with a variable name result. In there, we'll play with operations a bit. So let's try first number plus second number to see what do we get. And of course, to see the result, we need to console log result. And then again, command or control S to save it, to see it in the console. We get 15, great. Let's try minus, we get minus five. That means that JavaScript numbers work with negative values as well. We can also try some multiplication right there. We get 50 or we can try to divide it. We get 0 0.5. As you can see, it immediately turned it from a whole number down to the float or the decimal number. We're going to learn much more about many different operations for numbers, string and so on after the data types video. So immediately after this section, the operations will come. When we try to do some operations with values that are not numbers, most often we will get a NAN. So what is a NAN? Let's see. If we try doing, uh, let's say a string. So let's make this first number, let's say just a string. So if we try creating a string, which is going to say hello, and if we try dividing that string by second number, let's see what do we get. We get NAN, as you can see in the console. This means not a number. It represents a computational error. It is a result of an incorrect or an undefined mathematical operation. If we bring this back to where we had the first number, so where we had a normal operation, what do you think we would get if we do type of and then let's say result? Of course, it's going to be a number because number is a valid data type in JavaScript. But now there is a trick question. It's, it's a really, really stupid thing in JavaScript. What if we brought this back to where we had a string, for example, hello, and we divide that string with a number. Remember, if we take the value of this, we're going to get none. So the question is, what do you think the result of type of of none is going to be? The type of NAN, which stands for not a number, surprisingly, is a number. The reason for this is, in computing, NAN is actually technically a numeric data type. However, it is a numeric data type whose values cannot be represented using actual numbers. Don't overthink this too much, numbers are quite straightforward in JavaScript. Let's move on to Booleans. The third one on our list of data types are Booleans. So let me write that down, Booleans. Booleans represent a logical entity and can only have two values. It can only be true or false, that's it. It doesn't have numbers like one, two, three, two, to infinity or strings. We can keep adding values to strings, create as many different strings we want. Booleans only have two possible values, true or false. That's it. As you'll come to know, these are important values when it comes to adding logic to our programs. With just two values, you can create a complex system of loops and conditions. This type is commonly used to store yes or no values. True means yes, correct, or something like that. It's also sometimes known as one. So true or one means yes or correct. And then of course, false is no, incorrect, and it's represented by a zero sometimes. That's it. Let me give you an example of a Boolean. So let's create a variable called const is cool. This variable is going to say if a person is cool or not. And we are going to set it to true at the beginning. That's it, the person is cool. True means yes, correct, something is correct, that's it. So if we were to console log is cool, what do you think we would get? Well, we get true, right? And then we can test it off with type of is cool and we do get Boolean. That means that it's a standard data type. But let me show you something cool we can do with Booleans. We can create if statements. Of course, we still didn't learn if statements, but I'm going to just show you this cool little example, which we are going to learn later on. So we can say const and then in the condition, we're going to put this Boolean. So if the condition in here is true, then we are going to render this code which we have below. And then in there, I'm going to say console log and something like 
Hi, man. You're cool. Oh, and notice this little thing. Since you created a string with a single quote, this little quotation mark threw us out of the string. That's not great. So what we can do is we can exchange this for double quote and we should be good to go. Great. Now we can also add an else and we can say console log, uh, let's say, oh, hi, that's it. The prison is not cool. So if we do that and save, what do you think? Which console log are we going to see? Since is cool is true, this if statement runs and we get only the console log, hi man, you're cool. But if we switch this to false, you're going to see, oh, hi, which means that we have Boolean false and in here we didn't enter this if statement. As you can see, this is just a simple example, but in here we have some logic. So depending on many different Booleans, we'll be able to create complex systems. Boolean values also come as a result of comparisons. So what do I mean when I say that? Let's say that we have an age. So a variable, a number variable called age, and we're going to set it to 20. Console.log age, and we can say larger than 20. So is the age larger than 20? Notice how I said in my head is, is something. Yes, it is, right? Yes means true. So whenever you're asking yourself a question, is this larger than 20 or is it not? Let's do 19 just to make sure. So is age, which represents 20, larger than 18? True, yeah, it's correct. So as you may assume, this is going to return Boolean true. So you can see a number in comparison with some other number returns true. We can also make is lower than and we're going to get false. That's it when it comes to Booleans. The next two data types on our list are null and undefined. We are going to cover both of them in one video because we need to compare the differences and also they share a lot of similarities so we are going to explain what those are. The null type has only one value, null, that's it. The special value null does not belong to any of the types described above. It forms a separate type of its own which contains only the null value. For example, we can say const age is going to be equal to null. Let's try to console.log the age to see what do we get. And we indeed do get the value of null. Null is just a special value which represents nothing, empty or simply value unknown. The code above states that the age is unknown or empty for some reason. For example, we can initially set the value of age to be null because we don't know it yet, so we can say let, and then we are going to change it when, for example, user types something in the input. So we're going to have an input of uh, type number, which is going to correspond to age, and then he's going to set the age to be, for example, 20. So right now, if we test it out, we get 20, but at first we initialized it to null because at the beginning we didn't know the value of the age. That's it. Now let's talk about the value of undefined. A variable that has not been assigned a value is undefined. The meaning of undefined is value is not assigned. If a variable is declared but not assigned, then its value is undefined by default. So what does that mean? Let's create a variable called let x for example and let's do nothing on the right side so we are not going to assign any value to it now we can console log x and let's see what value do we get as you can see we get a undefined data type or undefined value technically it is possible to assign an undefined value to any variable so we can as well say let x is going to be equal to undefined which is basically the same I wouldn't recommend doing that. Normally, we use null to assign empty or unknown value to a variable, and we use undefined for checks like seeing if a variable has been assigned. So usually, if you want to have undefined, you can just do it like this. That's it, just declare it without assigning a variable, and if you want to declare it and say that it's empty, then you use null. Many times, we often get confused on what's the difference between undefined and null. Undefined means a variable has been declared but has not yet been assigned a value, as you can see right there. On the other hand, null is an assignment value. 
it can be assigned to a variable as a representation of no value. As you can see here, we are setting the age to be equal to null. Unassigned variables are initialized by JavaScript with a default value of undefined. That's exactly why we get undefined here. JavaScript never sets a value to null. You must do that yourself. Let's test these values with a type of operator. So in here, we can say type of x, which is going to be undefined. And if we try doing type of of undefined, we are going to get back undefined because that's a proper data type. So what do you think we are going to get if we put this console log right here and test for the value of age? Let's do that. And as you can see, we get back object. So that is really, really weird because we said that the null is one of the basic primitive data types. So definitely a data type of age, which we set to null here should be null, right? We can also test the type of, of null itself and we also get an object. It's interesting to see that this is actually a bug in the whole JavaScript language. This bug was created before, but now so many, all the world's programs written in JavaScript depend on this little bug. And if we were to fix this, many different code bases, which are old, would completely break and we would get so many errors. So JavaScript community actually decided to leave this error as a part of the official JavaScript language, which is crazy, but it kind of works. So just remember the type of null is actually object, which is weird, but that's just how it is. Great, now that we are done with null and undefined, in the next video, we are going to explain objects. In this video, we are going to talk about the data type of objects. Object is the most important data type and it forms the building block of modern JavaScript. The object type is special. All other types are called primitive because their values can contain only a single thing. You can see that a string can contain only one specific string. You can see that the number can contain only one number at a time. Boolean can also contain one value, null also one value, and so on. In contrast, objects are used to store collections of data and more complex entities. What I'm going to let you know for now is that objects in their simplest form are used to group variables. For example, we can create a variable of name and age. Const name is going to be equal to John and const age is going to be equal to 25. These variables in the current state are in no way related one to another. We can create an object called person and put them together. So how would we do that? We can create an object by doing the same thing as we do with all other variables, const, and then the variable name, in this case, person. And in here, we create an object with a pair of curly braces, just like this. Inside of there, we can specify properties or variables. So in here, we are going to say name, colon, and then in here, we are going to say John. And below, we can also put age of 25. As you can see, the syntax is a bit different. In here, we have a key and a value, name and John, and the age 25. Now, we know that both name and age belong to the same entity, the person. That is an object. As you can see, we declare the same way as all other variables and then put curly brackets inside of which goes the data. The one last thing that we can mention is that we can now extract specific values from that object using the dot notation. So how would we get the values? Well, we can first console log the entire person and we don't need this standalone variables anymore. We just have the person object and let's see what do we get. As you can see in between the brackets, we get the name of John and age of 25. So how can we get a specific value? For example, just the name. Well, we use the dot notation, dot notation. As you may assume, we use person and then put a dot and then take the name property. So person that dot is going to give us a string of John. So let's say that we want to test the type of person. That's going to give us an object. You can see we do get an object. But if we were to do the type of of the person that name, 
you can see that name is a primitive data type of a string. So we are going to get string. That means that the person or an object can contain any data types inside of it. It can contain strings and it can also contain numbers. There are many other kinds of objects in JavaScript. We have arrays to store ordered data collections. For example, an array would be const array and in there we can store something like uh, let's say one, two, three, four. In an array, we can store multiple primitive types, but in here, we don't have keys and the values. We just have indexes. So this is zero, one, two, three, and so on. But again, we are going to learn about arrays more specifically later on. Let's console log that array to see what do we get. As you can see, we get one, two, three, four in an array and we have indexes of 0, 1, 2, 3. We also have something known as a date object. If we test that const date, which is going to be equal to new date, let's see what that gives us. Let's const log that date. Const log, and then in there, date. As you can see, we get this complex thing, which gives you the current date and time. That's also an object. Sometimes people just say array or date type. But formally, they are not types of their own. They belong to a single object data type and they extend it in various ways. So this array, if we test the type of the array, so type of array, we should get indeed an object as we do with just the person here, object. And if we test a type of date, you can see that it is an object. That's all that I'm going to let you know for now. Objects are complex concepts. First, let's master the easy things and then we can get back to objects in one of the later videos. We just went through all of the data types. There's only one more thing I'd like to let you know. In general programming, when it comes to data types, there are two types of programming languages, statically typed or dynamically typed languages. So we have statically typed languages and dynamically typed languages. What does this mean? Statically typed languages are languages where each variable and expression type is already known at compile time. So once a variable is declared to be of a certain type, it cannot hold values of any other data type. That's the case in C, C++ or Java. For example, in C, if you declare a variable to be a number, you have to say int, which stands for integer. So int number is going to be five. You cannot do number is going to be like a string of test now. This is an error. If you declare a variable as a number, it must stay a number. On the other hand, we have dynamically typed languages. They can receive different data types over time. JavaScript is dynamically typed. That means that variables in JavaScript can receive different data types over time. We are going to see this in action really soon. A variable in JavaScript can contain any data. A variable can at one moment be a string and at another one be a number, for example. So let's declare a variable called message. So we're going to say let message and we're going to make it equal to hello world, just like that. Now let's console log that, console log the message. And as you can see, we get hello world. We can also console log the type of, of the message and we do get a string. So now what would happen if we said message is going to be equal to five? So we redeclare the value of a variable to be five. Now let's do the same thing. I'm going to run another console log down there to see what the message is going to be. And as you can see, first the data type of the message is string. And then if we also ask for a data type here, then it's changed to number. A variable in JavaScript can at one moment be a string and at another one, a number. Again, we don't have to just change it from a string to a number. We can change it, for example, to let's say uh, Boolean. So we're going to do true. 
that's also viable. So we can start with a variable which is a string and then at the end it can be a boolean. It doesn't really matter, this is a completely valid syntax. So the only thing that you need to remember here is that JavaScript is dynamically typed, which means that at one moment the variable can be a number for example, and then if it's a let of course, we can change that variable to be a string or anything else. That's it. Great, that's it for this video. Welcome to the operators part of this course. We already know many operators from school. They are things like addition, multiplication, subtraction and so on. In this chapter, we'll concentrate on aspects of operators that are not covered in school. As all other programming languages, JavaScript includes operators as well. An operator performs some operation on single or multiple operands and produces a value. For example, 1 plus 2. In that equation, plus sign is an operator, number 1 is a left operand and number 2 is the right operand. Plus operator adds two numeric values and produces a result, which is 3 in this case. JavaScript includes the following categories of operators. Arithmetic operators, comparison operators, logical operators, assignment operators, and a conditional operator. In the next few videos, we are going to explore all of these operators in detail. Before we dive in into this whole section, let's again just create an empty folder. I called it O3 operators. And then in there, as always, create an index.html file and a script.js file. Inside of the HTML, we're going to write that template and simply connect the actual JavaScript file. So in there, we're going to write src script.js. This should connect it. And in here, remember, we do console log test to see whether it's connected and then we run this, so open with live server. Once that is running, you can right click and then open the console. In there, you can go to the top right and undock it to the side. Once that is ready, we should be able to remove this warnings and simply start coding. You can see the test, this is connected and let's dive right into the arithmetic operators. Arithmetic operators are used to perform mathematical operations between numeric operands. So how do we use them in JavaScript? Well, first, let's create two variables. First one is going to be called const a, let's say, and let's make it equal to five. And then we can do the same thing, but create a variable called b, which can be equal to 10, for example. You can do any numbers you want. Why do we need numbers? Because you do mathematical operations with numbers. So in there, let's test out the arithmetic operators. We are also going to create a let result, which is going to be equal to zero. So this is a changeable variable. Inside of there, let's play with the result. So I'm going to write an inline comment that is going to say addition. And then in there, we can actually test it out. So we're going to make the result to be equal to a plus b. And then after all of that, we are going to simply console log the result. With this out of the way, if we now save the file with command s, you're going to see on the left side, we do get 15, which means that just like in basic math, the a and b got added together and we added them to the result, which we then console logged and that's it, that's 15. Pretty simple. Then we also have subtraction. So I'm going to comment this out. Remember, we don't want this code executed. Now we just want to do subtraction. In there, let's also do the same thing. So result is going to be equal to a, but this time minus b. Let's see it. And we do get minus five. As we said, JavaScript can work uh, with negative values without any problem. And that's it, we do get negative five. Furthermore, we also have multiplication. So let's write a comment for multiplication. And then in there, uh, same thing again, result is going to be equal to a times b. You write times or multiplication with this asterisk sign, that's it. So again, let's test it out. As you can see, we get 50, which is five times 10. And then we have the division as well. So let's do one more thing in there, division. And we're going to make the result to be equal to a divided by b. 
Again, you do forward slash for division. I have a typo there. So result is equal to A divided by B. Let's test it out. Again, we don't have any troubles because we learned that JavaScript numbers can be floats or decimal values as well. In here, we have four of the most basic mathematical operations, but let's test a few more. Here, we have an exponent. In there, we are also going to say result is going to be equal to, and then we are going to set a to the power of b. So this is a to the power of b. Let's test it out. So that's 5 to the power of 10. That's a lot. Let's try b to the power of a. That's maybe going to make more sense. That's going to be 10 to the power of 5. Let's test it out. And as you can see, we get the 1 with 5 zeros. So that works. The next operator on the list is not all that common in basic math, but it's common in basic programming. It's called a modulo operator. In JavaScript, we do modulo by using the percentage sign. So we say A modulo B. Now let's explain how it works. This would be the example. Uh, let's say that we have 13, which is A, and then we have 12, which is B. So let's do exactly that. I'm going to change the A to be 13 and then B to be in 12. Right now, right here, we are doing the same thing. So I'm just going to move this comment so you can clearly see what's happening. So 13 modulo 12, and then I'm going to bring this right there under the modulo. This is how you would read it. When you divide 13 by 12, the remainder is one. So we can spread this into multiple lines. Let's write like this. 13 divided by 12. So first we need to do the division. 13 divided by 12 is going to be equal to one. And then we have the one remainder. When you divide 13 by 12, you get one because 12 fits one time into the 13. And then the remainder is one. Right now, what we can try to do is we can try to divide one by 12. Why one? Because it's the remainder right there. So if we try dividing, the one by 12, we're going to get zero because one fits zero times into 12 and the remainder is still going to be one. That's exactly why we get one right there. As you can see in the console, we do get one. So let's try it on a one more example. I'm going to change the variables to be 15 and 11, for example. And let's see what do we expect to get. So 15 and 11. 15 divided by 11 is one because 11 fits one time into 15 and then the remainder is four. Now we are trying to divide that four by 11 again. Four divided by 11 in whole numbers is zero because four fits zero times into 11 and then the remainder is still going to be four because we weren't successful in dividing that one more time and then the result is of course four, let's test it out. As you can see, we get four. The last two operators on our list are increment and decrement operators. So what do they do? It's pretty simple. We just have the result and we can play with the result only. So what we can do is we can say result plus plus. So that's the increment operator. It simply increments the value of result to be one more than what it currently is. As you can see, currently the result is zero. So if we save that and console log, we get one. So that's the increment operator and the decrement operator is the same, but we have the minus minus instead of plus plus. So just like this, we save it and we get a negative value of minus one. The increment and decrement operators are really, really often used in programming and it's great to know them. So what we learned in this video so far are the addition operator, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, modulo operator, and the increment and decrement operators. Quite a lot, but you already knew most of this, so that's great. The next type of operators on our list are comparison operators. And in here, we are also going to cover the concept of equality in JavaScript. As you already heard of the arithmetic operators, the same goes for comparison operators. That's it. These are the comparison operators. 
Comparison operators compare two values and return Boolean value true or false. Let's write that down. Comparison operators and then return either true or false. That sentence is the main takeaway. If you understand that, you're good to go. The return value of a comparison operator is always going to be a Boolean value. The topic of equality in JavaScript is closely connected to the comparison operators. I've got you covered there as well. We are going to go through both topics in this video. So let's start. Let's say we have two numbers. Const a is going to be equal to five and const b is going to be equal to 10, the same as in last video. First, we are going to learn how to test whether a value is greater than the other value. We can do that by doing console.log and then a is larger than b. That's it, just a simple console log. In here, we have a, then we have a comparison operator greater than, and then we have b. If we test that out, as you can see, we are always going to get a Boolean value, either true or false. In this case, we get false because A is not greater than B. We can also test whether a value is greater than or equal to. For that, you just put a equal sign immediately next to the greater than sign. For me, it merges them together, but it's completely the same thing. So if I do that, we are still going to get false. But right now, if I make A to be equal to 10 as well, you can see it's true because they are the same, but in here we have the equality as well. If we make this 11, it's still going to be true. And if we make it nine, it's not going to be true anymore. So let's bring this back to five. And we are also going to keep all of them in the comments. So in here, I'm going to say greater than, also greater than or equal to, and that's the one that we have right below greater than is of course just the greater than sign without the equal to sign that's it then we can also test whether a value is less than other value so less than and we are going to do a console log in there a is less than b that's it just a sign that's completely opposite of this one if you cannot find these signs on your keyboard just feel free to google less than or greater than signs on your specific keyboard that's it so less than and that's going to be true but let's just comment out these kinds of logs so they don't cause any interruptions in here we get only true because 5 is indeed less than 10 that's it let's also comment that one and let's do less than or equal to. So what do you think? How are we going to do that? Well, we are just going to add less than and then the equal sign next to it, just like this. Again, for me, it ties them together, but it's absolutely the same thing. If we test that out, again, we are going to get true. If we make them equal, so 10 and 10, we get true. But right now, if we try that the same thing, 10 and 10 with just the less than, it's not going to be true, it's false because A is not lower than B, they are equal. But if you do less than or equal to with the equal operator, that's going to be true as well. Finally, now we have the equality operators. We can test whether a value is equal. So we can say is equal. How do we do that? Again, in the console log, we're going to test it out. We're going to see whether A is going to be equal to B. Remember, we do one equal sign when we want to assign a variable. We're going to learn about the assignment operator later on. And then we want to do two equal signs when we want to check whether a value is equal. So if we test that out, because now they're both 10, we are indeed going to get true. The thing that we can test next are whether values are not equal. So I'm going to do a new line, new comments, say not equal. And then in there, we're going to create a console log like this. So how do you say something is not something? Not. In programming, for not, no, negation, something like that, we always use the exclamation point, just like this. So we're going to say A, exclamation point, equal sign, B. Again, it turns into something different for me, but that's just exclamation mark and then the equal sign, tie together. That's it. So A is not equal to B. That's what we are testing, whether they are not equal. Remember, 
all comparison operators and the quality operators, this one here, return Boolean values, either true or false. And we are testing whether A and B are not equal. A and B in our case are both 10, so they are equal and this returns uh, false. If we try changing this to five, they are now not equal and it's going to return true. What you're going to see more often are going to be strict equality and strict inequality operators. They look like this. So I'm going to write strict equality and then strict inequality. So inequality, just like that. So for strict equality, we do console.log and it's absolutely the same thing as above A, but in this case, we don't have double equal sign, we have triple equal sign. So this is a strict equality. In JavaScript, you're going to see people do this much, much, much more often than this. We're going to explain exactly why in the next video. In the same way, we do the strict inequality, but instead of the three equal signs, we do first not sign, exclamation mark, and then double equal sign. This is going to say whether values are strictly not equal. So you can see A is not equal to B, we do get true, and that's because our A and B were five and 10, which are not equal. If we try 10 and 10, you see we get a false. Great, everything we've covered so far is pretty straightforward. The only thing I'd like to take a deeper look at is the strict versus loose equality. What are the differences and when should we use each option? Let's cover that in the next lesson. In this video, we are going to talk about concepts of strict versus loose equality in JavaScript. Equality is a fundamental concept in JavaScript. We say two values are equal when they have the same value. So if I scroll down there, we can again play with some console logs. So if I say console log, and then in there, let's say that we have a value of five. We can say, as we learned, double equal to five, these two values are indeed equal. We can also check whether two strings are equal. So for example, if I create a string called hello, and if I make it equal to another string called hello, just like that, we get true and true. We can also switch these to strict equality with triple equal signs, and we do get true, true one more time. Note that we use three equal signs to represent this concept of equality in JavaScript. JavaScript allows us to also test loose equality. It is written using two equal signs. Things may be considered loosely equal, even if they refer to different values that look similar. An example would be the following. In here, let's say that instead of two number fives, we have a five, and then we have a string that has a number five in it. So remember, this is not a number, although it may look like a number, this is a string. And if we now test that with double equality, we get true, which is extremely weird because those two values shouldn't be the same. This is the number and this is a string. With triple equal sign or with strict equality, we get a false and that's how it should be. Let's explore both loose equality and strict equality in more detail. First, we're going to talk about strict equality. The strict equality method of comparison is a preferred option to use because its behavior can be easily predicted, which leads to less bugs and unexpected results. The JavaScript interpreter compares the values as well as their types and only returns true when both are the same. So let's write that down. Compares values and types. We can say data types, right? Because we learned about that. Compares values and data types. Returns true only if both are the same. So it compares both values and data types. If we try doing a console log, inside of which we have a value of 20, for example, and we want to check the strict equality with a string of 20. This is going to be false because even though the values seem to be the same, they are of different types. The first one is of type string and the second one is of a type number. We write loose equality using double equal sign. So again, if we take the example from the strict equality, console.log, 
and then we do 20 is going to be equal to double equal sign because loose equality to the string of 20, we are going to get true. It does the same underlying logic as the strict equality, except for a minor yet huge difference. The loose equality doesn't compare data types. So let's write that here. Doesn't compare data types. You should almost never use the loose equality. Douglas Crockford in his excellent book called JavaScript, the good parts wrote, JavaScript has two set of equality operators, the good ones. So let's write that there, the good ones, which are going to be triple equal and not strict, not equal. And then we have the evil twins, which are going to be loose equal and loose, not equal. The good ones work the way you would expect. If the two operands are of the same type and have the same value, then strict equality produces true and strict inequality produces false. The evil twins do the right thing when the operands are of the same type, but if they are of different types, they attempt to change the values. The rules by which they do that are complicated and unmemorable. These are some of the interesting cases which could cause errors in your applications. So let's see, we're going to have an empty string and a string with a zero in it. And then we have the loose equality. What do you think we are going to get? Before we save it, we're going to remove this console log. And let's save it. As you can see, we get false because this is not correct. But what if we did something like zero, which is not a string, and then compare that to an empty string, which is a string that doesn't have anything in it. So we said this is false. And if we save this, we get true. Like, how can we even get true with these two values? That doesn't make any sense. Let's test with something else. So let's do console log and then zero is going to be equal to a string of zero. Again, with loose equality, let's test it out. We should get true. Yeah, we do get true. Also weird, shouldn't happen. Let's test a few more examples. Console log and then in there, let's do false, which is a Boolean and compare that to false, just a basic string that includes false. Do you think this is going to be true or false? Try to answer with me. Let's test it out. We get false. Again, doesn't make any sense. You might, you might have said it's going to be true, but it returned false, which is again, weird. Let's try one more thing. So let's do false is going to be equal to, let me just uncomment this. So Boolean of false is going to be equal to a string of zero. Oops, for some reason it returns true. There are hundreds more examples where the evil twins produce unexpected results. That's not good and that could cause errors. So let me just show you a few final tests and then we can repeat what we learned. Let's do console log. True is going to be double equal to one. We talked about the Boolean value of true, right? We said, yeah, that means like something is true, something is correct. And we can also say that's one opposed to zero. With the loose equality, if we save that, we indeed do get true. But again, we said this is a data type of Boolean and this is a data type of number. They shouldn't be the same. But the true gets converted to one and then it compares it. What if we try doing again the same thing, a string of five with a number of five, we also get true, even though they're not of the same data type. That happens because the string of five is converted to the number of five and then compared. But if we switch to using the strict equality, as we always should, we get false false because these two values are not the same and they should never be. With loose equality, both of these are equal and that should never happen. Five is a string and should be treated like that. As I mentioned, most of the JavaScript developers completely avoid loose equality and rely only on the strict equality. It is considered a better practice and it causes less bugs. From now on, you're going to see me only use the strict equality. And for the end, I found for you a great visual representation of strict versus loose equality.
In here, we have a table. And in the table, you can see on the top row, we have some values, true, false, one, zero, minus one, and so on. And we have them in the column as well. And in here, each dot tries to compare, with double equal currently, the value from the row to the value from the column. True, when compared to true, is going to be true, correct. That's with the double sign. As you can see, with loose equality, we get these green boxes all over the place. They are unpredictable. But if we switch to strict equality, right there at the top, we get this nice predictable line. So, what's the moral of the story? Right there at the bottom corner. Always use triple equal sign or strict equality. The next type of operators on our list are called logical operators. Logical operators, just like that. JavaScript includes three logical operators, so let's write them here. It's a logical operator or, we have the and, and we have the not. So how do we write each one and what does it mean? Complete knowledge of logical operators requires the knowledge of if-else statements and truth and falsy values. In this video, we're just going to cover the syntax of logical operators and then we're going to come back to them to see them in full action after we cover the two mentioned topics. To write the AND operator, we use the double ampersand syntax. If you don't know where this is on your keyboard, feel free to Google it, but that's the double ampersand. So, how does the AND operator work? It checks whether all operands, so I'm going to write that down, all operands are true. And if they are, it returns true. Simple as that, returns true. If they are not, it returns false. So how can we see that in action? Let's write a console log, and then in there, we are going to have a true Boolean value, and we are going to use the AND operator. In there, let's try it with a false. So we are saying true and false. What do you think this is going to return? In here, we learned that the logical AND operator needs all values to be true for it to return true, and otherwise it returns false. In here, we have true, but we indeed do have false as well. So not all operands are true, and because of that, in the console, we get false. If we convert this to true, you can see now all of the operands are true, and we are going to get true. Also, if we check for two false values, of course, the value is going to be false. That's it. We can also pass multiple conditions. So let's try with, for example, true, false, and then we can say and and true. What do you think the output of this is going to be? True, false, true. All operands need to be true. In this case, false is not true. So even if one single one is not true, it's going to return false, as you can see in the console. If we switch this back to true, then we have a true value. Now we can move on to the second operator, and it's the OR operator. We write the OR operator with a double straight line. Again, if you don't know where to find it on your keyboard, feel free to Google. That's the double straight line. Right now, we can test it out. So we're going to do the console log and then say true or false. So how does the or operator work? It checks whether at least one operand is true. So let's say at least one operand is true and then it returns true. So opposed to the end operator where all operands need to be true for the output to be true, with the OR operator, we need at least one of the operands to be true for the entire thing to be true. So in here we have true and false, which is going to return, what do you think? True, because we have one true value and that's all that the operator needs. What if we did um, true and true, for example, just like that? That's also true, because at least one needs to be true, but we can just have all of them as well. And then, as you may suppose, with two false values, this is going to be false. The final operator is called a NOT operator. And we've already seen this one when we did the equality. Remember when I said this is NOT equal, NOT the exclamation mark? That's it. So we write NOT with the exclamation mark. All that it does 
is it reverses the Boolean value. So if we have a true value, and then we add an exclamation mark or not operator at the start, we are basically saying not true, which is going to return false, that's it. And then if we say not false, you can guess it, it returns true. As you can see, the not operator simply converts the Boolean true to false and Boolean false to true, that's it. This was just the introductory video to these logical operators. They are used really, really often in real JavaScript applications and I'm excited to show you their real uses once we learn about if statements and truly and falsy values. In this video, we're going to learn the assignment operators. Would you believe me if I told you that you not only know what an assignment operator is, but that you've been using it this whole time? The simplest form of an assignment operator is the equal sign used for assigning values to variables. So if we say const number and we make it equal to five, this equal sign right there is an assignment operator. An assignment operator assigns a value to its left operand, in this case a number, based on the value on its right operand, that's it. We can also join the assignment operator with one of the arithmetic operators. So let's say that we have a changeable variable let number, which is going to be equal to five. What you can do is you can say number plus equal, and then we can say some value. So you can say number is plus equal five, and then we're going to console log the number. What happened here is that we incremented the number by five. So so initially the number was five and then we added and then assigned value of five to the number, which then resulted in 10, as you can see. This would be the same as number is going to be equal to number plus five. So this is absolutely the same, it's just a different syntax. Number plus equal five. And as you can see, we get 10. Then let's do number minus equal five. So we can do the same thing. And we do get five again, because this one is still active. Let's remove it. As you can see, we get zero because five minus five is going to be zero. We add it to the number or subtract it. And then we console log the number. We also have the multiplication with the assignment, which is times and then equal sign. And then we get 25. And finally, we also have the division. So we can say divided by and then assign it. So five divided by five and then assign it to the number which is going to be equal to one, that's it. The addition assignment, this one here, can also be used with strings. So let me show you. Instead of the number, just below here, I'm going to create a let string which is going to be equal to hello, just like that. And then I'm going to say string plus equal to another string. And in there, I'm going to add a comma and say, I am John, just like that. And then if we console along the string, what you can see is we get, hello, I am John, all as a one string. So we basically added this string to this initial string to get the final result. That's it when it comes to assignment operators. You're basically pro at them. Hi everyone and welcome to another section of the course. This one is quite a big one. In this section, we are going to use everything we learned so far. Data types, variables, operators, equalities, we're going to make conditions. As you can see it on the slide, we are going to make decision-making code using if statements, truity and falsy values, switch statements, and ternary operator. We're going to make conditions and based on those conditions, our code is going to run differently. In here, we are going to for the first time see blocks of code. Many interesting things coming up. Stay tuned and see you in the next video. You might have read the title of the current section, Logic and Control Flow. And you might have wondered, what does that mean? It's much simpler than what it may seem. In every programming language, we have something known as an if statement. If statement is consisted of a condition that is evaluated to either true or false and a block of code. That's it. If the condition is evaluated to true, then the code inside of the block will run, otherwise it's going to be skipped. That's it. 
we can jump back to the Visual Studio Code. Right now, I am in the section 04 Logic and Control Flow. You can create your own new files or you can just use existing ones. If statements often appear in terms of some rules or laws. Let's say that there is a nightclub that only allows people over the age of 18 to enter. And now we are for the first time ever using variables and code to create something useful. So in here, we are going to say age is 18. So we get age from a random person and there we can set an if statement. This if statement is going to be the guard or the bouncer for our club. If statement is written like this. We have a if keyword, then we have parentheses in which goes the condition. So I'm going to say condition right now. This is not real code. This is just what needs to go in there. And then in here, we have the block of code. So for the first time ever, you can see curly braces and parentheses used like this. This is a reserved JavaScript keyword, if. Then, as we mentioned, we have a condition and then we have the block of code to be executed if this condition turns out to be true. So inside of here, we can use the age variable and use one of the comparison operators to get a Boolean value. So let's say that the age must be larger than 18, just like this. And in here, we can write just a simple console log, which is going to say, you may enter. That's it. If we save that, do you think we are going to see the console log in the console? Let's save it. And we cannot see nothing, unfortunately. Why is that? Well, that's because our age variable is exactly 18. To enter the club, you need to be above 18. So we are just going to make it more than or equal to 18. If we save this, you can see we get the console log of you may enter. Great. If statements also have an else if and else statements. To continue with our example, let's say that our person currently cannot enter because his age is exactly 18. So just like this. Then you can provide an else if statement. This is exactly like our initial if statement, only it's the second if right now. They are chained together. So in here we have else if. So if this condition turns out to be false, then it's going to check for this condition right there. And in here, let's say whether age is going to be equal to 18. So exactly equal to 18. If that's the case, we are going to say console.log, you just turned 18, welcome. That's it. So just like that, let's save it and see. Okay, our person just turned out to be 18 and we got a console log right there. As you can see, the first condition the result of this comparison turned out to be false. So this block of code wasn't executed. Then we had a second condition, else if right there, if age is exactly 18, which is true in this case, and then we got this console log. But what if the person is younger than 18? We currently aren't handling that case. That's where the else statement comes in handy. We implement it like this. Else and then immediately a block of code without parentheses for condition. It's just else. Why don't we have a condition besides it? Well, if no other condition turns out to be true, then this one is going to be executed for sure. It doesn't need a condition. In here, let's say console log, and then let's do something funny like grow up, exclamation mark, that's it. So right now we always get age 18. But what if we change the age? So now the only thing that we have to do is change the age variable to get the different console log. So let's say 24, for example, not 124, just 24. And we save it and we get you may enter because the age is more than 18. If we change it to, for example, 15, a little boy trying to enter the club, we get grow up, that's it. And if we make it exactly 18, we get you just turned 18. That's it. On this little example, you just learned one of the key concepts of all programming languages. Congrats. Hi, and welcome to another lecture. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about truity and falsy values. This topic is quite hard to understand for most people, but we're going to try to make it as simple as possible. So first, why are we even talking about that 
if we are talking about logic, control flow, if statements, and so on. Now that you know how to use if statements, let me show you a quick example. Right now, let's create an if, and you already know that inside of here needs to go the condition. So in here, what if I created a condition and just written one? That's it, just one. Not a comparison operator, which returns a Boolean, not a Boolean, just a number one. And I'm going to say console log and say um, in here, and then we are going to create an else statement to check whether it's going to come into this block of code or into this block of code. So I'm going to copy the console log and we're going to say no in here, exclamation mark. So what do you think? Are we going to get this console log or this console log? If I save it, you see that we got in here, which means that we got into the first if statement, which then means that this condition or just one somehow turned out to be true. Why is that? Let's do maybe five. What, what, what is going to happen with five? Okay, we also got it in an if statement. What if we did a string of test? Okay, we are also there. What if we did zero, for example? Oh, that's not the case with zero. With zero, we got here. So what's exactly happening? As you can see, this can be really, really confusing. So now we are going to talk about that. We already learned about strict and loose equality. Equality always results in a Boolean value. It can either be a Boolean true or Boolean false, right? But unlike other languages, true and false are not limited to Boolean data types and comparisons. It can have many other forms in JavaScript. In JavaScript, we also have something known as truty and falsy values. Truty expressions always evaluate to Boolean true and falsy evaluate to Boolean false. So what does that even mean and why is it important? Knowledge of truty and falsy values in JavaScript is a must. If you don't know which values evaluate to truty and which to falsy, you're going to have a hard time reading other people's code. For example, if you saw something like this, you wouldn't know what's going to happen. This is just one example, but other people can have many other examples. Long-time JavaScript developers often toss around the terms truty and falsy, but for those who are newer to JavaScript, these terms can be a bit hard to understand. When we say that a value is truty in JavaScript, we don't just mean that the value is true. Rather, what we mean is that the value changes to true when evaluated in a Boolean context. So what does that mean? This condition right there is considered a Boolean context. Everything that's in here, JavaScript is going to try to change the Boolean value. As we said, in here we need a condition. So no matter how you write it, JavaScript is going to try to change it to a Boolean. And we need to know by which rule JavaScript does that. The easiest way to learn truty and falsy values is to memorize all the falsy values. There are only six falsy values and all the other ones are truty. So let's explore the list of falsy values. I'm going to comment this out. And then in here, we are going to write falsy values. So falsy values, just like that. First value that is considered to be falsy is false. So this is an exact Boolean, right? False, false must be falsy. Then we have a value of zero. If you remember Booleans and numbers, we said that zero is sometimes going to be considered like not true, not correct, and that's immediately falsy. That's it. Then any empty string. So if you have an empty string, that's also considered falsy value because it doesn't have anything in it. Do you remember those two data types called null and undefined? Well, those two are also falsy and it kind of makes sense, right? Null is nothing similar to zero and false and undefined is also nothing. So similar to null, zero, false, empty string and so on. And there is one more, which is our friend, not a number. So these are the only six values that are considered falsy. Everything else in the whole JavaScript, it's considered truty. That's it. On the internet, there's some tables which show all the falsy values, all the truty values. They're trying to complicate it. Just remember that there are six falsy values and everything else is JavaScript is truty. So what, what do we mean by everything else? Well, opposed to false, we have true, right? That's true. 
then opposed to zero, we have one. Opposed to an empty string, we have a string with literally anything inside of it. Opposed to null, I guess can be any value. So you can have like any positive number or any negative number that is not null is going to be considered truty. So we can say, for example, 59, 58, just like that. And then we also have an empty object and an array. So this is kind of weird. Why is an empty object in an array uh, a truty value? It just is. Just remember that these six falsy values are falsy and everything else in JavaScript, absolutely everything else is truty. That's it. So what does this mean? How can we use it? Well, if we now comment this out and try using that in our if statement, you'll see that these values are going to uh, change the type to the Boolean false. So all of the falsy values are going to change the type to a Boolean false. So let me write that there, false. And what does that mean for our if statement? That means that only the else is going to run because this condition is false. This is not going to be executed. So if we did false, as you can see, we got we are in here. If we get zero, then again, this is not going to be executed, then we are going to get the else also. If we tried an empty string, we also get in here. So this is not executed at all. If we try null, we also don't get this console log. So let me give you an example with undefined. The same thing happened. And finally, not a number, also the same thing. So as I said, just remember these six are always going to be evaluated to a Boolean false and that we use those in if statements, that's it. So when could we use this? Well, let me show you an example. Let's say that you have a variable which says dogs. And let's say you have five dogs. So a person has five dogs. In here, let's create a program that says you have no dogs if there are no dogs and you have five dogs if there are some. So in here, we're going to say you have, remember, we need to use backticks or string literals to make this work. And then you have in here the dogs and then dogs. That's it. You have five dogs. But if the person has no dogs, then in here we are going to say you have no dogs. That's it. Right now we need to set up our condition. So it would make sense to simply say if dogs is greater than zero, right? If it's greater than zero, show us the number of dogs that we have and else simply say you have no dogs. That's it. If we save that, you can see it works. But what did I want to show you in this example? Well, what if we did just this? Just if dogs. If we save that, it still works. And that's because of the truty and falsy values. As you can see, dogs is actually number five. And we said that everything that's not one of these values is going to be evaluated to true. As you can see, five can be also a number that's going to be evaluated to true. So you can just say dogs and you're going to see people often do this in JavaScript. So that's exactly why you need to know truty and falsy values. I would strongly encourage you to play with this code yourself. So keep changing the conditions, keep changing console logs, keep changing variables and just test what, what would happen if we have just a string of dogs, would that work? Yeah, because a string of something, whatever it is, is simply true. That converts to true. If we have an empty string, remember, that's false. If we have any number there, that's true. So you need to keep playing with this, uh, memorize these six things, and you'll be good to go. That's it when it comes to truity and falsy values. And we are back to logical operators. Remember I've told you that we are going to return to them. I didn't forget. Let's do a quick recap and then we are going to see some real and more complex examples of all three logical operators. Logical operators are used to combine two or more conditions. If you remember correctly, JavaScript includes three logical operators, logical or, and, and not. Double ampersand syntax like this is also known as the end operator. It checks whether two operands are truty values and if they are truty, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. They are often used as a condition in an if statement. So let's show that in an example. Let's say that we want to choose which people may enter the club. 
to enter, they need to be cool and they also need to be older than 18. So let's create uh, a variable called age, which is going to be equal to, let's say 19 at the start. Also, we can create another variable, which is going to be called is cool, which is going to be set to true, just like that. Now we need to create an if statement and in there we need to check whether a person is cool and is above the age of 18, just like that. So how would we do that? How would we connect it using the ampersand operator or the end syntax? Well, we do an if statement. In there, we say is cool. We can also do if is cool is equal to true, but if you remember truly and falsy values, there's actually no need to write this. If we just write is cool, that's immediately going to check for truly value. And now we can use the end operator to check not only if the person is cool, but also if their age is above 18, just like that. If both of these turn out to be true, we're just going to return a simple console log that says you may enter. Okay, and if that's not the case, we are going to say console log and let's do you cannot enter, just like that. Okay, so if we do that and if we save this, what do you think we're going to get? Okay, in our case, we get you may enter because both of these are true. As you can see, is cool variable is true, age is indeed greater than 18. That means that we are going to see the if block of code here and we are going to see you may enter in the console. Now, the point of this lecture is not an if else statement. You already learned about that. Let's remove that so we can focus purely on the logical operator. The only thing that we're going to keep is the condition. Let's log it to the console. Right there, I'm going to wrap our condition in a console log statement like this. And let's see what are we going to get back. If I save it, we get true, which is not a surprise. But now instead of these true Boolean values, let's test it with some truty values. Okay, so instead of these, we can now remove these variables and let's play only with this console log. In here, let's input some truty values. The first one can just be a string of truthy. That's of course true because we have something inside of the string. Then let's chain it with an end operator and let's put one, number one, or any number for that matter, uh, besides zero is a truty value. We can also do and end another value, for example, test, which is also truty. And let's do and end 999, for example. As we said, all numbers besides zero are truty. So now we have this console log where we chain multiple through the values using the end operator. Let's see what the output is going to be. The output is actually 999. And why is that so? Shouldn't the logical operator end return a Boolean value? Here's how it works. The end operator does the following. It evaluates operands from left to right. So it starts from here, keeps moving, goes there to the second one, third one, and so on. So it evaluates from left to right, then it converts them to a Boolean value. So it converts this thing to a real Boolean value. If the result is true, it continues to the next value. In our case, this indeed is true, so it's going to continue to the next value. Then it's going to convert this to a Boolean value. One is also truthy, which means that it is going to be converted to Boolean true. It moves further, goes to here. This is also going to be converted to true, moves further, and then comes to here. If all operands have been evaluated to truty, it returns the last operand. That's because for the end statement to work, all operands need to be true. So it's checking for this one, this one, this one, and then if all are true, it's going to return the last one. But what if we change one value to be falsy? For example, in there, instead of one, I'm going to put zero because we said that zero is a falsy value. Now, if I save that, as you can see, even if one falsy value exists, it's going to stop and immediately return that value. Again, it starts from left to right. This is truty, which means that it's going to be evaluated to true. As we said, it moves further, but then comes here, evaluates this to false, and as soon as it finds only one false value, it is immediately going to return it. That's it. Now you know that if all values in end operators are truty, it's going to return the last true value. But if only one value is false, it's immediately going to return the first falsy value. I'd highly encourage you to check the description of this video. There are a lot of notes on exactly how this works. 
Okay, so now let's comment this out and let's try to test the same thing with the end operator. So right there, you know that the end operator uses the two straight vertical lines, something like this. So let's try to change some values with the OR operator. In the first case, we're going to use all Trudy values. I'm just going to copy these ones from here. Of course, we're going to replace this one uh, with one. And then in there, we're going to use the OR operator, which are two vertical lines, just like this. Now, we know that the last time it returned 999, but what is it going to return this time since we are using the OR operator? We get a string of Trudy. Why is that? Well, let's see how the OR operator works. The OR operator does the following. For each operand, starts from left to right, of course, it converts it to a Boolean. If the result is true, it immediately stops and returns the original value of that operand. So we go from here, if this is Trudy, then it doesn't even have to check all the other values. It immediately returns the first true one because it's OR, right? If we just have one true, we don't need to have any other ones. It doesn't care about the other ones. It immediately returns the first one. If all operands have been evaluated to false, then it returns the last operand. In other words, if we tried converting this to zero, for example, it's not even going to take effect. As you can see, we still do get Trudy because now we are not in an end. We are now in an OR operator. Great. So now let's change all of the values to be falsey and let's see what happens. In here, let's do an empty string. Zero is falsey. Then we can do, for example, null. And let's also do undefined. These are all falsey values. Now, if I save this, as you can see, the last falsey value is returned. Just to repeat, if in an OR operator, we have at least one Trudy value, it's going to return the first one. But if all the values are false, it's going to return the last false value. And finally, we have the NOT operator. NOT operator is just an exclamation mark, and it simply reverses the Boolean value. So if we have something like console log, in there we have a value of true, of course, if we save that, we're going to get true. But if we put a not operator in front of it, it's simply going to negate what we have right there. So it's going to be equal to false. This operator accepts a single argument, this thing right there, whatever is coming in front of it, and then simply returns the inverse value. But what if this thing here is not a real Boolean, like true or false, but rather it is a truty or falsey value? Well, it simply, as with all other logical operators, it converts them to Boolean to check whether it is true or falsey. Same thing here. And the same thing is happening here. It tries to convert this to Boolean. A string of something in it is true, and then it converts true to be falsey or false. So if we do this, you can see we get false. If we tried with a falsey value, for example, something like this, when we negate falsey, we get true, of course, and that's equal to true. Great you're also sometimes going to see this strange syntax, a double not operator. This simply returns the Boolean value of this thing here. We already know that zero is falsy, but what if you wanna get the Boolean value of that falsy thing? Well, it's going to give you false. And why is that? Well, we have zero, which is falsy. We convert it one time, we get real Boolean true, and then we convert that true to get the real false. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, so we can create an if statement right there. And that if statement can check whether a value is falsy or truty. So this is a really, really nice exercise for you to do because with this, we're also practicing and learning truty and falsy values. So let's say that our if statement is accepting a value and we are going to do a double negation right there. And in here, if it's true, we are going to say console log value is truty. And if we have the else, so if this is equal to false, then we are going to have value is falsy. So let's, let's check it if it works. Now we need to define the value. Let me do const value is going to be equal, for example, a real true. So let's do that. We get value is true. And if we do false, value is falsy. That's okay, we already knew about this, right? But let's do something like a, an empty string. Value is falsy. Okay, that's great. This aligns with everything that we've learned. What if we put a string of tests there? 
value is Judy. So you can see with using this operator, we can just check ourselves, just check our knowledge on whether we know the Judy and falsy values. Okay, that's it. So we, we talked about the and, we talked about the or operator, and also we talked about the not operator. This was a long lecture, so let's try to summarize it and repeat what we've learned. JavaScript is lazy. It will want to do the least amount of work of possible to get the return value. With the end operator, this one right there, JavaScript will try to return the first falsy value. As you can see, it comes to here and it doesn't want to do more work. If non falsy values are found, it will simply return the last true value. Now with the OR operator, JavaScript will try to return the first Trudy value. In here, if we had one, this is Trudy, it's just going to return the first Trudy value and it's not going to even care about everything coming afterwards. If we have no Trudy values, it's going to return the last falsy value, this one right there. And for the NOT operator, it's pretty straightforward. If you have one Trudy or falsy value, it simply converts it and gives you the opposite so test this Judy, so it gives you a false. I know that this lecture was a hard one, so if you still have some misunderstandings, feel free to rewatch it, feel free to read through the notes, and then see you in the next video. After the if statement comes the switch statement. Switch statement is if statement's bigger brother. Switch and if are extremely similar. They can be used interchangeably, but there are some situations where switch is preferred. With if statements, you mostly have just a few conditions one for the if, a few for the if else, and the final else statement. If you have a larger number of conditions, you might want to consider using the switch statement. Let's explore how it works. The switch statement is used to perform different operations based on different conditions, just like the if statement is. Let's say that you have a variable called superhero. So const superhero, and let's make it equal to Captain America, just like that. Now we have a variable and we are going to make a simple app that's going to display each character's voice line. So that's pretty interesting. We can do that using the switch statement. Switch statement takes in a value and then checks it on a bunch of cases. So let me write down the syntax for it. So we have the switch. Inside of there, we have a thing that the switch accepts. So this is going to be our actual variable, which is going to run against all the checks. In here, we're going to put our superhero. And then inside of the switch, we write case. So we're going to have a lot of cases in switch statement. And case is simply the thing that's going to be compared to the superhero. So let's say that we have a case called Iron Man. That's going to be one case. Then we put a colon sign. And afterwards, we can say cons a log. And let's say a voice line, for example. I am Iron Man. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know anything else. So let's do I am Iron Man. And let's see if that would work. So now we've written a pretty simple switch statement. Again, it takes a variable. And then we write a bunch of cases and compare the variable to the each case. So in this case, we are comparing a Captain America to the Iron Man. So just like this. Is this true? Well, it's definitely not, right? So we should not expect to see this console log. Let's save it and see whether that would work. And it doesn't. So what we need to do to add the other case, you need to first break. You need to break this case. So if this case gets executed, you need to stop it. And we stop it with break. Because what would happen if we didn't add this break? If we add another case, for example, Tor, in there, we can create another console log, console log, and let's say that is my hammer, just like that. So if we save this and remove the break and change the Captain America to be Iron Man. So right there, we're going to change our superhero to be Iron Man. And then this is going to execute because when we compare the Iron Man or the superhero to the Iron Man, that's going to be true. And then we should see this console log. If we save that, oh, what's happening? We are seeing both I'm Iron Man and that is my hammer, which shouldn't be correct. That's Thor's line. That happened because we forgot to add a break. You always need to have a break statement inside of the case.
that's it. Now, if we save that, it's going to do just I am Iron Man and it's going to break. It's not going to go any further. That's it. So now we have a case for Tor. Let's add a few more cases. So just below, I'm going to break this and let's add a case for Captain America. He's going to say console log, never give up. I'm just thinking this on the spot and we are going to break it. And then we are going to have yet another case, which is going to say Black Widow, for example. And her voice line is going to be, let's say one shot, one kill, uh, something like that. And of course we need to break it. So right now, as you can see, we have a lot of cases. We have a lot of superheroes. Our superhero is currently Iron Man, so we get his voice line. That's it, that works. If we change that to, for example, uh, Black Widow, that actually works. One shot, one kill. Let's try with Thor. Okay, that works as well. So that's exactly what we expected. In this example, we pass the superhero variable to the switch statement, as you can see here. It executes the first check with triple equal sign. So basically what happens is it goes into the switch statement, gets the superhero. Our superhero is currently Tor, so let's take that. Takes the Tor and then with triple equality or strict equality, it tries to compare the Tor to the first case, which is Iron Man. Since this evaluates to false, it skips and goes to the next one. As soon as it finds the one that matches correctly, it prints the output. So as soon as the Tor gets matched with Tor, this is now true, it prints it, and then it goes out of the switch statement. And finally, what if the user enters an incorrect superhero? So what if he says Batman, for example? We don't have a voice line for Batman here. So if we save it, nothing is going to happen because Batman is not going to match with any of these cases. We can implement a default statement the one that is going to match if no other case matched. Remember, it's really, really similar to the else in the if else statement. So in here, we are going to create a default. Remember, as in the if else, the default doesn't need a case. It's always going to happen if none of the other cases match. And then in there, we can say console.log and let's say enter a valid superhero name. That's it, just like that. And if we save that, right now we have the Batman. It says, enter a valid superhero name. If we switch it to Iron Man, we get his voice line. That's amazing. So this actually works now. Now you know how to use switch statements. As always, I would advise you going into the Chrome console and playing it with it yourself. You learn most through trying things yourself. And one small assignment for you is you can try switching this switch to the if statement. So you would have one if statement, one if condition with the Iron Man, for example, and then all of the other ones would be else if. So else if, else if, else if, and then you would have the else. But again, that's going to get messy. You're going to see that yourself. In here, we have one condition, two, three, four, and even for the four, you have to write else if, else if, else if, else if, and so on. Imagine if you had 100, then you need to use switch. Switches are preferred whenever you have like, let's say more than three, four or five variables, that's it. But as we mentioned, you can use switch and if interchangeably whenever you want. That's it, now go and try it for yourself. In this video, we are doing a ternary operator. Who would have said, but if statement has another brother, it's his younger brother, ternary operator. So the switch statement is, let's say a more complicated version of the if statement, and there's another version. It's called a ternary operator. It should be used just for a simple true or false check. To explain the ternary operator, let's first take a look at the syntax of a typical if statement. So if condition, you already learned that. In here, we have a block of code, block of code if true, and then we have an else statement, and we have a block of code if false, that's it. Now, how would we write this in a ternary operator? Well, let's compare the syntax. It's going to look a bit weird at start, but it's going to make much more sense later. So we say condition, 
you can see it's the same condition in here, then a question mark. Then we have the block of code if true, and then else we have a block of code if false. So now this extended a bit too much. Let's try to uh, make font a bit uh, smaller and extend this so we can see everything. And let's just say in here true. So this is going to be executed if true. And this thing is going to be executed if false. Now we can make it a bit bigger since we simplified it. So this is it. We can also change this to be true and false. And now those two things are equivalent. Now let's do a real if statement. In here, we are going to say const age, let's do for example, 18. And then we're going to do the same thing as we had before. So if age is greater than 18, then let's do a const log that says, you can drive, for example. And then if the age is not greater than 18, we can do you can not drive yet. Just like that, we add the dots and let's comment this out and save it. So currently we get you cannot drive yet because the person is uh, exactly the age of 18. We can make this greater than or equal to and now we get you can drive. Great. So how and why would we need to change this to a ternary operator? Well, ternary is really good for simple if else checks like this. We don't have any other else ifs, many conditions, stuff like that. We just have one simple condition and two things to do, one if it's correct and one if it's incorrect. So in here, let's just copy things. We know that this is our condition, so we're going to paste it here. Right there, we have the thing to do if it's correct, so we paste that here. And then we have the thing to do if the condition is false, so let's paste that here. It looks like this. Let me lower the font one more time and extend this. It's a bit lengthy right now, but this is the font size you would usually have if you programmed yourself. I'm just having the font bigger for you guys to see. So this is it now. This is just how we do it in one line. And we read it from this question mark. Question mark is let's say is. So you read it like this. Is age greater than or equal to 18? If it is, do this else do this. That's it. That's the ternary operator. We can even remove this thing. We can just have our ternary operator right now. And you can see we get you can drive. That's it. So let's one more time read it from left to right. First, we have our condition. Following a question mark is the expression that's going to be executed if the condition evaluates to true. And finally, following the colon sign is the expression that's going to be executed if the condition is going to be evaluated to false. Basically, this would be inside of an if block in an if else statement, and this would be inside of an else block. So this is if and this is else, that's it. At the beginning, ternary operators may seem a bit weird and hard to read, but as you write more of them, you'll quickly get better at understanding them. They'll quickly become your go-to tool if you have just a simple true or false question. Sometimes we want to repeat a specific action a certain number of times. For example, let's imagine we want to display numbers from 0 to 9 in the console. You might be thinking of doing something like this, console.log and then in there we console log 0, then we copy it and then we console log 1 and we keep moving forwards with new lines of code to console log numbers from 5, 6, 7, 8, and finally 9. If we save this, as you can see, we get 9 different console logs with numbers ranging from 0 to 9. But take a look at this. This is quite repetitive. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 characters per line which are being repeated. And there's only one thing that is changing, that specific number. So 14 characters repeating just to change one single thing. That's not a good idea at all. So instead, we can use a for or a while loop. Let me show you how to do that. The while loop has the following syntax. It looks like this, while, in there we have opening and closing parentheses in there goes the condition. Then 
we open a block of code and this is where we type in our code. While the condition is truthy or true, the code from the loop will be executed. For instance, let's do the same thing we had previously with a while loop. For that, we have to create an external variable. Usually in loops, we use a variable called i. It's short and it works. We declare this variable i to be equal to zero. And now we want to do something in here while i is less than 10. Remember, we want to console log something while i is less than 10. In here, we can put that console log. But what do we want to console log? Well, first time we want to console log zero, the second time one and two and so on. So what do you say that we simply console log i and that's it? You might be thinking, well, i is only zero now. So it's going to be nine times zero, right? Well, after we console log i, then we can increment it. So we console log zero and then put it to one. Then the code is going to be executed one more time because this check is going to check is i now one instead of zero is one less than 10. And the answer is yes. So the code is going to be ran again. It's going to console log one and then it's going to increment it to two. In that case, it's going to check is two less than 10. The answer is still true. So it's still going to run it. If we now run this, you can see we get numbers from zero to nine, the same thing we had before, but you can see how this code looks so much cleaner. Let's talk a bit more about looping. A single execution of the loop body is called an iteration. The loop in this example makes 10 iterations, once for the console log of zero and the last one for the console log of nine. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. These are 10 different iterations. If i was missing from the example above, the loop would repeat, in theory, forever. The never ending loops are called infinite loops, and that's not a good type of a loop. So we never want to get infinite loops. If I deleted this, what's going to happen is that it's going to console log 0, and then it's, it's going to check is 0 less than 10. Well, the answer is true. So it's going to console log it again. And then it's going to keep console logging that basically to infinity. Don't save the code that looks like this because your browser is going to crash and also live server extension with it. And then you won't be able to continue with this lecture normally. So trust me, if that happens, you're going to run into an infinite loop and we don't want that. Great. Now we have only 10 iterations from zero to nine. The second loop on our list is called the for loop. The for loop is more complex, but it is also the most commonly used loop. It is called a for loop because it runs four specific number of times. For loops are declared with three optional expressions separated by semicolons. So let me show you what's the structure. At first, this might intimidate you, but don't worry, you're going to see it in action and it's going to make sense. You can just type four, put an opening and closing parenthesis, and then open the block of code. Now in here, we have these three things we talked about three optional expression. First one is the initialization followed by a semicolon. Then we have a condition followed by a semicolon again. And then finally, we have something known as a final expression. So a lot of things to handle, but let's see it on an example. The initialization statement is executed one time only before the loop starts. It is typically used to define and set up your loop variable. Remember that I variable we had in the while loop? Well, we also have it here. So you can say let I is equal to zero. That is the initialization. The first part before the semicolon in here, we declare our variable. Then the second thing is the condition. The condition statement is evaluated at the beginning of every loop iteration, and it is going to continue as long as it evaluates to true. When the condition is false at the start of your iteration, the loop will stop executing. This means that if condition starts as false, your loop will never execute. So let's say that I variable is equal to zero. 
And then in here we have the condition, let's do the same thing we did before, which is while i is less than 10. That is our condition. So currently, i is less than 10, it is zero, so the loop will execute at least one more time. And then the final expression is executed at end of each loop iteration prior to the next condition check. And it is usually used to increment or decrement your loop counter. Now that we said that in here, we can use the i++ to increment that variable. So what is happening here? Well, first we initialize the variable i to be equal to zero. Then we keep checking if i is less than 10 every time for the iteration and then at the end of every iteration, we increment the variable by one. Now, what we can do is we can say console log and then in there, put the variable i. We get the same thing we got with the while loop. I know this is a lot of code, so let's repeat it one more time. First, we initialize our variable i to zero because we start to count from zero. i stands for index and it's kind of a standard for loop variable. Next, we set our condition to while i is less than 10. So every time before the loop executes the statement, it will check if the condition is true, or in our example, if variable i is less than 10. If it's equal to or greater than 10, then the condition will evaluate to false and terminate our loop. Final expression is our counter update and we set it to i++, which is shorthand for i is equal to i plus one. For each iteration, i is increased by one. At the beginning, we said that expressions are optional. That means that we can skip parts. For example, we can initialize loop variable before the loop like this. i let i is equal to zero and then in here, we don't have to have anything but the semicolon no need for initialization. Actually, we can remove absolutely everything from the loop like this and just have two semicolons. But we never want to do this because as you learned, this would be an infinite loop. So this is not a good practice. And this here without the initialization in there is also not a good practice. So you always want to have all of the three expressions in there, the initialization, then the condition and then the final expression. That's it. This is a for loop. And that's it. We learned all the basics of loops. The main thing I want you to take from this video, apart from obviously knowing the syntax for the while and the for loop is that whenever you find yourself using that repetitive kind of code that we had like this, or it doesn't have to be like this. Whenever something is repeating a lot of the times, but only one thing is changing or only small amount of thing is changing per line, that is a place for a for loop. This is not a good practice in code. There is actually an acronym called don't write dry code. And then dry stands for don't repeat yourself. So basically never write dry code, never write code that looks like this. Always use loops if you can optimize your code and make it less repetitive. That's it for this section and let's move on to the next one. Hello everyone and welcome to another section of the course. In this section, we are going to talk about functions. Before we start, let's, as we always do, set up our working directory. In here, I have a functions directory with index.html file and a script.js connected right in there as we did with all the other times. In here, in the script, let's write a simple console log. Let's do test. And if we save this, you should be able to see this on the side. So I just did right click on the index.html and I opened it with live server. Afterwards, I just opened the console in the browser and that should leave you with the console on the left side and the code on the right side if you set it up that way. Great, now we can close this left side and have just the script open and I'm really excited to show you how functions work. Functions are one of the most interesting and most important parts of any programming language. So what are functions and why should we use them? A JavaScript function is a block of code designed to perform a particular task. Remember that a block of code and it performs a task. That's it. That's a JavaScript function. 
You already seen a function in JavaScript. Not only that you've seen it, you've used it multiple times by now. It was the function called console.log. Console.log is a built-in function. We don't have to create it, but we can make use of it. Console.log has a task of printing values to the console. For example, if I in there type print, it's going to print the string of print to the console. After finishing this section, you'll be able to create your own functions as well. Now let's dive right in. When talking about functions, you're often going to hear two terms, a function declaration and a function call. It's extremely important to differentiate these two and to know when should you use each one of these. So let's explain them. Creating a function declaration means that we are defining a function. So this is the step where we define a function and a function call means that there we are calling or executing a function. So let me put that there, calling or executing a function. So in here, as you can see, we first need to have our function created or declared before we can make a function call. I'm first going to show you an example of a simple function called square. So we create a function, it's called square, it accepts one parameter called number, and then in there, we're going to return a number times number, just like that. A lot of stuff happened here. Let's review it word by word. Function is a reserved JavaScript keyword for creating a function. Square is the name of this particular function. You can name your functions anything you'd like, but it just cannot be a reserved JavaScript keyword. For example, function, function, that's not gonna work, or function var, let's say, or function const, that's not gonna work. You can use any name that's not a reserved JavaScript keyword, just like that. In our case, we are going to call it square because it's gonna square a number. Then inside of the parentheses, we have something known as parameters. Parameters are values we are going to send to our function when calling it. The function square takes one parameter called number, as you can see right there. Names of the parameters do not matter. You can name them however you like. For example, we could have done X here. And in that case, we would have to multiply the X by X. I know this is all confusing because it's new, but we have a lot of videos explaining how to declare functions, how to make function calls. So by the end of this section, you should have a pretty good understanding of how functions work. Don't worry, we're gonna get through that. So as we said, our square function accepts one parameter called number. That's what we reviewed so far. Then we have an opening curly brace. It represents a start of the function block. Everything else up to the closing curly brace right there represents the function body. In function body, we can write all the things we learned so far about JavaScript. We can create variables, do something with operators, add if else statements, and so on. This example function is consisted of one statement that says to return the parameter of the function, that is number, multiplied by itself. The return is really important. Every function needs to have it. It specifies the value that will be returned by the function. And how can we retrieve values from functions? We need to call them. Let me explain what do I mean by that. Now we are going to go to the second part, which is a function call. And then in there, we'll have to see how we can make a call to that function. Defining a function does not execute it. Defining it simply names the function and specifies what to do when the function is called. That means that in here, when we created this function declaration or when we defined a function, our code didn't do anything. If I save this, you can see, we see nothing in the console. This code wasn't even executed. We can test that if we add a simple console log right there, console log, and let's do I'm here. If we get this I'm here, that means that our JavaScript code was executed inside of here. Let's save it. And as you can see, we don't get anything. That means that the code that we've written so far wasn't even executed. And that's the thing, that's important to understand. This is just a function declaration. 
we need to make a function call to actually call or execute the code inside of this function block. So let's see how we can do that. Calling the function actually performs the specified actions with the indicated parameters. For example, if you define the function square, you could call it as follows, square, and then a pair of parentheses. In here, we have the function name, this one, and then we have the parentheses. In parentheses, we put something known as arguments. Arguments are the values we want to fill our parameters with. For example, if we send the value of five, our parameter called number in the function declaration is going to become the number five. Then we multiply it by itself and then we return it. As you can see, we now get the I am here console log. It is printed to the console, but for some reason, we don't get the value of 25, right? Five multiplied by five. Why is that? Well, we need to make use of that return value of the function. And how do we do that? How do we get the result of this function? Well, we have to store it in a variable. We can do that by creating a variable. In this case, we can call it result. So right there, const result is going to be equal to, and then we're going to assign our function call to it, just like this. What this is going to do is it's going to take the return value of our function. In this case, it's going to be five times five, which is going to be 25, and it's going to assign it to our result. Then we can console log the result to see the final value. Now we can remove this console log. So we just have a clean number times number function. We are calling our function right there. And then we are assigning a result of this function to a variable called result. Finally, we can do a console log as we learned, and then we can print out that result to the console. This is going to store the return value of the function square called with an argument of five to the result variable. Now, if we console log it, we indeed do get the value of 25 right there in the console. This is just an introductory video. We went through quite a lot of stuff in here. So I would advise you to rewatch this video one more time. And the only thing you should really take from this video is to know what a function declaration is, where we define a function and know what a function call is, where we call or execute the function. Therefore, you need to know that the function declaration is not going to be called, is not going to be executed. We are not going to see any code until we actually make a function call. In the next video, we are going to repeat everything we learned so far about functions, and we are going to go into just a bit more depth about declaring and calling our functions. In this video, we are continuing exactly from where we left off. As we learned in the last video, functions are sub programs designed to perform a particular task. The code of the function is executed when the function is called. This is known as invoking the function. So as you can see, sometimes it's called a function call, executing a function, invoking the function. These are all buzzwords and synonyms, but they all mean the same thing, calling or executing our function. Let's revisit the process of creating or defining a function, this thing here. There are a few different ways to define a function in JavaScript. There is a function declaration, as you can see right there. It defines a named function. In our case, it is named square. To create a function declaration, you use the function keyword followed by the name of the function. Let's just comment all of this for now, and then we'll write this down below. In here, we are talking about a function declaration. And let's see an example. To create a function declaration, you need to use the function keyword, as we learned, followed by the name of the function. Let's just call it name right there. Then you can also pass some parameters, or let's call them params in this case. And then you can execute a range of different JavaScript statements, just like that. So this was a function declaration. You already learned how to do this. There is also a function expression, function expression. A function expression defines a named or anonymous function. An anonymous function is a function that has no name. In this example, we are setting the anonymous function to be equal to a variable. In here, we are using the same old variables we are used to. 
and we are making it equal to a function expression. So right there, we write a function keyword, we can pass some params in, and there we can do our statements. So this is a different way of declaring a function. You can see in the first way, we have a function, and then we have a name with params. In this case, in a function expression, we have a variable, and then we are setting the value of the variable to be a function expression. And the third way is called an arrow function. So an arrow function expression sometimes, but it's just shortened for an arrow function. So what is an arrow function? Arrow function is a shorter syntax for writing function expressions. It looks like this, const name of the function, there it accepts params, and then it looks really, really similar to this, but now you have the statements here. As you can see, all of the three ways of creating a function look basically identical. They have some small differences. You do not have to learn all of them. Arrow functions are the most modern way to create a JavaScript function. For that reason, we're going to explore them in much more detail in the upcoming video. So in 99% of the cases, we'll be using arrow functions. There's only one advantage of using a function declaration, and that is that they have the access, have access to this keyword. So when, when you wanna use the this keyword, again, more in that much later in the course, then you need to use a function declaration in all other cases, basically 99.9% .9 of the cases where you don't use this keyword, feel free to use a JavaScript arrow function. It is the most concise and modern way to create a function. Okay, now let's explore a few ways on how we can actually invoke a function. For that, I'm going to comment this out. Feel free to keep that and play with that. Make some function calls maybe to these functions change the names, change the parameters, console log something, just so you can see what's happening in there. Now I'm going to give you a full example of creating a function and then we're gonna invoke it or call it. Just to repeat, a function is executed only when it is called. This process is also known as invocation. You can invoke a function by referencing the function named followed by an open and closed parentheses. So if we, for example, wanted to invoke this function, this arrow function, the only thing that we would have to do is we wanna call the name, because that's the name of the function, and then a set of parentheses, that's it. Okay, I'm going to comment this out, because right now we are going to create and test our invocations on real functions. We are gonna define a function named say hi. This function will take only one parameter, and it's going to be called name. When the function is executed, the only thing that we want to do is call a console.log, and in there, we're going to have backticks, and we're going to say hi, dollar sign curly braces, and then the name. So what's happening here is that we want to console log the hi name, where name is going to be coming as a function parameter. Now, if we save this, nothing is going to happen as you can see on the right side. But what do we need to do to make this work? We need to invoke, call, or execute our function. To invoke our function, we call it while passing in the name argument. In this case, let's call our function say hi, and let's pass an argument which is going to be a string of, for example, Joe, that's it. Now, if I save this, in this case, the output is hi Joe, Imagine you have this function connected to a machine that stands in front of a bar, for example. Whenever a user enters his ID, this function is going to greet him by his name. So that's one use case. You could do that with JavaScript potentially. That's great. For example, if we do say hi, and if we enter Jane right there, as you can see, we get hi Joe and hi Jane just by changing this little thing. We don't have to every time repeat ourselves and write the whole console log right there. In this case, we get back the console log, but as you can see, we have no return value. And why is that? Remember when we said that every function needs to have a return statement? This one doesn't have it. This one just console logs something. In the next video, we are going to go into more depth about the return statement in a JavaScript function. Every function in JavaScript returns undefined. 
So every function returns undefined unless otherwise specified. That means if we don't say what do we want our function to return, it's always going to be undefined. Let's create a function called add. So now we know we can do function, we name it add, and then we have a set of parentheses. There we can enter some of the parameters. In our case, let's just do a and b, which are going to be two numbers. Then we have a pair of curly braces, which means that this is our function body. And then in there, let's just return a plus b. So when calling this function with values of two and two, we're just going to return a plus b, two plus two, and that's gonna be four. Now we need to call it, of course, because nothing is happening right now. So we can create a new variable called sum, and then we are going to make the sum equal to the function call of this variable, and that's gonna be a and b. And we are going to enter our arguments there, the arguments of two plus two, for example. Now we are currently not doing anything with the sum. To get the value, we need to console log the sum. So in here, I'm going to console log the sum to see what's happening. And as you can see, that's it, we get four, awesome. The return statement not only returns values from a function, but it assigns them to whatever called the function right there, in this case, that sum. Another important rule of the return statement is that it stops the function execution immediately. For example, if just above this return statement, we create a new return statement, which is always going to return a static value of returned. Just like that. As you can see, this return is already grayed out. It's unreachable code detected. So whenever we have multiple return statements, only the first one is going to be executed. As soon as the first return is reached, it immediately goes outside of the function. It goes here, it does the sum and just keeps on going. It doesn't care about what's happening after something is already returned from the function. So in this case, if we do this, as you can see, we only get returned and nothing else is happening. Okay, consider this. Let's say that we have another function and the function is going to be called test, just like this. In there, we're going to return true and just below, we're going to return false. Down below, we are going to set our value. We can call it Boolean. So let's do const bool is going to be equal to, to the return of this function. So we set this equal to the function invocation. And then we can finally console log the Boolean. What do you think this value is going to be? Is it going to be true or false? If I save this, we do get true. That's because it's the first return value in this case. And of course, it is the one that is returned from the function. The first return statement immediately stops the execution of our function and causes our function to return true. The code on this line, return false, is never executed. We can test it by adding some console logs inside of our function. For example, on the top of our function, I'm going to create a console log that is going to just have the value of one. Below, I'm going to add the console log with the value of two. And then even more below, I'm going to add the console log with the value of three. What do you think? Which console logs are the ones that we are going to see in the console? As you can see, we only got the console log with the value of one. As soon as the function returns something, in this case true, it doesn't care about anything else. It's done its thing and now other JavaScript code can be run. In the next video, we are going to explore arrow functions, the modern way of writing JavaScript functions. And that time came. Now we are working with arrow functions. From now on, you'll only see me write these. They're the most modern and most concise way of writing JavaScript functions. At the start, they're going to look a bit weird to use, but once you start using them, you'll see how concise and simple they are. They have only one difference from, let's say, normal functions. Arrow functions do not create their own this value. This is a special JavaScript reserved keyword. We are going to explain it later in more detail. The only thing that you should know right now is that arrow functions do not have the this reserved keyword. In 99% of the cases, we are not even going to need it. So you'll see me write arrow functions almost always. 
So how does an arrow function look like? Let's take our square example from the beginning. It looks something like this const. So we declare arrow functions using normal variables. We can be const or left. And then we have the variable name as always. Then we have a set of parentheses. And then we have an arrow which points to a function block. Again, I know at the start, it's going to look a bit weird. But as you get used to it, you'll see all the power that they have. So in here, this is a set of parentheses. And in there, you can set some uh, parameters. In this case, we're going to take in a number. And then in here, we can return as we did before a number times a number just like that. I personally cannot do a lot to help you remember the syntax that thing you're going to have to do by yourself. So this is never going to change It's always going to be the same thing const function name and then the equal sign parentheses all the parameters that you have and then an error sign. If you didn't notice, this arrow is actually the equal sign and then the larger than sign. It just joins them for me because I have the font installed. So it's just the equal sign and then the larger than or greater than sign. And then it points to a function block, which is just a set of curly braces. This is the syntax you will need to remember. But once you write five functions, 10 functions, 50 functions, it's easily going to get in your muscle memory and you'll be just writing arrow functions really, really, really quickly. Great. So our specific function in this case returns a number times a number and it accepts one number as a parameter. Let's make a function call right here to see what do we get with our result. So in there, I'm going to create const result and we're going to make that equal to a square of let's say five. If you take a closer look, you can see that the call or invocation of an arrow function is absolutely identical to the call of a function declaration. That makes it so much easier. There we can make a console log and let's simply console log the result to see what do we get. Okay, in our case, we get 25. If we for example, change this to 10, we should get 100. And we do as you can see right there. Arrow functions also have a shorter and more concise version. Whenever we have only one return statement inside of an arrow function and absolutely nothing else, we can return it instantly in one line. To do that, we have to remove this return statement and a pair of square brackets. Then we are left with something that looks like this. In there, you can see the name of the arrow function. So this is like an arrow and there it points or returns to some value. If you think about it, it makes sense. This is a variable and everything after the variable is a function. Everything after the arrow is the return of that function. Just so we can have both ways side by side, I'm going to create the same function below. So that's going to be const square one, for example. It also accepts a number. And then after the arrow, we return a number times number. So one more time, when you have only one return statement, you can omit the curly braces and the return statement and just bring all of this in one line. And that's going to be the same. Now we can make a variable called result one which is going to be equal to, to the call of the square one function. That's this one right there. And now let's also console log the result one. And as you can see, we get 100 and 100, which means that these two functions are identical. As you can see, this one is just a bit more concise. One more thing I'd like to mention in regards to arrow functions is that when you have only one parameter, you're sometimes going to see people just remove the parentheses. So when you have only one, it's completely fine to just leave it without the parentheses. We can do the same thing here. And we can do the same thing here. You can see if you refresh and save, it works absolutely the same thing. But when you have two or more parameters, as in this case, A and B, then you need to wrap them in a set of parentheses, because this right now, as you can see, is not going to work. I just wanted to let you know that uh, because some people use this without parentheses. Uh, for me, I always like to leave parentheses, even if there is only one parameter, it's just a personal preference. Great. So we went through a lot in this video. I'm 100% sure that for people just starting with this, 
functions and arrow functions are going to look really, really weird. They have more syntax than anything else we've gone through so far. The good thing is that there is not a lot of logic happening here. You don't have to really uh, figure how things work. The only thing you have to do is just remember how the syntax of an error function works. And that's, as I said, always the same thing. Const, function name, equal sign. Then we have parameters, the equal sign and the greater than sign connected into an arrow. And then we have the function block with a return statement. In the end of this section, I'm going to leave you some examples so you can practice functions by yourself. If you're new to JavaScript, you may have heard the terms parameters and arguments used interchangeably. While very similar, there is an important distinction to make between these two keywords. Parameters are used when defining a function. They are the names created in the function definition. Parameter is like a variable that is only meaningful inside of this function. It won't be accessible outside of the function. Arguments are real values passed when making a function call, just like that. So now you know when we use the name arguments and when the name parameters. If we go back to our old example where we created a function called say hi, it accepts one parameter called first name, and then we can do console.log. In there, we say hi, and we have first name. So this is the function we had at the start of our section. Just below that, we are going to make a function call, and we are going to call our function with the value of Joe. If we save this, you're going to get the value of hi Joe right there. So in this example, our function called say hi accepts one parameter, first name. Parameters can be named anything. The only thing that matters is the order. Let's try replacing the first name with just the name. So if we do this and say one more time, you can see we still do get hi Joe. That works. Nothing changed. Our function still works. That means that parameters are just names we create for the arguments we are planning to pass into the function. As you can see, when calling the function, we have one argument right there. The argument is a real JavaScript value. In this case, it's a string of Joe. Let's try adding another parameter to practice a bit more. Let's say that we want to take in both the name and the age of the person. To do that, we'd need to add a second parameter separated by a comma, and let's call it age. Now we need to also provide an argument to fill in the value of the age. We do that when making a function call. Right there, let's say that our Joe person is 25. Then we can console log, let's do something like first name or just name is age years old, just like that. Now, if we save this, you can see our function returns Joe is 25 years old and all of that because we called our say hi function with the first parameter of name Joe and the second parameter of the age of 25. Just to repeat, name and age are parameters and Joe and 25 are values that are going to be filled into the parameters called name and the age. There's also one more thing to mention. What if we don't specify the second parameter? What would happen if we did this? As you can see, we get Joe is undefined years old. That means that we are not passing an argument for the parameter of age. When that happens, that parameter automatically receives the value of undefined. It is not defined. So how can we make it if our user doesn't input the age, we always get something and not undefined. For example, in here, we can use something known as a default parameter. We make an equal sign next to the parameter name, and then you specify the default age. For example, we can say zero. If the age is not entered, we get Joe is zero years old. We can do the same thing for the name. For example, if the user doesn't enter the name, let's delete that argument we're going to get undefined is zero years old. And in that case, we can make a default parameter of, for example, Jane. So if there is no name entered, we always get Jane. 
This doesn't make a lot of sense. We have our say hi function, which would greet a specific person. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to greet Jane, for example, if no person is specified. When it makes more sense to use default parameters is when using mathematical operations. For example, if we had a function called add and the function add accepts two parameters, a and b. Now in there, we're going to return the value of a plus b and let's call our function with the values of two and two. If we do that, we need to store this in a variable. So const result is going to be equal to add. And then right there, we can console log the result. Okay, we do get four. But what if something happens in if we don't provide a second argument to this function? As you can see, we get nan. That's not good. As you can see, we were expecting to get a number and instead we get not a number. Why did that happen? Well, since we didn't provide a second argument, the value of the B parameter was undefined. In JavaScript, when you try to add the undefined to a number, you're immediately going to get not a number. So what we need to do to make this work is we need to set the default value of this parameter. And there we can set it to zero. If we do this, now you get two, because if there is no B, the B is going to take the value of zero instead of just being undefined. We can do the same thing for the A variable. So right now, if we call the function without any parameters, you can see we get zero. But if we do, for example, three and three, we get six, three and four, it's seven, which means if there are parameters, everything works, but we just made a fail safe there with default parameters. So if the users don't pass variables, that's not going to break our program. We are still going to return the number of zero. Hey, and welcome to another section of the course. In the upcoming three videos section, we're going to cover some tricky concepts in JavaScript, scope, hoisting, and closures. First, we're going to talk about the concept of scope, a fundamental topic for any programming language. Then we're going to mention the concepts of hoisting and closures. I would dare to say that they are not all that useful in everyday coding. You're going to see what I mean in the upcoming videos. If you stick to the good programming habits, you would never even have to encounter the use of hoisting. I've still decided to include the so-called tricky concepts because questions regarding closures and hoisting are often asked in interview questions. I've got you covered. Let's talk about scope. What is scope? Why do we need it? And how can it help us write less error prone code? Scope simply allows us to know where we have access to our variables. It shows us the accessibility of variables, functions, and objects in some particular part of the code. Why would we want to limit the visibility of variables and not have everything available everywhere in our code? Firstly, it provides us with some level of security to our code. In a moment, I'm going to show you a picture and then it's gonna make more sense. And secondly, it helps us to improve efficiency, track bugs, and reduce them. It also solves the problem of naming variables. We have three types of scope global scope, local scope, sometimes also considered a function scope, and a block scope, only with Latin const variables. Variables defined inside a function scope are in a local scope, while variables defined outside of a function are in a global scope. Each function, when invoked, creates a new scope. There are rules about how scope works, but usually you can search for the closest opening curly brace and closing curly brace around where you define the variable. That block of code is its scope. All of this might be confusing until you see some examples. You're going to immediately understand what a scope is. Let's explore it in code. Inside of here, I have opened a new folder inside the Visual Studio code. I named it 06 tricky concepts. And as usual, we have the index.html and the script.js file connected to that index.html. You can right click it, open with it live server, and then we can have the console running on the left side and our code here on the right side. Amazing. So what is so-called global scope? When you start writing in any JavaScript document, you're immediately in the global scope. Right here, if I was to write something, const name is equal to John, for example, this variable here is written inside of a global scope and it can be accessed by any other scope. What do I mean by that? Well, if we create a new function, const log name, 
and it's going to be an arrow function. Inside of there, if we want to console.log that name, just like this, we are going to be able to do it. Now let's do a function call log name, just so we can see the output of the function and let's save it. Now, as you can see on the right side, we do get John. That means that we have access to the name variable inside of the log name function. As you can see, the name variable is defined right there on global scope and we have access to it anywhere and also in the log name function. Great, so what are some advantages of using global variables? You can access the global variable from all the functions or modules in your program. It is usually used for storing constants as it helps you with the consistency. For example, if you everywhere have the same variable, then you declare it here and you can reuse it all across your file. Also, a global variable is useful when multiple functions are accessing the same data. For example, if we had a function called log name two, and then in there, we also want to console log the name. Now, it wouldn't make sense to create two different name variables, like const name is equal to John, just like that, right? With this, we have to declare the variable here and also here. But if we have just one declared in the global scope, then we can reuse it in both of these functions. Great, these are the advantages of using the global scope. Now let's talk about the disadvantages. If we declare too many variables in the global scope, they remain in the memory till program execution is completed. This can cause the out of memory issue. But generally, it's also not considered a good practice to have everything in the global scope because it's gonna keep running until the program is over. Secondly, data can be modified by any function. Any statement written in a program can change the value of a global variable. This may give unpredictable results in multitasking environments. For example, what do I mean by that? Well, if we declare this global variable with let, now the function log name can also change the name. So we can do name equal to Jane, for example, and then it logs something. Or for example, we can console log it and then change the name. We can also console log the name here. Uh, so that's gonna be console log name. And now let's bring this function call above. If we save this, now you can see that this function altered this variable here and that may lead to unexpected results. In here, the variable was John, but in here we changed it to Jane and the changes still remained in the global scope. Now let's talk about the local scope. Variables defined inside a function are in the local scope. In here, we can change this to const and as you can see, this is a global scope. But in here, I'm going to write a comment. We're gonna say, local scope or also sometimes called function scope inside of here we're going to create some function we can name it like that some function and that function is going to create a variable and this here is considered the local scope everything from line 5 to line 7 or more precisely inside of this block of code is considered a function or a local scope so if we were to declare a variable right here, const name is equal to uh, Jenny, for example, let's now comment out this uh, global scope variable. Now, of course, we can do a console log here. Let's console log the name and let's make a function call, some function and just like that. As you can see, we do get Jenny. But now what would happen if we tried to console log the name right there in the global scope. What we had before is that we had the global variable and we called it inside of a function scope that worked. But this time we have a function variable and we are trying to call it outside. So in the global scope, if we now do that, and if we save, as you can see, we get nothing name doesn't exist and that's not valid. That means that we cannot use local variables outside of the scope they were declared in. Now, if we were to write another function inside of this function, so let's do another function is equal to an arrow function. And then whatever we do in here is going to be one more inner local scope. So if this thing here, let's say local scope, and then that's gonna be number one, then this thing here inside can be local scope number two. 
That means that whatever we write in here, let's write a const name is equal to John. This variable can be accessed inside of here, inside of the function it was declared in from line five to line 17, but it can also be called inside of the inner function. So if we test it out and save it, you can see that right now, well, we don't get anything because we're cons logging the thing outside and we're only calling this some other function, but let's also call the inner function just so we can get that cons log. So another function, call it. And as you can see, we do get both cons logs. That means that the variables you declare above can be used below, but not vice versa. What do I mean by that? Well, if we now declare this variable in the second uh, local scope and we try console logging it above in the above scope and if we now again call both functions you can see we get nothing we cannot access this variable if you hover over it it even says that name is declared but its value is never read this picture nicely represents what's happening we have the outer function and we also have the inner function as you can see we can see from the inside to the outside. That means that we can access the outer variables from the inside. But if we try to access the variables from the inside, from the outside, that's not gonna work because in here we have something called a one-way glass. So you need to know, if you want to use something in multiple functions, you need to bring it above to the point where every function has access to it. Great. If this topic is still confusing to you, just make sure to write some code, write some functions, declare some variables, play with const logs, just so you can get a better feeling of how it all works. Scope is one of the fundamental topics of any programming language. So let's talk about some advantages of using local variables. The use of local variables offers a guarantee that values of variables will remain intact while the task is running. You can give local variables the same name in different functions because they are only recognized by the function they are declared in. That means that if we want to create a variable called name, let's now delete this inner function. So if we want to create a variable called name in here and do John, and then if we have another function, so const another function, in here, we can also have the variable with the same name, const name equal to Johnny, for example. Now, if we try cons logging both names, we should indeed get two different names and no error. That's because we declare them in completely different functions in completely different scopes. As you can see, once we call both of them, we do get John and Johnny. If you had just one global variable, this wouldn't work. Also, local variables are deleted as soon as any function is over and release the memory space which it occupies. That means that when this function is over with doing whatever it's supposed to do, then the memory for keeping this variable is out and that makes our code more efficient. Opposed to having the variables outside, they always keep running. So what would be some disadvantages? And the disadvantage is that they have a very limited scope. For example, now, if you wanted to cons log the variable from the sum function outside, you wouldn't be able to do it because the scope is limited only to this function. This isn't necessarily a disadvantage, but if you ever find yourself needing to use that variable in a parent scope, just declare it there, that's it. So if you ever need to do this, just bring this variable above and you should be fine. We talked about the global scope and the local scope. Now let's talk about the block scope. Does block scope have any differences to local scope and the global scope? Well, let's say that we have a simple if statement. The condition doesn't really matter, but let's say that we have just true here. That means that it's always going to be executed. Now you can see this is similar to the function, right? We have the curly braces, which mean that we have a block of code. Variables defined with const and let have something called a block scope. That means that they will be available only inside of the block of the code you create them in. For example, if we create a variable const name is equal to, let's do John again. If we do this, and if we try cons logging it here, of course, as we learned, we have the access to the variable since it was defined in this scope. But now, can we do cons log name right here inside of the global scope 
not inside of this block scope. Let's try it out. As you can see, we do not have access to it. That means that it behaves really, really similarly to the local scope or the function scope. As you can see, any variable we declare in some sort of a block, like a function or if statement or a for statement, we do not have access to it outside of that actual block. That's not the case with var variables though. As you can see, if we do var name equal John, and if we do this, we do get John. And that's a problem. That's the exact reason why people stop using var and transfer it over to let and const. So what is more useful? The local and global variables are equally important while writing a program in any language. However, a large number of the variables may occupy a huge memory. Also, global variables are tough to identify because later we may have files with 150, 200, 500 lines of code. And then when you're using that variable on line 250, you always need to scroll back to the top to see where it was actually declared. Therefore, it is advisable to avoid declaring unwanted global variables. Always declare variables in the scope that you want to use them in. In this video, we are going to talk about the concept of hoisting in JavaScript. Why is it considered a tricky concept and why do interviewers keep asking it on interviews? Also, I'm going to let you know something right away. Hoisting is almost never used in modern JavaScript. You'll see why shortly. So why are we even talking about it here? Well, you took an in-depth JavaScript course and in here, I wanna make sure to cover everything that is used in JavaScript. So if someone mentions hoisting or maybe asks you that question in an interview, you will be able to provide an answer. With that said, let's explain what it is. So hoisting is a JavaScript mechanism where variables and function declarations are moved to the top of their scope before code execution. In the last video, we learned what scope is. This means that no matter where functions and variables are declared, they are moved to the top of their scope regardless of whether their scope is global or local. Basically, when JavaScript compiles all of your code, all variable declarations and function declarations using all way of writing functions are hoisted or lifted to the top of their scope, whether is it local or global. Now, this may sound confusing. That's exactly why we're going to show it right here in an example. In JavaScript, an undeclared variable is assigned the value undefined at execution and is also type of undefined. So if we try to console log a type of of the variable, let's say age right here, what are we supposed to get? Well, we get undefined. So we are trying to console log the variable or the type of the variable, which we never declared. So we get undefined. But what would happen if we just tried console logging the age alone? Remember, age has never been declared. As you can see, we get uncaught reference error, age is not defined. Of course, we cannot have variables which we never defined. So what does this has to do with hoisting? Well, you would say we need to declare a variable age right here. For example, where age is equal to something like 20. And that would of course work. But let me show you a trick. If I declare var age even here, we are also going to get rid of the error. So let's save it. And as you can see, now it gets to undefined. Why is that so? That's because of the hoisting. And that's something you should never actually enforce using. As you can see, if we declare it normally, just right here using var, we get 20. But even if we declare it below, which shouldn't actually work, it kind of does because we don't get error anymore. We only get undefined. So that's called hoisting, bringing the variables to the top of the scope. Key thing to note in regards to hoisting is that only thing that gets moved to the top is the variable declaration. So only this thing gets to the top, not the actual value given to the variable. What do I mean by that? Well, hoisting actually does something that looks like this. It declares a variable, then moves that to the top and then declares the actual value to the variable. So this would be what hoisting actually looks like behind the scenes. As you can see, we get undefined right there. Of course, you should always declare variables before actually calling them. With that, we don't have any problems. We get the variable right there. So why is hoisting even useful? 
Well, it's not. It's just good to know that it exists so that if something ever occurs, you know that maybe hoisting affected that. You should always be declaring variables at the top and you should never be concerned with hoisting. Um, so let's take one more example. So if we declare a variable hoist right here, and then if we tried console logging it, hoist, and just below, if we tried giving it a value, hoist, uh, the variable has been hoisted. Okay, so if you try doing this, you can see we get undefined. And if you put the variable below the console log, we also get undefined. Only if we move both of them at the top, we get the actual value. Okay, let's do the second example. In here, we're going to have a function, so hoist. And notice how we have a normal function declaration here, even though I said that we'll be from now on always using arrow function. This is an exception, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment. In here, let's try console logging a variable, for example, console log message. As you can see, the message variable hasn't been declared yet, but let's try declaring it here, var message, and let's say test. Of course, now we can try calling the function, hoist. Okay, we get undefined, because as we said, um, only the declaration is going to get up to the top, so that's gonna look something like this, var message, then we console log the message, and then we actually set the value to the variable. That's hoisting for you guys. There's no real use case in that. You always can declare variables just like this. Declare it, provide it a value, and then below, make sure to use it, not the other way around. Always declare the top and then use. So if you do this, you can see we get test. Here's a tricky one. What would happen if we brought the function call at the top? So before the function declaration, what do you think? Are we going to get the error? Are we going to get undefined? Or are we going to get the console log of this message? If we do that, we're going to get test. That means that even though we declared our function later, still that function was hoisted to the top. So the same thing that happens with variables also happens with function declarations. They get hoisted to the top. This section of the course is the only time you'll see me use the older syntax like function declarations and var keywords. Why is that? It shows you that newer versions of JavaScript are trying to get away from this way of writing code. It's good to know that hoisting exists, but you should never actually use it. Always declare variables where they should be. At the top of the scope, they are used in. That way, your code is always going to be predictable and you don't have to rely on hoisting. With let and const, you get back exactly what you would expect, a reference error. What's the situation with hoisting for const and let variables? Let's try it out. So if I declare a variable called age and put it equal to 25, if I then try to console log the age, of course this works, right? We declare the variable at the top and then we use it right here. But now let's do that crazy thing where we bring the console log up and the variable down. Is this gonna work? As you can see, with modern JavaScript using constants, we get reference error, cannot access age before initialization. That's mean that the actual declaration of a variable using const is not hoisted to the top. So if you try doing let, the same thing should happen. You can also see cannot access before initialization. And I'm actually really glad that this happened because this enforces good programming habits. Always declare your variables at the top of the file. Just to get back at this example for a second, we said that normal function declarations like these ones are actually hoisted. So we can do something like this, call the function before we actually declare it. So now let's write the similar, the same actually, modern arrow function. const hoist is equal to an arrow function where we're going to have um, just the message inside. Now, if we try to call hoist before, let's save it, as you can see, cannot access hoist before initialization. Another way to show you that with modern JavaScript, hoisting doesn't really exist. Just to sum up this lesson, I want to say that hoisting as well as closures, which we're going to mention in the next video, are complex topics. I would say that they are not even all that useful in everyday coding. If you stick to the good programming habits, you would never even encounter hoisting or closures. I've still decided to include them in the tricky concepts part, because questions regarding closures and hoistings are often asked in the interview questions, so there you have it. Okay, in the next video, we'll talk about closures. And welcome to the last video in tricky parts section. 
In this video, we are going to cover closures. Before I start explaining closures, let's first write an example and then we'll go through it to actually see what closures are. Okay, so let's say that we have a function const outer is equal to an arrow function. I'm going to let you know why outer in just a second. And then inside of here, we're going to have a variable called outer var, which is going to be equal to just a string of hello. Now inside of here, let's try console logging the outer variable. And let's also call the function. So we're going to call the function outer. But just before that, let's also try to console log the outer variable from here. So outer var. If you learn the scope well, you should already know that we shouldn't get anything in here. The outer variable is declared only in this scope right here. So this should give us an error. If we try running it, you can see that we get outer var is not defined. That's fine. So now let's remove that error. And let's just do it like this. So we have a function where we have a variable, and then we're console logging that variable. If we do that, we of course get hello. So what is the point of this? I just wanted to let you know that as soon as the function executes, all of its contents are gone, they are dead, they don't exist anymore. So if we call this function, uh, and then it runs, it goes from line three, line four, five, six, as soon as it's done with like, the execution, everything that's inside is dead, it's gone. And this is where the concept of closures comes in. That's exactly why we call this function outer, because now we're going to have a function inside of a function. We are going to call this function inner, so inner function. And then inside of there, we are, if you can guess it, going to create a variable called inner var, which is going to be equal to, let's just do hi instead of hello. And then now, instead of console logging just the outer var inside of here, we are going to console log both the outer var and also the inner var. So now if you remove this console log, what do you think is going to happen if we try calling the inner function just like this? Do we even have access to it? As you can see, since the inner function is inside of this scope, we cannot call it like this because it belongs to the scope of the outer function. I know this might be confusing, but we can also return the inner function from the outer function. We can do that. And that's the concept of closures. So what can we do now since we are returning the inner function? Well, we can put it in a new variable. So const inner function, and then we can call the outer function. If you remember correctly, if we call the function, that gives us what the function is returning. In this case, the function is returning yet another function. So now we can finally call this inner function just like that. Okay, so why is this a closure? Well, if we save it, you can see we do get both hello and hi. And that's kind of crazy. Why? Well, of course, if we call the inner function just right here, so if we call it right here, you can see it has the access to the variable from the outer scope. As you can see, we have the inner variable, but it has also the outer variable. That's nothing special because we can access in the inner scope, we can access variables from the outer scope right here. But if you look at this case where we create a function outside of a return, in here, we just have the inner function. And this whole thing, this outer function gets kind of deleted we don't have access to the outer variable, which the inner function is referencing to. But because of the closures, we have access to the variables of the parent scope. So as soon as you call it like this, return the function, closures come in, and they give you access to the variables from the parent scope. That's called closures. And that's the reason why even when calling the variable like this, we get both hi and hello. Let's go through this one more time just to make sure you understand it. Normally, when you exit a function, all of its variables quote unquote disappear. This is because nothing needs them anymore. But what if you declare a function inside a function? Then the inner function could still be called later and read the variables from the outer scope. In practice, this is very useful 
But for this to work, the outer functions variable need to quote unquote stick around somewhere. So in this case, JavaScript takes care of keeping the variables alive instead of forgetting them as it would usually do. And that is called a closure. In other words, a closure gives you access to the outer function scope in here from an inner function just like this one. In JavaScript, closures are created every time a function is created at function creation time. I'm sure you still have some questions about closures or you don't yet understand them fully. That's completely normal. I'm going to leave some links in the description so you can learn more about them. But you know what? Let's go through just one more example together just so we can solidify the knowledge. So let's delete this and let's create a new function. We're going to call that function init just to initialize something. And then in here, we're going to have, uh, let's say a variable called, uh, let's do hobby. And hobby is going to be learning JavaScript, just like that. Now we're going to have an inner function called display hobby. And then inside of there, we are going to console log, you guessed it, hobby, just like that. So let's write some comments here. Let, let me make this a bit smaller, extract this on the side. And now, as you can see, this thing here is going to be the local variable created by init function, just like that. Then we have a display hobby function is the inner function or a closure. Then we are using a variable created in the parent function. And then just right there, we're going to call the inner function display hobby. Just like that. And for this to work, we also need to call the init function. If we save this, we get learning JavaScript, which works perfectly, we get the variable and it takes the value of the outer function scope. That's fine. Now let's take a step back and go through this example as the JavaScript interpreter would go through it. Init function creates a local variable called hobby and a function called display hobby. The display hobby function is an inner function that is defined inside of an init function and is only available within the body of the init function right here. Note that the display hobby function has no local variables of its own. However, since inner functions have access to the variables of outer scopes, display hobby can access the variable called hobby, and then we can console log it. So now if you run the code, you can notice that the console log statement within the display hobby function successfully displays the value of the hobby variable, which is declared in its parent function. Nested functions have access to variables declared in the outer scope. Now, if we do the same thing as we did before, where we're going to return the function rather than declaring it right here, and then we're going to create a new function. So const my func is going to be equal to the actual call of the init function like this. And then we're going to call the my function like that. The output should be the same. You can see we get learning JavaScript. So running this code has exactly the same effect as the previous example of the init function. What's different and interesting is that display hobby inner function is returned from the outer function before being executed. At first glance, it may seem unintuitive that this code still works. In some programming languages, the local variables within a function exist only for the duration of the function's execution. Once the init function has finished executing, you might expect that the hobby variable would no longer be accessible. You can see it's only in this scope. However, because the code still works as expected, this is obviously not the case in JavaScript. The reason is that functions in JavaScript form closures. I completely understand that this may still not make a lot of sense to you. And that's completely fine. I just wanted to include this tricky concepts part because that's something that's often asked at interviews and you, you don't really use it all that much in everyday JavaScript life. But it's here, you have it. I'm going to leave some links uh, below as well so you can further improve your knowledge of the tricky concepts in JavaScript. Don't worry, much more interesting and fun things are coming and they're also easier than this one. So no worries at all.
Hello everyone and welcome to the next section of the course. In this section, we're going to take a look at strings in greater detail. So as always, to set up our repository, we're going to create a new folder and then in there create an index.html file, which is going to have a script connected to it in the body. And then in that script, we're going to run it, do a console log that says test, just to make sure we're connected. And then we're going to open our index.html with live server. Then you can open a console and then all of our changes should be saved right there. Amazing. With that out of the way, we can now start with exploring strings in greater detail. We already talked about strings in the beginning of our course when we talked about data types. This video is just going to be an introduction to strings, a quick refresher of what we learned, just so we can have the foundations for all the string methods we're going to learn in the upcoming videos. So let's dive right in. In JavaScript and in any programming language for that matter, we need a way to store text. In JavaScript, we use strings to store text. String is nothing more than a primitive data type. So how can we create strings in JavaScript? Well, as we learned, there are three ways const single, and then in here we can say this is a string. Then we can do a double. So I'm going to name the variable double. And then we can do this. This is using double quoted strings. By the way, I'm using shift option down to replicate a string on a new line. On Windows, that should be shift alt and then arrow down. Great. And then the third way is using something known as backticks, just like this this is a string. So first of all, why do we have three different ways of writing strings? And second of all, why did I put a space in here between single and double quoted strings and backticks? Well, strings created with single and double quotes are the same. We can call them simple or basic strings. They simply represent some static textual value. Strings created with backticks, on the other hand, provide extended functionality. They are dynamic. They allow us to execute real JavaScript logic inside of them. Let me show you what I mean in an example. First of all, I'm going to just console log all of the types of strings we have. So that's going to be single, double, and then finally we'll do backticks just so I can show you that they are all the same. As you can see, this is a string. And if I call a type of operator on them, you can see they're all indeed strings. So why are backticks different? We can delete all of these and then put the dollar sign and curly braces syntax to in here execute something as real JavaScript logic. So for example, if I do two plus two, and then if I remove these type puffs, console log it, you can see now we get four. What would happen if we try doing that in the first two types of the strings? So in here, dollar sign, curly braces, two plus two. You can immediately see just by the highlighting of our code that this is not going to work. These strings have static values, static textual values, while in here we can execute real JavaScript code. Everything that we put in between the dollar sign and curly braces is not simply taken for granted. It is evaluated as JavaScript logic. Therefore, 2 plus 2 returns 4 rather than the string of 2 plus 2. This means that we can also make function calls inside of backtick strings. For example, we can do a const sum, which is going to be an arrow function. And then in there, we can return, for example, a plus b, a and b being the parameters to our function. And then in here, we can create a string, let's call it total. And then we can say the sum is, and then now we can use that dollar sign curly braces syntax and make a function call and provide some parameters. So if we do this, and if I get rid of all the other code that we're not using right now, let's see what the total is going to be. As you can see, the sum is four, but now if we change the parameter to 10, for example, we get the sum is 12, which means that we are in here executing real JavaScript logic. Backticks have one more extra feature. We can span them across multiple lines. This is really useful. For example, I can do something like this and then use enters to specify numbers. One, two, and three. Let's try renaming this to, for example, rows. And now let's see what does our console output. As you can see, we get one, two, three. We have one space there, so this would be more appropriate. One, two, three. 
what would happen if we try doing this with a normal string? Let's try it out. Const rows one is equal to normal strings and then one, two, three. As you can see, it immediately jumps out of the syntax and you get invalid or unexpected token, which is the syntax error. You cannot do that. Now that we went through the introduction of the strings, let me ask you one question. How would the value of the following string look like? Const greeting is equal to, hi, I'm John. Just like that. What do you think? You can already see by highlighting that something is not as it should be. So let's try console logging the greeting. And as you can see, we also get unexpected identifier because in here we broke our string and now we are not getting anything in here. The JavaScript cannot understand what this says because it's definitely not a string. So this produces an error. In here, with a single quote after the I, we actually end the string and JavaScript doesn't know how to evaluate the rest of the code. One way to fix this would be to simply use different types of quotes. For example, in here, we can use double quoted strings and then the apostrophe in the middle is not going to affect the code at all. We're gonna get it, that works fine. But this is not the solution. Imagine if we had both types of strings in the sentence. For example, we can do, hi, I'm John, and then we can say, but people call me, uh, and then quote unquote, Johnny. Hi, I'm Joan, but people call me Johnny. As you can see now, again, this produces an error. To escape the character, you can use the slash. This means that this character is not going to be evaluated as logic after the strings are created, but it is going to be read just like a character, like any other character. So we need to add that sign in between every little quote that we have, and then that's gonna work. Hi, I'm Johnny, we have the apostrophe there, and then we also have double quoted strings inside of there. An even easier way of doing that is without using this escape characters, and you might have an idea of how to do that. We just exchange this for backticks, right? Because none of the strings contain backticks in, in literal syntax. So we can just use that backticks here to wrap them. And then we are allowed to use both the single and double quoted strings inside of them. This way we can write the string however we want. It is quite handy, right? Great, this video contained all the basics of strings and you learned it all. Strings are pretty simple. In the next videos, we're going to explore extended string functionalities like string properties and methods. In this video, we are going to talk about string length and other basic string properties. One thing that we often want to know when it comes to strings are their lengths. You might think that we need to do some complex stuff to get to that value, like loop through all the characters, count them, and then display the value, but it is so much simpler than that. Let's create a string with a name of John, for example. And then just below that, I'll show you how to get the value. Name.length. That's it. You only need to call a length property on a string. For us to be able to see that, we can wrap it in a console log statement, save it. And if you can see correctly, we're getting four in our console here. So that's one, two, three, four. You will be using the length property a lot. It is one of the most used and most useful string properties out there. Also, it is quite simple to learn, right? It is really intuitive. Another thing we might want to do often is get the element at a certain position of the string. We can do it really easily as well. This is how we would get the first letter of a string. So in here, we can, um, remove this console log and then in there we're going to do name so we're calling the name and then using the square bracket syntax we can access a certain position of the character we can say zero. Zero is going to return the first letter so you can see we get j in the console why zero and not one because strings as well as arrays are starting from zero so this is the character of zero one two and then three that's why to get the J, we simply call zero, which is the first letter in this string. And now we can store this in a variable. Let's do const first letter. And also let's try to get the last letter. Const last letter is going to be equal to name. And now let's think about it. How would you get the last letter of the name? Well, you may say, I'm just gonna calculate zero, one, two, three, 
and then call the square brackets of three. Let's save that. We're going to console log the first letter and also console log the last letter. Let's see if it works. We do get J, which is the first one, and then we get N, which is the last one. That works. But now I ask you, how would you get the last letter of, for example, a string, John is a good fella, just like that, and with a dot as well. How would you get the last one? Well, you would say, oh, I have to count. It's easy, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. But you can see there's a problem. We can easily just lost between the letters or nobody has time to really go through it and then uh, calculate the number of letters. So we can use that property, name that length. So that's gonna be name that length. And then we have to decrement one. Why are we decrementing one? Because name that length is gonna return uh, the number of characters. But remember, strings are starting the counting from zero. So because of that, we have to decrement by one. And now if we do this, we get the last character, but now it's dynamic. We can enter a string with as many characters and it's always going to give us the last one. We can get rid of this and in the same fashion, we can also get any character you want. We can do name and then two, which is gonna give us zero, one, two, and so on. You can see we are just using the indexes or indices of actual characters to get them outside of the string. Great, in this video, we learn how to get a length of strings using length property, as well as how to get certain characters of a string. Now let's learn how we can change the case of the string. In this video, we are going to learn how we can change the case of a string. What is a case? You have definitely heard about uppercase and lowercase letters lowercase being lowercase and uppercase, of course, being uppercase. In JavaScript, we have only two really simple and straightforward methods for changing the character case. And they are in here, let's declare a string const, let's do mixed case string. And then let's say, hello, how are you? Just like that. In here, we have capital letters and also some lowercase letters. And now what are the two mentioned methods of changing the case of the string? Well, we can do mixed case and then dot to lower case and then call that as a method. So, so far we explored the dot length property, which was just called like this. Let me put it above dot length. And this is called a property because we are do doing a dot notation without calling it. So we're just accessing a certain property of this string constructor. In this case, this is called a method because we are calling a function on this string constructor. So in this case, this is going to do some changes and it has to be called like so. Great, now that we did that, what's gonna happen? Well, let's try console log in the string. So we'll do console log mixed case string. And now still, nothing happened, right? We still do have capital H and capital H right there. Why is that the case? Well, we have to store it in a new variable. So we're going to do const lower case string is equal to mixed case string dot to lowercase. To lowercase method is immutable, which means that it doesn't change the first string, rather it creates a new one and then it returns it right there so we can store it in a new variable. If we now copy this and try console logging it, you can see now all the letters are lowercase, including the H. Now let's try doing the same thing. Instead of lowercase, I'm gonna say uppercase and then we're gonna call the mixed case string and we're going to call two upper case, just like that. And we can finally console log it to see what's gonna happen. And that's it, we get hello, how are you? Everything is uppercase like we are yelling. So don't use that a lot, but generally this is the way we change the case of the string. Okay, that's all that there is to uppercasing or lowercasing a string. Now stay tuned and let's learn some more useful string methods in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about searching for a substring within a string. And that's something you also may want to do often. For example, you have a string with certain names and then you want to search if a name is existent in that string. So in this case, we're going to look at multiple methods of achieving that, 
most of which do the same thing, but in a different way. In some cases, some methods are better. In other cases, others are better. I'm going to teach you the most popular and most used ones so that you can learn them all and apply them in the situation which you find yourself in. First one on our list is called index of. It looks for the substring in a string starting from a given position. So first of all, let's explore how it works. We're going to use the same string for all of the method testings. So we're going to create a string called hobbies. And then in there, I'm going to say, I love, and then we can put HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, just like that, and save it. Now with the index off, let's say that we want to find if JavaScript is mentioned in the hobbies string. To do that, we're going to write hobbies and then call the index of method on it, just like that. One really, really useful thing I want to teach you guys is that you can hover over the method or over something in Visual Studio Code, which is going to tell you a lot of useful information about it. For example, if you hover over the hobbies, it says that's the string right there. Not that useful because we can see it right there. But imagine if you had a file with a hundred lines, it was down below. Now, if you hovered over it, that would be pretty useful, right? Okay, let's get it back. But the second useful thing is if you hover over the index off. In here, you can see that it is a method a method that we can call on a string. And the, the first thing that we need to specify is the search string and then the position. And then it returns a number, but we'll explore that in action. But the most important thing is this explanation here. It returns the position of the first occurrence of a substring. And it also tells you what params is it expecting. The first parameter being the search string, the substring to search for in the string and the position the index at which to begin searching the string object if omitted search starts from the beginning of the string. Great. This is pretty useful. I'm going to copy all of this and paste it below just so you have that in mind while we are creating or using our index off. Just for this to be more visible, I'm going to spread it into multiple lines just like that. Great. So we want to find out if hobbies include the word JavaScript. So that's why we're going to put in the first substring, which is going to be a string of JavaScript. If we reference to our program here, the substring to search for in the string, that's exactly what we want. We want to search for JavaScript in the hobby string, and we can just save that. And now let's store that in a variable so we can console log it. So we're going to say cons index, and then now we can console log it, console log index. Okay, great. Now we get 21. What does that mean? 21 means that it is found on the 21st position right there. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Right there, after that, we have our JavaScript keyword. It is found, so that's why we returned 21. This method might be useful if you want to find the index of the substring in a certain string, therefore the name index of. Great. We can also specify the starting position so that we can start searching from zero right there. If you don't specify anything, it immediately uh, thinks that you're starting from zero so that you want the whole string. If we said start from 22, then this is not gonna work. You can see we get minus one there because it cannot find JavaScript after the index of 22. But why did it return minus one? Well, let's try searching for something that doesn't exist. For example, let's say react here. If we search for react, we get minus one. Minus one means that there is no react substring in the hobby string. Therefore, it cannot find the starting index of it. And therefore, it returns minus one. Great. Now let's explore the second one, which is called last index off just like that. This needs to be capitalized. And let's see how does it work. We can also use it on the same string. And what would happen if we try doing the same thing. So I'm going to copy this thing. And instead of index off, I'm going to call last index off and pass in react. I have to comment this out, of course, and then write a console log where we console log the index. Now we of course, we get minus one because react doesn't exist. But if we try with JavaScript, 
we get the same thing as we did before because JavaScript is mentioned only one on the 21st position. But if we say JavaScript comma JavaScript and now run this, you can see we get 33. We're gonna change this to first index and this one is gonna be last index. We're, we're going to make them both search for the same substring of JavaScript. And now let's console log the first index and also the last index. As you might assume, we get 21 and 33 because JavaScript is first mentioned in the position of 21, but it's last mentioned in the position of 33. But this is not all that useful, right? We could get the minus one if the string doesn't exist, but we most often don't want to do anything with 21, 33. Why do we need to have a number, right? We only want to know if the string is included in there or not. So much more often, you're just interested if a string contains something and you're not concerned where is it in the string. For these cases, you can use a method called includes. Includes method simply returns a true or false, just a simple Boolean. And this is how you use includes hobbies that includes and then you specify a string you want to look for JavaScript. Now, if you think about it, this is so much more intuitive. Hobbies includes JavaScript. Do hobbies include the word JavaScript? That's it. And then when you ask yourself does something or do something, the answer is always going to be yes or no. That means that we can store it in a Boolean value, for example, const includes JavaScript. And now we can console log that Boolean, console log includes JavaScript. As you can see, now the output is simply true, or if we change it to React, for example, the output is simply false. It's so much simpler, true, false, Boolean value, and then you can do with it anything you want. Okay, and I just want to show you two little short methods called starts with, which are also pretty self explanatory. And then we have ends with. So starts with and ends with. And how do you use them? Well, we can do something like hobbies that starts with. And then what does it start with? Well, it starts with I. So let's try console logging that. Console log starts with I. If we console log it, we get true. If we change it to love, which is the second word, it's gonna say false. It doesn't start with I, right? But it does start with I love. With this method, we can just check if the string starts with something or it doesn't. Again, we get a really, really good Boolean value, just true or false. And then I think you can already assume what ends with does. We can also copy and paste it here, call the ends with, and then let's see what does our string end with. Well, it does end with a dot, right? So this is a nice way to check if the string ends with a dot, we get true. Does it also end with JavaScript and then dot? Yeah, it does, right? Because the whole ending string is JavaScript and then dot. That's it. Two really, really simple methods to use. And that would be it for this video. I want to tell you that this one and this one, as well as these two, you're not going to use them all that much. This includes method in here is going to be your best bet to use whenever you're working with strings, whenever you want to know, does this string include something or not? It is really intuitive, simple to use. And also there are so many use cases for that. So definitely make sure to remember this one. In the last video, we explored how we can find if a substring exists within a string. But once we find the result, for example, the index of the existing substring, or maybe true or false, is it included, we are not getting the actual thing we are looking for. For that, we need to get a substring. These were searching for a substring. And now we're going to explore getting a substring. So I'm going to remove all of this. And then we're going to name this title, getting a substring of a string. To get the substring of a string, the best method to use is called slice. Slice returns the substring of a string. So let's create a demo string. Let's call example string and may the string be hot dog, just like that hot dog. Now, how can we slice this string to get only hot or only dog? Well, we can do this example string dot slice. So we slice it and then we specify as you can see here, it already gave us some info from which index, the start index and the end index. 
the index of the beginning of the specified portion of the string object. So in here we need to specify the start index and that's gonna be three and then the end index is gonna be six. That means zero, one, two, three, four, five. So from three to six, that's it. If I now save this, we can call this variable a dog because that's literally what it is. And then let's console log that dog right there. If we do this, you can see we get dog. We basically slice the string to get only a sub portion or a sub string of that string. We don't even have to specify the last position if that's what we are ending with. So it starts with three and then by default, if you don't specify the second number, it goes to the end of the string. Now let's start with uh, zero. So if you specify zero, it starts from zero and then ends at the end, of course. So we basically didn't do anything. We got the whole string. But if we want to get the hot part, I'm gonna rename the variable, we have to do zero and then three. And that's it. Now we get only the hot part. That's it. This was a simple video telling you how to get a substring of a string if you know the index of the start position and the index of the end position of that specified substring. Great, really simple and short one. In this video, we're going to learn how we can split a string into multiple substrings. For that, we'll be using a method called split. That's it. So let me give you some examples. This is how we can split a word into characters. Of course, we're going to have example string, so const example string, and then let's do just dog. Yeah, that's simple enough, right? To split a string into individual characters, like dog, you have to do the following. Example string dot split, call it as a method, and then specify the splitter. The splitter in this case is going to be just an empty string, doesn't have anything in it. Now let's store that or let's console log that to see what we get back. So if we console log this, we get dog. And now if you notice in here, this is indeed an array, which means that this is a first string method which we explored that as a result returns the array. And it kind of does make sense, right? Once you split something into multiple parts, you get multiple of something. And how do we keep more things in JavaScript, which data type, well, the data type for that is indeed an array. So in here we have DOG, which are all individual letters of strings inside of an array. How could we store that? Well, we can say const letters is equal to string that split, and then we can console log it. This makes sense, right? Whenever you have a plural name, that, that usually means that something is an array. And in this case it is, other great name would be characters whenever you want to split that, but letters is simple. Great. So how can we split a sentence into words? So let's say that our example sentence is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. This is the fun English sentence which contains all the letters of the English alphabet. So this is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Great. If you leave it as it is, you can see we get a characters, right? But in this case, we don't want that. We want to get specific words. To do that, we just have to split the string by space character, right? Because currently we are splitting by nothing. So it's going to split each time by nothing, basically every, every time. But you need to specify the space character as a splitter so that we split only when the space character occurs. To do that, you simply put a space right here. If we save that, now as you can see, we have an array of different strings, which are words of this first string. Both examples which you just discovered right there result in an array. That's it. Amazing. In the next section of this course, we are going to explore arrays in greater detail. So don't worry, we'll learn a lot of useful methods on arrays. In this video, we're going to explore three more useful string methods. Instead of starting by giving you the name of the first method, I want to propose a problem that you may want to solve with a specific method. So if you have an example string of const uh, example string, which is equal to test, the end output should be uh, T S E T just like that. So how should we do that? Well, you may think that we can do const reversed string is equal to example string that reverse. 
this would be amazing. So let's call that and then just do a console log to console log the reverse string. Let's save it. And oops, what happens? Uncaught type error example string reverse is not a function, which basically lets us know that the reverse method for a string doesn't exist. So what is a reverse method? It exists only on arrays. Now, if I tell you that, try remembering what we did a few lessons ago. We used a string method which split our string into multiple characters. And those characters were in an array. So what we can do is we can first split the string. So use the split method to split each character. Now the output of this is going to be an array. Okay. And then we can call dot reverse because reverse is an array method then we reverse it and then we can call a property called dot join which is an array method again more on that once we once we start talking about arrays but now if we save this you can see we get t s e t to reverse a string we cannot use a normal string method dot reverse because it doesn't exist this is one of the things that people often confuse or try doing so i just wanted to give you an example although in here we use the same old split and then the other two methods were array methods. Again, more on that later. So this is how you reverse a string using JavaScript. Now we're going to talk about a method called repeat. Repeat does as repeat sounds. Let's say that you want to repeat a string an X number of times. You can easily do that by using the string that repeat method. Let's say the string is called dog says. So dog says woof, right? That's it. And then we can do a console log dog says and then call the dot repeat method on it and then in there you can specify the number of times you want the string to be repeated let's say five once we do that you'll see we easily repeat the string five times woof 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 <laughs> that's it yeah i just barked there but yeah uh we are repeating the string five times and this is it this is how to use the repeat method again really useful in a lot of scenarios where you need to manage the string to be repeated the last string in this short video is called trim. So we're going to delete this and specify the trim. Sometimes users don't know how to type and we need to clean their emails, usernames and whatnot. We can clean empty spaces using the trim method. For example, what do I mean by that? When we have an example string, so example string, and let's say that the string is hello world, just like that. But let's say that the user unfortunately types some spaces in here at the start of the string and some spaces at the end of the string. Of course, he didn't want to type that. He just wanted to have a string of hello world. There, if we now try console logging this, console log example string, you cannot see it, but there are some empty spaces here, right? So how do we get rid of these empty spaces? Well, we can use the dot trim method on it, of course, lowercase. And you can see now there are no empty spaces. This is just hello world as it is without any spaces. So when is this useful? For example, when you're collecting user emails in the form. So let's say that we have an email field, email, and then, okay, so let's enter an email there, contact at javascriptmastery.com. And what usually happens is that users may leave a few spaces at the end, or maybe even a space in between. And this is really hard to notice while you're typing your email in the form. And why is this such a big deal? Because if you're trying to send the email or confirmation email for a sign up or a login form, this is not gonna be correct because a string of space contact something is not gonna be equal to just a string without space. So the email could be wrong. That's why people usually always trim emails to, so that we always get one value like this. If we now save it, we do get one string without any spaces, but if we don't call the trim, let's see what happens. As you can see, now there are some spaces at the end here and we cannot see them in the console, but the spaces are there. Okay, great. Now you learn how to use the repeat and the trim. And you also learn that we cannot use a reverse method on a string, but we can once we split the string in an array. Great. Let's move on to the next video. To repeat everything we learned about strings and to give you some practice to solidify your strings knowledge, I have prepared an exercise for you. Let's say that we have a guest string. So we have some guests right there. And the guest string is gonna look like this. Const guest list, 
is gonna be our guests are Emma, Jacob, Isabella, and Ethan. That's it. That's our guest list. Now, the first task for you is to get the length of the string and store it in a variable called length. I'm gonna expand this right now just so we get a bit more space. Great. So we have the string of guest list and then the first task is to get a length of the string stored in a variable called length. The expected output is going to be console log length and we should get 44. Great. The second task for you is to uppercase the entire string and then store the result in a variable called uppercased guest list, just like that. And then the expected output is console log uppercase guest list. Our guests are Emma, Jacob, Isabella, and Ethan, all uppercased. The third thing for you to do is to check whether Ethan is on the uppercase guest list and then store the answer in a variable called is eaten on the list. The data type of the variable must be a Boolean. And again, the expected output of that is gonna be console log is eaten on the list and that should return true. The fourth task is for you to create a substring that only contains the following. Emma, Jacob, Isabella, and Ethan. Store the answer in a variable called substring guests. And again, the expected output should look like this. Console log, substring guests, Emma, Jacob, Isabella, Ethan, all uppercase, again, this time without our guests are. Great. The fifth task goes as follows. Out of the substring you just created, create an array of names of people that are on the list. Store that array in a variable called guests. And the expected output is gonna be console on guests, Emma, Jacob, Isabella, Ethan, just like that. So let's go through the whole exercise one more time so that you definitely know what you should be doing. We start with our initial string. Our guests are, and then Emma, Jacob, Isabella, Ethan. Get a length of the string, store it in a variable called length, you have the console log there. Uppercase the entire string and store it in a variable called uppercase guest list. Check whether Ethan is on the uppercase guest list. That should return true. Create a substring that only contains the following. Emma, Jacob, Isabella, Ethan. And store that in substring guests. And then finally, out of the substring you just created, create an array of names of people that are on the list. So this time we have to split the string into an array that contains multiple elements. That's it. In the next video, we'll be back with the solution. Good luck. Okay, so let's see the final solution. The first thing that I'll do is I'll take all of these console logs and then put them at the end of the file. Just like this, using some keyboard shortcut magic. The first thing we should be looking for is the length. Then we are looking for the uppercase guest list. Then is eaten on the list. Finally, substring guests and then guests. Great, and these are our desired outputs. So let's see what do we need to do. First, get the length of the string and store it in a variable called length. Const length is equal to guess list dot length. That's a property that we learned how to use earlier in this section. Then we have uppercase the entire string and store the result in a variable called uppercase guest list. Const uppercase guest list is equal to guest list dot to uppercase just like so. The third thing that we have to do is check whether Ethan is on the uppercase guest list. So we're going to do uppercase guest list that includes. And why did we use includes? Because the data type of the variable must be a Boolean and that's exactly what includes returns, either a true or false. And we are looking for a string of Ethan. We need to be sure to spell it exactly like this and it needs to be all uppercase because if it's not, then it's gonna say that he's not there even though he is. Great. Then we have to create a substring that only contains the following, Emma, Jacob, Isabella, and Ethan. To do that, we are going to create a variable called const substring guests, just like that, and then we have to slice it. And to do that, we use the last thing that we had, uppercase guest list, and call the dot slice method on it. And we need to start from here, right? 
0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, right? We're starting at 16, and if we don't specify the second parameter, we're going to the end, and that's exactly what we need. Great. Finally, out of the substring we just created, we need to create an array of names of people that are on the list, and then store that array in a variable called guest. So we're going to do guests is equal to substring guests dot split. If you remember, we're going to split all the characters right there, but there's a little trick. In the video about split method, we'll learn that you can split by characters just like that, or that you can split by words just like this. So this might have been a problem you found yourself in. You don't know how to separate if there is a comma. We learned only a character split or a word split. To separate by comma, you just put a comma as a separator and that should work. Now, if everything seems to be all right, we missed the is eaten here. So const is eaten on the list is equal to this. And now if everything is all right, we have all of these variables, which we are then cons logging at the bottom. And we can see if we get the desired output. So let's save it now and see if that's it. 44 and then 44 here. Our guests are, our guests are, that's good. Then we get true, Eden is on the list, true. Then we split it, get Emma, Jacob, Isabella, Ethan as a string. And then finally, we split the guests to get Emma, Jacob, Isabella, and Ethan in an array, all as separate strings. That's it. This was a short exercise, which included almost all of the methods that we talked about. And that's it. As you saw, this was just a simple example, but in the real world, when you need to do some real string manipulation, you'll have to use all of these methods and much more. I hope that this little exercise helped you repeat all the knowledge of strings that you already had and that it also showed you how we're going to deal with string manipulation in the real world. Of course, it's going to be much tougher. You're going to have to know all of these methods and more to solve some problem that you find yourself in. Great. In the next section of the course, we'll be working with arrays. Arrays are much more useful, but also much tougher. So bear with me. We're going to go through all of that in the next section of the course. Hello everyone and welcome to the new section of the course. In this section, we're going to explore arrays in detail. In programming, quite often we will need an ordered collection of data where we have a first, second, third element and so on. For example, we need to store a list of something, users, items, elements, etc there exists a special data structure named array to store ordered collections. Now, let's see how we can declare arrays in our code. First of all, just to mention, we created a new folder called arrays in detail. As always, we created an index.html file, a script.js file, and then we right clicked the index.html file and clicked open with live server. After that, you can open the console in your browser, and that means that our files are connected. With that said, we can start playing with arrays. For example, let's do some months. We're going to say const months, and you know that months need to be an ordered collection of data. Months, January, February, March, and so on. So, we declare it as any other variable with a name, and then this is how it works. The syntax is as follows opening and closing square bracket that forms an array in there you can have variables of any other data type for example we can have one two three four and so on but we can also have strings and that's what we're going to do in this case we're going to say january and then you separate it with a comma and the second one is going to be february then we have march and let's do april that's fine for now, we have four months. And they are stored in this data type called array. Array elements are numbered, starting with a zero. We can get an element by its number in square brackets. So if we do something like this, cons a log, and then we reference to the months. Let's see what do we get. As you can see, we get an array, and then in that array, we have four different elements. January, February, March, and April. You can see how we have an array right there. What if we do a type of operator that we learned on the months array? You can see it's an object. 
So we have primitive data types like strings, numbers, null, undefined, and so on. But everything else is a complex data type of object. So arrays are indeed objects. That's something that you need to know. Behind the scenes, they are objects, but we're gonna use them really, really often. So some people think of them as arrays, just, just array as a separate thing, because we are gonna use arrays and objects really, really often, both together, side by side, and that's it. That's why we can call them arrays without any trouble. But if you're asked, what is the data type of an array? That's gonna be an object. With that said, how can we retrieve a certain element in an array? Well, we use square bracket syntax. So in here, we can say square brackets and then put zero in there. If we do that, you can see we get January. So from the whole array where we had this, the whole months, then we took just the zero indexed element. Arrays are starting from zero. So zero, one, two, and three. That means that the zero indexed element is in the January, our first element in this array. We can also replace elements. So if I remove this console log and let's take for example, the third month. So that's gonna be under the index of two, zero, one, two, that's gonna be March. We can say months two is equal to, and let's do not March. So we're gonna change it. And afterwards, we can console log the array. Let's see how it's gonna look right now. You can see we have January, February, not March, April, which means that we successfully changed the third element in this array. We can also add a new element to the array using the square bracket syntax, and we just have to specify the index that doesn't exist yet. For example, zero, one, two, three. So the fourth one is gonna be May. If we now do that and then console log the months, you can see now we have five months, January, February, March, April, and then May. We can also get the total count of the elements in the array. We do that by saying months.length. Let's remove this fifth one. And then we know that we should indeed get four. So this is gonna be really, really useful if you wanna know the number of elements in the array. And as we mentioned, array can store elements of any type. For example, in here we have the months, but now let's do something different. I'm gonna expand this into a new line so we can more easily see it. And then we said we can have something like this, apple, which is a string, right? We can also have an object inside of there where we have name is equal to John, for example. We can also have a Boolean, true. We can also have a function. And now if we console log the months, or let's not call it months anymore because these are not months, let's call them values, just like that. And then we're gonna console log the values. As you can see, we have a lot of different data types in our array, that's completely legal, great. You're often going to find yourself needing to loop through an array to get all the elements one by one. That's where the for loop we've learned comes in handy. I'm gonna do command or control Z to get back to what we had, just the four months before all of these nonsense. And now I'll try to loop through the months. For that, we're gonna use the for loop. As we said, for, the first thing is we have to set the variable equal to zero. Loop until i is lower than, and then now we have to specify the length of the array. Well, we're not gonna say four, right? We know it's four, but let's say that you have many more. You don't wanna count each time. So what we're gonna say is months.length. So this is how you loop over array of any length. You just say while it's less than months.length, great. Or any, any array name that length, great. And then we can say i++, and finally we can console log. In there we can say months, and then get the element under the index of i. Now we can save this and see what do we get. As you can see, now we get separate console logs, one on each line, which means we successfully loop through the array. Next videos in this section are going to be whole lectures about different built-in array methods for looping. They allow us to loop faster with added functionality and less code. With the looping methods, we're going to explore all the most important array methods, such as array sum, array every, array that includes, sort, map, filter, find, reduce, basically everything you need to know about arrays is coming right up. Aside from containing variables at indexes, an array contains a variety of pre-made functions with which you can manipulate its data, like adding or removing elements at certain positions. Let's take a look at a few of the most basic ones right now. 
First of all, we're going to create a new array. We're going to name it names. And this is also one thing that I want to point your attention to is that we are always going to name our arrays with plural names. In here, you can see we have names. For example, we, we can have people, values, months, it's always going to be ending with an S or an ES. Uh, it's just for us so we can visually see that some variable is indeed an array. And then on that array, we can use all of the methods we're going to explore right now. The name is going to be an array. And then let's add some values inside of it. First one, let's do john this time, we can have Bob as well, David, and let's do Mark as well. Okay, we have four male names. Now, the first method we're going to explore is going to be array dot push. Let me write that right there. Array push. Great. Array push is a function that adds a new element containing the entered variable to the end of the array. Let's write it down. Adds a new element containing the entered value to the end of the array. It's hard to see. So I'm going to close this and then span this in two different lines just so it's easier to see. Great. Now, how does it work? Well, we have the names array. And then what we need to do is just call the push method on it. That's going to be names dot push. And then in there, you specify any value. In this case, let's add Dean. And after we do that push method, we can console log the names so we can see if the value was indeed pushed. As you can see, our array now has five elements and the fifth one is Dean. Great. There's one important thing that many experienced web developers don't know about the array that push. What is the return value of the array that push? Many would think that the return value of the push would be an array now including the element we pushed. Let's test it out. So I'm going to console log that to get the return value of what the push method is returning. And let me comment this out, save it and take a look. We get back a number five. The return value is five. Why five? Think about it. It turns out that the array that push returns the length of the array when the element is pushed. We can even store it in a variable like this. Const length is equal to names that push and then Dean. And now we can console log that length. As you can see, we get five. That means that names that push doesn't return a new array. Rather, it just returns the length. In most cases, you don't want to use that length. So the only thing you want to call it like this, but then it immediately changes the names array like that. The return value in here is not important. The important thing is that indeed it changes the original array right there. And then the value is added. We're going to leave this here. And now we're going to go to the second one on our list. It's called array pop pop method does quite opposite from the push method. It deletes the last element of an array. That's it. Since we're doing deletion, basically the only thing we have to do is just do names that pop and call it as a method. We don't have to provide any value in because we're just deleting. Now, if we call this, take a look, we get back. Well, nothing because I didn't put a console log there. But if we console log the names, you should be able to see that the array stays the same as it was on the start, which means that it did successfully delete it because before we added Dean there. So it, we added Dean and then we deleted Dean. If we want to see it in action without first pushing Dean, take a look, it removed the mark. So it removed the last element from an array. This time, the return of the method is not the final length of the array as it is with the array push. Rather, it is the value of the removed element. Let's take a look. You have it in case you need it somewhere. Let's console log it and let's take a look. As you can see, we get back Dean. As it is case with the previous thing, we can also store it in a variable and call it something like removed value is equal to this. And now we have access to the removed value. In this case, that should be Dean. How can this be useful? Let's say you're deleting something. You're, you want to delete the last to do from the to do list. You pop it, right? But then you want to show a message showing the to do saying do this was deleted. And that's where you can get the value of the thing you just deleted. You need to like alert it to the user. This thing here was deleted. And that's where we can use the remote value. 
Great. That's all that we need to know about the names.pop. Now let's move to the next one. Array shift. Shift works almost exactly like pop with one major difference. It deletes the first value in an array and moves the rest backwards. So if we do this, we can say deletes the first element of an array, just like that. And then we call it names.shift. And let's take a look at the output, console log, names. As you can see, we have Bob, David, and Mark. That's because John was deleted from an array because we called names.shift. If shift is the sister function to pop, unshift is that to push. So we're gonna explore array unshift, and that adds a new value to the start of an array. That's it, instead of the end, right? Push adds to the end of the array, and unshift adds a new value to the start of the array. So can we somehow simplify this? Adds a new value to the end of the array, and this one adds a new value to the start of the array. Okay, so how does it work? Well, in the same way that push does. We just call it names.unshift, and then in there, we pass the value we want to add in. For example, let's add Dean one more time, and then I'm gonna console log it. So that's gonna be console log names. Great, you can see we have Dean at the start now. And much like push, it returns the new array length. So if you're interested in the return value of names.unshift, as you can see, it's also gonna be the new length of the array. Not that useful, you most likely just wanna call it and that's it, it changes the array. And two final basic array methods are called array splice and also array slice. People for decades now working with JavaScript have been confused by these two methods, splice and slice. And I, I think you can see why, right? They have really similar names, and once you understand what they do, it's not gonna be that hard. They are a bit more sophisticated, but don't worry, we'll walk you through it. The splice method allows you to splice values into the new array. Its first parameter determines where the new elements are placed, and the second, how many after that point should be deleted before placement. And then all the parameters after are the values you wanna push in. It is harder, but let's take a look in action. So I'm gonna call names.splice, and then in there, we specify where do we want to add new element. Let's say that we want to add them at the second index, so that's gonna be zero, one, two, right there. And then we say, how many elements do we want to remove? Let's say zero. And then we say, what values do we want to add in? Let's add some names. Let's do Jenny and Johnny. Great. Now we splice that. And now let's console log the array. After we do this, you can see that now our array has Dean, which we added right there. Then uh, it doesn't have John because we removed the first element here. But you know what? For simplicity purposes, let's comment out all of these other lines just so we can work with the initial array. Let's see what happens. As you can see, we have John, which is here, Bob, which is also here, and then before David, so before the second index, because this is zero, one, two, before the second index, we delete zero elements, so we delete none, and then we add in the middle of the array, Jenny and Johnny, as you can see right there. We have John, Bob, Jenny, and Johnny, and then we continue with our array, David and Mark. Great. For example, we could also put two here to delete two elements. In this case, we would have John, Bob, and then we have Jenny and Johnny, but we deleted the last two in the original array. A splice is quite powerful, but you need to understand how to use it. Most often, you'll use it just to add elements in the array. So this is how it's gonna look. You can also use it only to delete some elements. So for example, if I do start at position two, remove two elements, and then don't add any, it's also gonna remove them. Take a look. Now we start at two, so they're gonna be zero, one, and then it removes two. That's gonna be David and Mark. That's it. It is a bit harder, but once you understand how to use it, it's gonna be quite useful. Again, in real life, you use to remove some values or to remove and add, 
but also just to add certain values inside of the array, not at the start or at the beginning. Great, that's it. And then finally, we have the array.slice. This handy little piece of code can make a new variable that contains every element in the previous array. For example, in here, we have uh, names array. And then let's create a new array. Const no one likes John, just like this. And now in here, we want to have all the elements in this array, in the names array, but only without John. How would we do it? Well, of course, you could copy the whole array manually, paste it here, and then remove the John. That's, that's fine, but if you have an array with 200, 500, 1000, or 10,000 elements, you don't wanna do that by hand. You wanna use handy array methods. We're going to do it using slice. The only thing you have to do is use names.slice and then specify the start from where you want to keep copying it. We say one because you start from here and we're gonna take everything else other than the zero value. Now let's take a look at the newly created array. No one likes John. As you can see, we get Bob, David, and Mark. You can see array slice is pretty useful if you want to create a new array, but only copy some parts of the previous array into it. Starting with this index, we can also specify the last index. So that would be ending at three, that would be zero, one, two, three, that would be still the same thing. But if we set two, that would only take the Bob and David. So we can say no one likes John and Mark, that's a lengthy name, but now you can see we get only Bob, but if we extend it to three, that's gonna be Bob and David. So from first one to the third one, great. This is how array slice works. I'm gonna bring this back to what we had, just for simplicity purposes, and comment this out. Now we forgot to add comments for array splice and array slice. Why am I adding them? Well, because I'm going to give you this little file so you can play with it, test it out, and see how it works. We're gonna use it as a reference to future videos. So what does array splice do? It adds new values in the middle, or let's say in any position of an array. So it basically adds values not only to the start or to the end, but you can add them in any position of the array and you can even delete. So it adds or removes, it adds or removes values in any position or let's say from any position of an array. And then array.slice copies certain parts of an array into a newly created array. That's it. Now you know what each one of these basic array methods does. You can use them, you can play with them, test it out. And in next videos, so every next video in this section is gonna be in detail about more complex array methods. So we're going to have one video for array.map, array.foreach, filter, reduce, join, basically every array method out there. And these are gonna be more complex. So that's why we're gonna explore them in more detail in separate videos. See you in the next one. In this video, we're going to explore array.foreach in great detail. Array.foreach is without any doubt the most used array method out there. The only thing that can be compared to it is array map, which we're going to explore in the next video. If you understand how map and for each work, you're going to have an easy time understanding all other array methods because they're all based on that iteration or looping through the array. The for each method performs an action for each element in the array. Of course, for that we could use the standard for loop we learned about, but I will explain soon where and why to use the for each. I'm going to type it in here, array for each. Great, so let's first create a demo array. Let's call it const names is equal to, let's do John, let's do Jenny, and uh, Johnny, as we always do. Great. Okay, now, of course, what we could do is we could use that for loop we learned about. So for let i is equal to zero, while i is lower than names.length, and then i++. While we are here, let's console log something, and we want to console log the index as well as the specific name. If we do this, let's see what the output will be. 
As you can see, we get zero John, one Jenny, two Johnny. That's great. In this case, we have to declare and initialize another variable, that i thing here. And then the loop compares it every time with the array that length. If the expression evaluates to true, only then the loop executes. After the loop body is executed, the value of i is incremented by one. We can eliminate this process using array that for each method. That's the main part to eliminate this process of creating that external variable and then incrementing it. So what is the syntax of the array for each? It works like this. As with any other array method, you first specify the name of the array and then you call the for each on it. For each method accepts a callback function. So I'm gonna write it right there, a callback function with opening braces. And then it accepts two parameters. First one is going to be the value. And then the second one is going to be the index or we can just call it i for short. So to repeat, the first argument of the for each method is the function that you want to execute for each element of the loop. This callback function has two most important arguments. The first argument is the value of the current element the loop is on. The second argument is the index of the current value. And then the third one is the whole array itself, but you don't need to use that often. So we're gonna skip that part here. We can perform the same action using for each in this manner. We have the names here. And then what we have to do is call names that for each. Now with parameters, we can name them however we want. So this is the case. Whenever you have an array here, we said array name is gonna be plural. Names, people, users, anything ending with an S. So in this case, we're going to have a singular value of that names array. In this case, it's gonna be called name. But again, this doesn't matter. This is just a parameter name. You can name it A as well. But the good practice is to use the singular name of this plural array name. And then in there, we're going to console log the name and the index, just like that. If we save it, you can see we get exactly the same thing, but in an easier way. You can see how simple this looks compared to that for loop that we had. No external variables that we have to work with, we have to increment, we have to use. No longer we have to use names and then i. That is not needed. Now we immediately get the value in this singular name here. No more names i, just the name. A bit simpler, great. This is not so often used scenario, but I just wanna point your attention to it. We can create a specific function we want to run on each iteration. So we can say const, and let's say log the name. That's gonna be an error function, which is going to receive the same parameters, the name and the i, and then in there, we can use that console log. What we can do now is we can get rid of this whole function in here, and we can just say log the name. We're basically doing absolutely the same thing, but we extracted that function above. You can see if I only take the value of that function, I can bring it back in here, and that's the same thing. This syntax here is what you're going to see most often, so we're gonna stick with that. One-liner arrow functions using array methods. Now, another important thing when it comes to for each is its return value. We want to know what is the return value of the for each method. Well, let's take a look. If I do const value is equal to names that for each, what is that value gonna be? As you can see, it is undefined. And it's not only because we have the console lock here. Even if we try to return the name, it's still going to be undefined. For each method, always, and I want to really point your attention to it, for each method always returns undefined values, which means it, you do something with the array, you console log something, and that's it. You can never get a return value out of a for each. For that reason, typically you never have a return value here. You just use the for each to either console log something or change something or sum something up or do something where you don't need that array back. You might be confused a bit, which is fully okay. That's why let's repeat everything and let's have some important remarks on the use of this method. How to use it, when to use it, when not to use it. So we're gonna say here, use when. Use when you want to do something with each element of the array. And then don't use when 
you want to stop or break the loop when some condition is true. What does this mean? For example, you want to console log the elements of names array, but break the loop if the value of the current element is, for example, Jenny. To do that, you will have to use the basic for method. You cannot use for each if you want to break the loop of the array. And also don't use when you're working with asynchronous code. We haven't yet talked about asynchronous code. We're going to talk about that at the end of the course. But the important part is that you, you cannot use any promises, dense, async await inside of the for each loop. For that, you have to use the normal for. So what could be some real use case scenario for the array for each? Let's say we simply want to sum some numbers up. Let sum is equal to zero. Then let's say that we have some numbers, an array of numbers. It's going to be, let's do 65, 44, 12, and four. Now you want to call the for each method on the numbers array. Of course, we want to pass it a callback function. Great. In there, you have a number because we said this is going to be numbers, my bad. So we are looping over the numbers array. And for each iteration, we get a different number. So first it's going to be 65, 44, 12, and then four. And what we want to do is want to increment the sum. So sum is plus equal to the number for each iteration. And then finally, we want to console log the sum. As you can see, we get 125 without the need to use the normal for loop. This is quite simple, straightforward, and that's it. Later on, you'll see that we can also do this even more efficiently using the array reduce method for this particular example. That's it for the array for each. And in the next video, we're going to talk about the array map. They behave extremely similarly, but map has a return value. In this video, we're going to talk about array map. Since we already discussed the array for each, and we also said that for each is really similar to the array map, let's explore the differences first. Difference between the array map and array for each is that the map method allocates memory in order to store and return values, while the for each method does not allocate memory, so it doesn't store any returned values. In the last lecture, we saw that the array for each method has a return value of undefined. The for each method also allows for a callback function that will allow you to change the original array, while the map method will instead return a new array while leaving the original one in its original state. Let's explore map in an interesting example. In here, I'm going to create a new array, and this one we're going to call it inventory. Inventory is going to be an array, of course. And then this time it's going to be a bit more complex. It's not going to be just an inventory of numbers or strings. We're going to have an inventory of objects. So I'm going to span this array into multiple lines. And then in the first line, we're going to create an object. We're going to set the price to be five and then the name to be eggs. So this is one item in the inventory. Then we can also add the second one. Price is going to be four, let's say, and the name is going to be ham. So we have eggs and ham. Then the third one is going to be price is going to be three and name can be mayo. So we need some mayonnaise as well. And then finally, we have one more for a good sandwich. We need bread. So we also have bread here. Let's see if we have some errors. We do. We are missing a column right there. And this is our inventory. So what are we going to do with this inventory using the map? Well, first of all, we can create a new array. We said that the map method returns something from the original array. So if we were to do something like this, const prices. So we only want to get the array of all the prices of the items in the inventory. In that case, we would do const prices and we can do inventory dot map. Now it's the same thing. We have a callback function right there as in the for each. And now remember, what did I tell you? When we have the inventory, then in here we put a singular version of that thing. Inventory kinda is plural, so we're gonna put the item right there. Inventory and then one item in the inventory. Of course, the item is changing for each iteration. 
So for the first iteration, it's going to be this object here, then this, this, and this. Great. So now I don't want to return the whole item because that's an object including the price and the name. But what I want to do is return item.price. That's the only thing I want to return. Now our map function maps over all of the items and then for each one it just returns the price and then immediately adds it to the prices array. How can we see what prices are? Well, we are going to do a simple console.log where we're going to console log the prices. As you can see, we get 5, 4, 3, 5, which means we extracted only the prices. Now, let's try doing the same thing for names. So I'm going to say const items is going to be equal to inventory dot map. We still have the item. And then in this case, we want to return the item dot name because we want to form a new array, including only the names of the items. So in this case, we're looping over the inventory and we only want to create a new array, including the names, not including the prices. Now, if you console log that, you can see you get eggs, ham, may, and bread. Each is a string in this items array. That's how map works. The only takeaway is that map works in the same way as the for each does, meaning it loops through the array and does something, whatever you want it to do for each element, but map has a return value and therefore we can create a new array with the things we just returned. Great. In the last few videos, we explored array.foreach, array.map, array.sum, and array.every. Now is the turn for array filter. Filter method does exactly what its name says. It filters an array. More specifically, it filters certain elements from an array. And I'm a strong believer that it's easier to learn on an example. So let's immediately dive into code. In here, I'm going to create an array called numbers. Const numbers is going to be equal to an array that's going to have both positive and negative numbers. For example, minus 10, 0, minus 2, 15, minus 36, and let's do 25. Great, this is our array of numbers. Now, what if we only want the positive numbers in the numbers array? Well, we can use the filter method that comes with arrays. To do that, we can do numbers, dot filter, so we're calling the dot filter method on it, that is a method, so we call it as a function. And then, as with all other methods we learned so far, it accepts a callback function, just like this. Inside of the callback function, the first parameter is going to be one iteration of the loop. As we discussed previously, the best naming convention is that whenever you have an array, use a plural name, and then in here, use the same name, but in singular form. So in here, we're going to do number. Now, the question is, what do we want to do with that number? Well, we only want to return the number. So I'm going to expand this, we want to return only the numbers where the number is greater than or equal to zero. So these would be our positive numbers. Great. Now if we do that, and if we console log this array, let's see what do we get back. As you can see, we still get our original array back, nothing changed. Why that might be the case? Well, filter method is a good method. It is a non mutative method. More specifically, that means that it doesn't change the original array. And that is good. We don't want to mutate the original array. What filter does, like map, is that it returns the new array. So in here, we need to create a new array, and we can call it positive numbers. And then we set that equal to be this numbers that filter. Now, if we console log positive numbers, and we save that, as you can see, we get array of only positive numbers, it was that simple. So to repeat, filter method goes through every single element in the array. And then below, you can specify what you want to return. In this case, we only want to return the numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. Now, if you're already used to arrow functions, what you can do is immediately get rid of this return and just put that in here. So we can immediately have it in one line because as you know, arrow without any curly braces, that's an immediate return. Great. If we save that, you can see we get the filtered array one more time. 
With one change, we could easily switch this to lower than or equal to zero, and then we get all negative numbers, including the zero. Just to go a step further, I want to show you how we would do this with a normal for loop. So in here, you, we can create a for loop. We're gonna have an index that starts at zero and moves until the numbers dot length. Great, and then we increment the i. Now in here, basically what a filter is, is simply a loop that has an if statement. And inside of this if statement, we can check if numbers i, that numbers i is more specifically this thing here, the number for each iteration, and if it is larger than or equal to zero. If it is, then we can create a new array called positive numbers one, and this here should have been positive numbers, plural, my bad there, and that's going to be set to an empty array. Then in here, we can use positive numbers and then push to it. And what are we gonna push? Well, the numbers i, great. And finally, then we can console log positive numbers after all the numbers have been pushed. Let's see if it works. As you can see, it works. But if I remove console logs, take a look at this. This here is the code for doing it using normal for loop. We have one, two, three, four, five, six lines and a lot of complexities in here. Take a look how line three is simple, concise, and straightforward. That's the power of the filter method. Now, allow me to provide you with a more real life example of a filter method. We're going to get rid of this code and then in here, I'm going to create a new variable. That variable is going to be called employees data and it is going to be equal to an array. Inside of that array, we're going to have multiple objects. So I'm going to span it across multiple lines and our first object is going to have a name of, let's do Sebastian. Great. And also Sebastian is going to have an overtime of five hours. Then let's create a new one. In here, let's do Cardi, Cardi V. And in here, she's going to have an overtime of 10 hours. And then finally, let's do something like George, George Lopez, great. And he's going to have an overtime of 12 hours. Now, let's say that we want to reward employees with seven or more hours of overtime. How would we do that? First of all, we have to add commas here and we have our employees data. Well, now we have to filter out the array to find only the employees with overtime of more than seven hours. Great. To do that, of course, we are going to use the filter method. So in here, I'm going to create a new array called employees to reward, just like that. And that's going to be equal to employees data dot filter. And then in here, we're going to get that singular employee. Great. Now we have to either return it or not return it. And now we're going to check if employee dot overtime is greater than or equal to seven. If it is, we're going to return true. Why are we returning true? Well, if the true is being returned from the callback function of the filter, that means that it's going to keep that specific employee or the employee for that specific iteration. So if the employee has the overtime greater than seven, we're going to keep him or add him in the employees to reward. Let's see what is the output of this by doing a console.log and then in here, we're going to put employees to reward. As I do that, we get an array with two objects in there where the first one is Cardi V and the second one is George Lopez. Great. Now I'm going to show you how to simplify this even further. Try remembering one of the initial lessons in this course. It was about comparison operators. My question for you is, what is the output of this comparison right there? Or as a matter of fact, what is the output of all comparisons? If we do this, what do you think we're going to see? I'm gonna remove this console log and save the file. As you can see, we get false and true. All of these are Booleans, great. And since filter works in a way that if we return true, then that must mean that we're gonna keep it. And if it returns false, we're not gonna keep it. So what we can do is just 
literally return this. If you return only that, the output of this is going to be a Boolean. So there is no need to actually have an if statement there. That's the difference between normal for loops and then adding an if statement there and just using a filter. And as you know, since we are using an arrow function, we can immediately bring this right here by removing the curly brace. And that's going to look something like this. Great, that's it. Now if we go back and if we console log that, let's see what is the output. As you can see, the output is completely the same, but we made it so much simpler. With all of these array methods that use arrow functions like for each, filter, map, you're often going to have an arrow function with an immediate return. Great. Now I have one small task for you. What would you do if I asked you to put only the names of rewarded employees in here, not the full objects? So right now we're getting the full object with the name and the overtime. What I want would be the output that looks like this. So, just the names. What do you think? How could we achieve this output? To do that, I'm going to create a new array called const employees names or employee names. And then right there, we're going to loop over this newly created array, employees to reward, and then we're gonna map over it. In here, we of course get the employee. And then for each employee, what we're going to do is simply return employee dot name. That's it. Now I'm going to console log employee names. And these are the employee names that we want to reward. And that's it. And that's it. As you can see, now we are rewarding Cardi V and George Lopez. We could go even one step forward and provide a personalized message for each employee that received the reward. For that, we would use array for each. So instead of this console log, we could do something like this employee names dot for each in here we have the name and that needs to be in parentheses because that's a callback function for each name we want to console log and then let's use a template string and then in here we're going to have name received a reward that's it now, if we save that, you can see on separate lines, Cardi V received a reward and George Lopez received a reward. We just mixed three different array methods we learned on a, let's say, kind of real life example. And that's going to be it for this video. We not only learned how the filter works, we tested it on two different examples and also remembered how map and for each work. Great job. Moving forward, our next array method is called array find. And find does exactly what its name says. It finds an element in the array that matches a certain condition. More specifically, the find methods for arrays returns the first value that satisfies the condition. It's really similar to, for example, array filter. In there, we also had a condition and that condition filtered out some of the elements. It's also similar to array sum or array every. In there, we also had the condition that did something to an array. In this case, our condition is going to match and it's going to return the first element that matches that specific condition. No more talk, let's see it in an example. Let's test the array find method on a numbers array. In there, I'm going to create the numbers array and then inside of there, we're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Let's create that array right there. And you know how it goes. We specify the array and then in here, we call that method. In this case, it's gonna be find. Find also accepts a callback function where in there we get a parameter of number where the number is going to be each element in the array for each iteration. First time number is one, two, three, four, and so on. In here, we can specify our condition, which must evaluate to either a truthy or falsy value. In our case, we want the number to be greater than five. So let's say number is greater than five. Our array.find is going to loop through the array, starting with one. And it's going to say, is one greater than five? The answer is going to be false. Is two greater than five? False. Is three greater than five? False. Five also not greater than five. And finally we have six. 
first time ever in here, we're going to have a true value. And when we have a true, when the array that find returns a true, that means return the element on which iteration it was left off. That means in our case six. So the question is, how can we retrieve that value? And the answer is just add it at the start of this find. So const value is going to be equal to numbers that find. And now we can console log the value and see what did we get. As you can see, we get back six. That's great. Let's practice array.find method on another example. In this case, we are going to have an array of states. So let's do something like this states and let's put some strings in there this time. Strings are going to be first off Alaska. Let's do California, Colorado, and let's do Hawaii. In this case, I would like you to pause this video, think about it for a second, and I want you to find the first state that begins with the letter C. We can do it like this, states.find, in there we get the state, and now we can say state.startsWith. Starts with is a string method we are allowed to use. So we can say starts with C, and that is going to give us the value of the first state that starts with C. So we can say const state is equal to states.find, and finally we can console log the state. As you can see, we get back California. That means that you can mix and match all the different methods that have to do something with strings, arrays, objects. You're allowed to program in any way you want. You're not tied down to using just one method. So try to be as good as you can with as many as you can methods. And that way your daily workflow of working as a programmer is going to be much easier because you won't have to implement logic by yourself. You'll be able to use these built-in methods to help you on your day-to-day -day programming tasks. In this video, we are going to explore another really important array method. It's called array includes. It's really handy that all array method names make sense. So with the find, you can find one element from the array. With push, you can push an element. With map, you can map over the array. With for each, you can do something for each element of the array. With includes, you're simply checking, does this array include some elements? That's it. So in simple words, the array includes checks if an array contains a certain value and returns true or false based on the result. Let's test it out on a few examples. In here, let's create a const called array one. And then in there, it's going to be an array of one, two, and three. That's it. Finally, we can use that includes method to check whether we have a certain number in there. So to do that, we're going to say console log. And instead of that console log, we're going to call this array one and then call the dot includes method on it. Inside of here, you can pass in any element. For example, let's say that we want to see if the array one includes the number two. If we now save this, you can see that that is true. Let's explore it furthermore. If we put three, of course, that's true as well. If we put four, that's false. What do you think would happen if we put a string of three? That's also going to be false. It needs to be a number. We tried it with numbers, but let's try it with words. Let's create an array called pets. And then in there, we can have a cat, we can have a dog, for example, and we can have a llama. Now, we want to know if this array contains a certain element. To do that, again, we can do a console log, and now we can call pets.includes and in there, let's pass something like cat. Does this array contain a string of cat? As you can see, that is true, really straightforward. But if we put, for example, a string of add, that's gonna be false. It contains cat, not at. You can see, as with many other array methods, array that includes is pretty straightforward. But let's test this on a just a bit more complex example. Let's say that we are a librarian looking for a particular book inside of a bookshelf array. For that, we're going to create a array called bookshelf. And then in there, let's put some classics. Let's do mobby vic. 
Let's also do, for example, the Great Gatsby. And let's do Pride and Prejudice. Great, some classics in there. Now, the situation is as follows. A reader comes into a bookstore and asks the librarian if they have a certain book. If bookshelf dot includes and now in here we can pass that specific book the reader is asking for. For example, let's say that he is asking for Moby Vic. Great. And now if that is going to be equal to true, because we know that this bookshelf that includes or includes method in particular returns a Boolean, right? So we can check if this is true, then we want to do something. More specifically, we want to have a console log that's going to say, we have that book. Here you go, just like that. But we're going to also have an else. We are also going to have an else. In this case, the library doesn't possess that book. So we can say console log. And let's do something like cannot find the book. Sorry, just like that. Great. Now, if we run this, what do we get? We have the book. Here you go. That's great. Now, if we try it with something else, for example, with the great Gatsby, that also works great. But now I want to show you something. What if we have this as lowercase? What do you think? If everything is lowercase, is that going to work? The string is really similar, but as you can see, that doesn't work. That means that array includes is case sensitive. The string needs to be exactly the same. It needs to include the same letter casing. And if a reader chooses a book that the library doesn't have, that's going to be Harry Potter, for example. As you can see, cannot find the book, sorry. This is just a really, really simple example, but you can see how using this array methods, we can convey a lot of logic that we can build into a lot of different applications. With all the methods you currently know, you could already build so many amazing applications that you have the ideas for. With that said, I just want to show you one more thing, which is going to be a small improvement to our current implementation of this small application. And that's going to be that we don't need this check if it's equal to true. If I delete this, this would work completely fine. As you can see, Harry Potter, nothing. And then if we put Moby Dick in there, that works. We have that book, here you go. Why don't we need that check to check if this is true? What do you think? Well, if you remember the lecture about truthy and falsy values, then you should know that this if statement has a condition inside of here. JavaScript is always going to try to convert this condition to a truthy or falsy values. But in this case, it doesn't even have to, because as we said, array includes returns either a true Boolean, a true value or a false value. So bookshelf that includes Moby Dick, that's going to be true. We don't need to say if true is equal to true. True is immediately true and that's it. With that said, we can only have this in here and it's going to work perfectly fine. To repeat it one more time, the array includes method checks if an array contains a certain value and returns true or false based on the result. That's it. I hope you learned this method right now with this video and that you're going to be able to use it once you need it. In this video, we're going to cover the array sort. Array sort sorts an array of strings alphabetically. Take for example, this array of names, const names, is equal to Anne, Carl, Bob, and Dean. Just below, let's try to sort it. Names.sort, and we just call it. Finally, we can have a console log below, where we're going to console log those names. If you now save this, you can see we get Anne, Bob, Carl, and Dean, First letter is A, B, C, and D. That's it. So by default on simple examples like these, where you just want to sort a string alphabetically, it is really simple to use it. You just call it and later on you console log the result that you get back. One thing that is really important and that I would like to point your attention to is that in this case, we didn't create a new array. For example, something like sorted names is equal to names that sort. We didn't do that. 
we just call the method and then immediately the original array had changed. That means that the sort method mutates the original array. It's fully okay if that happens, but the only takeaway here is that you need to know that it happens. If you don't know that some methods mutate the original array and some don't, your code is going to be unpredictable and you're going to find yourself in a lot of errors. So it's always good to know which methods change the original array and which don't. For example, as we discussed previously, map method doesn't change the original array. We just store the value of a newly created array. Then we have filter also creates a new array. But in this case, sort mutates the original array. Really, really good to know. Later on, when you have huge files with a lot of variables, arrays, and things moving around, it's going to be extremely important for you to know that this array was changed or hasn't been changed. This is also really important in React because in React, we must never mutate the original state array. With that said, we can move to our second example. Inside of here, we're going to have array of numbers. And let's say that our numbers go as follows. 6, 3, 1, 7, 9, 2. Now, if we call the numbers.sort and finally console log the array, what do you think the output is going to be? If we save that, you can see it's 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 9. Seems ordered, right? And that's great. This would make you assume that the array sort doesn't only sort alphabetically, it also sorts number in ascending order. But this is unfortunately not the case, at least not out of the box. Why? Because if I add in here the value 15, 25, for example, 99 and 44, take a look what happens. As you can see, in this case, we got one, but then the second value is 15 because 15 starts with one, but you know that two is definitely the one that should go after the one, right? Well, JavaScript thinks that since this number starts by one, it also should be just next to this one here. You can see then it's two, 25, three, 44, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 99. Of course, this is not the normal way humans count numbers, right? So how can we make this sort function sort numbers in a real ascending order? Or maybe descending from the largest to the smallest? That's also fine depending on the use case. Well, we can do that. But keep in mind that what comes now is a bit more complicated and you're not obligated to know that. I just want to show you how it works because it's a really often used case scenario. So to do that, in here we have to provide a callback function as you're used to. This time, we're going to have two parameters here, A and B. And now we have to compare these numbers. Basically, returning an instant value of A minus B is going to sort numbers in a specific way. Let's test it out. If I now save this, you can see numbers are sorted in an ascending order. That's it. 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 9, and then 15, 25, 44, 99. The only thing we had to do is pass in this comparator function and then compare A and B. There are a lot of sorting algorithms and I'm honestly not even sure which one JavaScript uses for comparing this simple arrays. But in this case, the only thing you have to know is that if you do A minus B, in that case, that's going to sort numbers in an ascending order. On the other hand, if you do something like this, where we're going to copy this line and now do B minus A, in that case, we are going to get descending order from the largest number to the smallest one. So that's it. These are the two most common use cases of sort. Of course, after the normal alphabetical sort. So we have sort ascending order, sort descending orders. These work for numbers. But then again, if you have strings, you can simply do something like this, where you simply call sort and it's going to sort them in an alphabetical order. And that was it when it comes to array.sort. In this video, we're going to explore two interesting array methods. They are called array sum and also array every. So let's see what they do. First, let's create an array at the top. It's going to be just a general array. So I'm going to call it array. And then inside of there, let's put numbers one, two, three, four, and five, just like that. 
The sum method tests whether at least one element in the array passes a certain test. So what is that test? Well, test is any function that we implement. In this case, let's add a function that's going to test whether a number is greater than three. So I'm going to do const is greater, or let's do greater than three. That's going to be an arrow function, which is going to receive one parameter of number. And what is that function going to return? Well, in there, we're going to check if number is greater than three. That's it. And the result is going to be a Boolean because comparisons return Booleans. Great. So now we have to use that uh, method. And here we're going to say array dot sum. And then in there, we're going to pass that function greater than three. That's it. Now let's console log this whole expression. And let's see what the response is. Okay, if we do that, we get true. Now let's see why that is happening. Well, try reading this in plain English. Array sum greater than three. Are some elements in the array greater than three? Let's see, one, two, three, four is greater than three, and five is greater than three. By default, that means that some are, right? At least one element is greater than three, and that means that our function returns a Boolean true. If we have specified greater than five, so I'm gonna change these values, Currently, we don't have any value that is greater than five, and then this is false. Now, I'm gonna show you a trick. You don't have to declare this function like so. You can immediately use this function right inside of here, and then get rid of this. But let's go step by step. Let me delete this whole thing, and let's go explore this in, in greater detail. So we know that array sum accepts one thing, and what is that? That is a function, right? So in here we write a function. And array sum loops through the array. So it does the same thing that the for loop does. It goes first to the first element, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. So for every iteration, we get that value of a number right there. Or if you want to generalize it, that's gonna be L, shortered for element. Great, and now in here we can provide a check. If element is larger than three. Now to read this in plain English, we say check if some elements pass the provided test, or in this case, check if some elements in the array array are greater than three. And if we console log that, you can see we get true, some elements are greater than three, four, and five. Great, now we're gonna use the same thing in the array that every. The only thing we have to change is from some to every. And now if we console log this, we get false. Why is that? Is every element in the array array passing the provided test? Meaning, is every element larger than three? Well, that's of course false, it is not. We have one, two, and three, which are not greater than three. If we wanted this to pass, then we would have to say like, if is element greater than zero, in that case, all elements are passing the test. So just to repeat, this thing here, array.sum, returns true if at least one element passes the test. And then this thing here, array every, returns true only if all elements pass the test. That's it, simple as that. These are pretty handy and you're gonna find yourself using these array methods quite often. Now let's move to the next array method. Hi, and welcome to another video. In this lecture, we're going to explore the reduce array method. So what is array reduce? Array reduce starts with all the elements from an array. It iterates over them and then computes them to a single value. It's one of the hardest array methods to understand. So let's take it slow with a real life example. Let's say that we have a grocery list with all the grocers we want to buy as well as their prices. That's going to look something like this. Const grocery list is going to be equal to an array. And then in there, let's do something like 29, 12, 45, 35, 87, and let's do 110. This is our grocery list prices. The thing that we want to know is the total price of all the items. This would be a perfect example for the reduce method. Here's a challenge for you. Pause the video and try to solve this using a for each loop. 
The solution would look something like this. We need to create a variable, we can name it total, and we're going to set total to be zero at start. Then we take the grocery list and we call a for each method on it. In there, we get a singular item or the price for that item. And in the callback function, what we need to do is we have to increment the total. So total is going to be equal to total plus the price for each iteration, or simply said total plus equal to price. This is going to increment the price to the total for each iteration. Finally, we can console log the total and see the output. There we go, the output is 318. As you can see, there is a need for an external variable called total that is going to keep track of the total price. It does work, but it's not the best way to do it. Now, let me show you the reduce method, which is going to remove the need for the external variable. We are going to do the same thing, so that's going to be grocery list, but this time we're going to call the reduce method. The reduce method takes in two arguments. The first one is a callback function, as we are already used to. And then the second one is the initial value of something known as an accumulator. In this case, we are going to set it to zero. The callback function of the reduce method also takes in two parameters. The first one is called an accumulator, and the second one is most often called the current value. Accumulator is something that we initialize, and then the callback function is executed many times, In each time the current value will be set to the next element of the array. So in our case, we have to add the current value to the accumulator each time that this method is called. To do that, we can return and then say accumulator plus current value. If we save this, now we can store the output of this into a new variable. So that's going to be the total. Const total is equal to, and then all of this. If you console log the total, if you save it, as you can see, we get 318 without using an external variable. We only have one, which is the total. Now, this is really complex. I think this is the most complex things we've written so far. So what exactly is happening here? Let's take a step back and let's do it on a simpler example. We're going to leave this here for later. This time, we're going to create a numbers array. And just for simplicity purposes, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That's it. The goal is the same. We need the sum of these numbers. To do that, we said that we use the array reduce method. So we can use the reduce. Great. Now, as we just learned, reduce takes in two parameters. The first one is the callback function, and the second one is the initial value. In here, we can set that to zero. Inside of here, we also have two different things. We can name this one accumulator, ACC for short, and we can name this one val, short for value. You can name this anything you want, because as we learned, parameters in functions are just arbitrary names. Now let's expand this and see what is happening if we return the accumulator plus the value. First, we have that accumulator value, and it is going to be equal to zero, because that's what we said in here. Then we also have the current value, which is this val right there, and that is going to be equal to the first element in the first iteration through the loop of the numbers array. So that val is going to be equal to one. Then what we do is we increment the values. So that's going to be zero plus one, and that's finally equal to one. That one is the key thing here. One becomes the next accumulator value. So in the second iteration, the accumulator is going to be equal to one and value is going to be equal to two. As you can see, that's because two is the second value in an array. With incrementing those, we get one plus two, and that is now equal to three, which means our accumulator is now equal to three. I'm gonna put this right there, just so you know that the newly created value becomes the new accumulator. Moving forwards, now our accumulator is equal to three, and our value is also equal to three, because that's the third element in our array. Therefore, we do three plus three, and that is going to be equal to six. That six is our new accumulator. Moving forwards, 
our accumulator is now equal to 6. And then the value is equal to 4, as you can see right here. Therefore, 6 plus 4 are equal to 10. And 10 is our new accumulator. Moving forward for our last iteration, our accumulator is now equal to 10. And our value is equal to 5. Therefore, 10 plus 5 is equal to 15, and that is our new accumulator, but in this case, that's also the final value or our total. So we can say that right here. const sum is equal to, and that sum is going to be the last value that is returned from this function. Now finally, we can console log the sum. And now we know that it should be indeed 15. As you can see, the value is 15. This is how we would naturally sum these numbers up. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15. This is how the reduce method does it. 1 plus 2 is 3, and then 3 plus 3 is 6, 6 plus 4 is 10, and finally 10 plus 5 is 15. And then we get to the final value, which is 15. So whenever you have multiple values and you want to sum them up in a single value, you can use the array.reduce. One final thing we could do is, since this is an instance return, we can immediately put these values right there by removing the curly braces. Then it is all in one line. This is it. This is definitely the hardest array method out there. But it definitely is powerful. Whenever you have an array that you want to sum to a single value, you can definitely use array reduce. It doesn't only have to be numbers or strings. It can be objects or properties of objects. You can sum up anything that you need to put into a single value at the end. Whether it is an object or something else, you can use the array reduce. For the end, I would just like to say that you're not required to use the reduce method. You could also do the same things using, for example, a for each filter or something else, depending on the purpose. But this is definitely going to be the most concise way to do anything that you have to sum down to one final value. And just so I don't forget, we can get back to our first initial example one more time, just so you can see if it makes sense for you right now. If we uncomment this, you can see we get the grocery list, and I hope this approach just makes a bit more sense right now. In our case, we have the grocery list. Let's simplify it just a bit. Let's say that we have items right there. In there, the accumulator is going to be our initial value or the total. So we could even rename it. Let's rename it total. And the current value would be one specific price of the item. In that case, we would do total and then we would keep adding the price to the total. Now, this might have even complicated it even more, but I hope that this video didn't scare you a lot and that you're going to try using the reduce method at least a few times yourself. It is not all that scary once you get used to it. Hi, and welcome to the objects section of this course. Objects are the most important data type and building block for modern JavaScript. Objects are quite different from JavaScript's primitive data types like numbers, strings, and booleans in the sense that while these primitive data types all store a single value, objects can store multiple. Objects in JavaScript can be compared to objects in real life. The concept of objects in JavaScript can be understood with real life tangible objects. In JavaScript, an object is a standalone thing that represents something. Compare it with a cup, for example. A cup is an object with properties. A cup has a handle, a design, weight, a material it is made of. In the same way, JavaScript objects can have properties which define their characteristics. Just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm currently on the number 10 section of the course, Object in Details. In there, I created the basic index.html file and also an empty script file. We connected them and then ran the index.html with live server. Therefore, we can console log things in here. With that said, let's move to objects. So what are objects? Why do we need them? And how can we declare them? In simple words, object is an unordered collection of related data in form of key and value pairs. Let's create a simple object so that we can see everything in action. 
An object can be, for example, a person. So in here, we can say const person and then use curly braces to declare an object. And let's say that the first name of our person is, let's do Tom. Then the last name can be, for example, Tom Cruise, just like that. And finally, let's do age, let's set it to 40, for example. In here, we can see that to create an object, we just need to open a set of curly braces and assign it to a variable. That's the form of an object. Then inside, we have key and value pairs. For instance, first key in the person object is first name corresponding with the value of Tom. Inside of there, we also have a last name and age. And all of these properties are somehow grouped together. Each of these keys is referred to as properties of the object. On the other hand, take a look at something like this. Const first name is going to be equal to Tom. Then we're gonna create another variable, const last name, which is going to be equal to cruise. And then finally, const age, which is going to be equal to 40. Compare the two approaches. Opposed to having something like this, where every value stands for itself, objects allow us to make certain pieces of data related. Also, we mentioned that objects are unordered. What does that mean? The order of properties in an object can change and will not always stay the same as we declared it. But that's fully okay. When we're working with objects, we are not worried about the order. We learned that for that, we use arrays. In our person object, you can see that our first name and last name are strings and age is a number. Values in an object can be of absolutely any type. For example, let's say that our person has a car and then that car can again be an object because there are a lot of properties we want to describe that car with. So let's say that our Tom Cruise drives a car that has a brand of Toyota, which is a string and let's say that it is 2015 Toyota, for example, and that it has a color of red. That's it. That simply means that we can nest objects inside other objects. We can also add variables as values in an object, in a sense that a variable is just a box that holds a value. Because of that, we can do the following. Const first name is equal to, and then in there we can say, Johnny, for example, this time. Now in here in an object, what we can do is we can simply say first name is equal to first name. In this case, we don't have Tom Cruise anymore. Now we have Johnny Cruise because this variable of first name, which is specified in here, just holds the value of a string of Johnny. So it's basically the same thing. We can console log the object so that you can see that in action. If we console log it and save it, you can see first name is Johnny and we also have a car. One thing that we can notice is that the key and value have the same name. If that is the case, JavaScript allows us to write it like this. We can just remove the latter and simply have first name here and it's immediately going to take the value of the first variable with the same name. If we save it, you can see it's Johnny again. In the next video, we're going to learn how we can access certain properties of an object. In this video, we're going to talk about accessing, adding, and updating properties of an object. Let's create our test person object right here. Const person is going to be equal to an object that for now is simply going to have a first name set to, for example, Brad. To access, add, or update a property of an object, we can use something called a dot notation. Dot notation allows us to retrieve some values from an object. For example, if we only want to get the first name of our person, we can do this, console log, and now person dot first name. By using this dot notation, we can access this specific property of this specific object. Now, if I save that, you can see we only get a string of Brad, that's it. In the same fashion, we can also add or overwrite some properties. For example, if we do something like this, person.dog is going to be equal to an object 
and that object is going to have a name of fluffy and an age of two, just like that. Now, if we save this, you can see we're just getting bread, but now let's go back to console logging the entire object and you should be able to see that our dog property was added to our person alongside first name. Let me expand the console just a bit so that you can see that we have first name and we also have dog right there. You could also do something like this, person.age is equal to 25, for example, save that. Now you can see that we have first name, dog, and age. Let's say that you wanted to access only the name of the dog. In that case, you would do person.dog.name, and that's going to give us only Fluffy, as you can see. So you can use that object notation whenever you have an object, and you can just keep diving deeper and deeper with the dot notation to access a specific property. There is also a second way to retrieve properties from an object. It is called square bracket notation. Square bracket notation, like the dot notation, also allows us to access properties of an object. So we can do console log, and then in there, we can specify the name of our object. And now, as the name suggests, we can use the square brackets to access a certain property. Let's say that we want to access the first name. In here, you have to specify the string of the name of that first specific thing, in our case, first name. Now, that's equivalent to just doing this, person dot first name. That's it. If you take a look, we get the same output by using these two different ways of writing syntax. Well, square bracket notation has some additional features. For example, we can access properties dynamically. Let me show you what I mean. For example, let's say that you don't know yet what property they want to access. Let's say that a user on the screen chooses a toggle and then picks a certain property he wants, and then you get that value. We can emulate that by creating a variable called property, and then we're going to set it to something. In this case, we set it ourselves, but imagine that this property is going to dynamically come to you. Now we have this property age set in a specific variable. What you can do now is you can simply say person and then specify the property you want to get like this. Of course, let's add the age there. And now if you take a look, if we save it, we get 25. Whereas if you had the same thing above, if you had this property here, and then you try to using the dot notation for person dot property, that's not going to work. As you can see, you get undefined. Why is that? Well, that is because it's not taking this property as it is, just as age, it's taking the property literally. So what it's doing, it is looking for a property key right there. You can see if I add a property here, it's gonna be test now. You can see we get it in the console. So it cannot dynamically search for some properties, it can only get it literally. On the other hand, with square bracket notation, it's going to interpret it, actually get the value of that string, and then search for that. As you can see, we get 25. It is also used when you have key names that are not usual JavaScript variable names. For example, you're completely allowed to wrap the keys in a string. This is not going to change the output. You can see if I do this, it looks exactly the same. People usually don't do that for single word names because there's no reason to. You can simply do it like this. But if you had a name that contains multiple words, which is usually not a good practice, then you would need to do something like this. This is a key with dashes. As you can see, this is not a valid variable name, but if we wrap it into a string, then it becomes a valid variable name and we can assign it a value. In the same way, you now cannot access the string using a dot notation because it's going to be invalid syntax, where on the other hand, what you can do is go in here and just specify it as a string and now you can actually get that value. Also, if we don't have the dashes, we can also have just the spaces. This is a key with spaces. Same thing happens. If you try doing that with dot notation, it's, it's simply not a valid syntax. Whereas in the second way, we have the string here, so we can put that there and get the value. Don't worry about this. This is not a good practice and is not used a lot. The only thing you have to know is that you can access properties of an object using the dot notation and also the square bracket notation. 
whenever you have simple properties and you don't have to dynamically search for them, and that's going to be in 80 to 90% of the cases, just use the simple straightforward dot notation. But whenever you have to access a property like this dynamically, then you can use the square brackets notation because with this, we can actually interpret variables and get what the value is behind them and then search for that value. That was it for accessing, adding, and updating properties of an object. In the next video, we're going to learn how you can add not only properties to your objects, but how you can create your own methods and then assign them to your objects. Stay tuned. In this video, we're going to talk about object methods, more specifically, the ones that we create ourselves. A method is a function associated with an object, or simply put, a method is a property of an object that is a function. Methods are defined the way normal functions are defined, except that they have to be assigned as the property of an object. For example, let's say that we have an object called const my obj, and that's going to be equal to this. And now in here, of course, we can have key and value pairs, right? We learned that, but we can also have methods. And method is simply said, another property of an object that is a function. So in here, let's name our method my method, just like that. Now, that is going to be equal to a function. That's it. This is our function. We already learned about functions. We learned how they worked. We learned that they have parameters and that there is a block of code that something is going to happen. We can also declare a method using a normal function. So that's going to look like this, my method one, and that's going to be equal to a function, and then we have a block of code as we learned. So this is using arrow functions, and then this is using normal functions. And then finally, the third way of actually declaring functions or methods inside of an object is doing it like this, my method, and let's call it three, and then simply just have it in there. It's laying in the object, it belongs to it, that's it. You don't need to have the key and the value, you simply put it right there. Personally, I believe that error functions are the best way to do it. They are newest and most often if you're working with normal functions, you're going to use error functions. So why not use them here? Now, how do we actually call or execute this function? Well, let's make something that makes sense. Let's create an object that's going to be called a dog. That dog is going to have a name. Let's use our old fluffy example. So this is a property. And then that dog is going to have a function or more specifically a method. And that method is going to be called bark. In there, we're simply going to console log something. And that something is going to be woof, woof, just like that. Now, how do we actually call this function or a method right here? What you have to do is you first have to access that property. And we already know if you have an object, you access properties by using the dot notation. So that's going to be dog dot bark. And now this here is a function, right? We already know how to call functions. You simply call it by using the set of opening and then closing parentheses. That's it. If we now call it, you can see in the console, we get woof woof. You can also do something like this. Let's say that we have a dog and that he has also an age of two. Now, let's say that you want to console log all the properties of an object. Of course, you could do that. You could do something like this, console log and then have dog.name. And then also in the new row, you can have dog.age. Of course, if we now save this, you can see we get fluffly, <laughs> that should be fluffy, and then we have two. Great, this works. But let's say that you want to create one method that's going to tell you about all the properties of a single object. We can do that. And we can do it like this. In this case, we're going to have to use the, this JavaScript keyword, this one. We're going to learn more about this in one of the next sections. But for now, let me just show you how it works. This keyword refers to this object right there. Therefore, we can use the name and the age. How does that work? Well, first of all, we said that we cannot use this keyword inside of arrow functions. So in this case, and only in this case, if you need to use the this, we need to use the normal function. So I'm going to create that right here. Great. Now, what you can do is in here, you can immediately console log all the properties by using this keyword. So that's going to be this, that name, and also this, that age. We don't have to refer to the dog because we are already inside of that object. And by using the, this keyword, 
that exactly points to the dog and then all the properties. Now, if I just call this function now, let's rename it to list all properties. If we remove these and simply call dog that list all properties, as you can see, we get fluffy and two, that works. That means that you can use the this keyword, which we're gonna learn more about in the next section like this. But this is not something you're gonna use a lot. Most often, you're simply going to have properties, key and value pairs. You'll be able to use the dot notation and square brackets notation to actually access and work on the properties of that object. In this video, we're going to go over all important built-in object methods. With each method, I'm going to give you a useful example of use. So, we already mentioned, objects in JavaScript are collections of key value pairs, and we can have properties and methods in there. But did you know that all objects in JavaScript descend from the parent object constructor. And that object constructor has many built-in methods we can use and access to make working with individual objects straightforward. That object constructor, and like any constructor, starts with a capital letter O. In this case, this is our object constructor. With arrays, we had a lot of methods we could use. With objects, that's not going to be the case. We only have a few. Unlike array methods, such as, for example, sort, reverse, map, or any other, they are used on array instance. That means that we actually have to create an array like this. Const arr is equal to array, and now we can actually use the push method or any other method. Object methods are used directly on the object constructor and use the object instance as parameter. This is also known as a static method. So in this video, we're going to go over most important static object methods. First one is object.keys. Object.keys creates an array containing the keys of an object. For example, let's say that you have an object that looks like this. You have all the employees. It has boss is Michael, secretary Pam, sales is Jim, and accountant is Oscar. So now, let's say that you only want to find out about all different positions that the company has, like boss, secretary, sales, and accountant. You're not concerned with who is working in a specific position. In that case, you can use object.keys. Let's see how. We can say const, and let's name it positions. Positions can be equal to object.keys. That is the new method we are learning, and then in there, you have to provide that specific object, in our case, employees. Now, if we console log positions, let's see what we get. You can see we get back an array that contains all these positions nicely sorted in an array. We have boss, secretary, sales, and accountant. For that, we use object.keys. That means that basically, object.keys transformed all the keys of an object and put them in the array. Now, let's move to the second one in our list, and that is object.values. Object.values creates an array containing the values of an object. So, so far, we've been getting the keys. In this case, we're getting the values. So, let's say that we have an object that looks like this. We have a session. Most likely, someone logged in on some web page, and then we get all of these information. So, we get an ID of one, time, device, and browser. Now, let's say that we are not concerned with these. We don't, we don't need to know the ID, time, device, browser. We only need the values for these. So now we can use object.values. For that, we can say const values, or let's say session information or session info. And now we can make that equal to object.values. As the situation was with the last one, in that object values, we have to pass that original object. Now, let's console log that session info. If we do that, you can see we get back an array with all these values. So when to use this? Well, there is no specific situation. There will be some cases where you're giving the object, but you only need to get the keys or only get the values. In that case, use either one of these methods, values for the values, and then object.keys for keys. But there is also going to be a situation where you need to get both keys and values from an object, but in two separate arrays. In that case, we can use object entries. 
object entries creates a nested array of key value pairs of an object. So let's see how that looks like. Let's say that we have an object that's going to be called operating system. It's going to have a name, version, and a license. Now, what can we do with that object using the entries? That's gonna be const entries is equal to object.entries, and then in there, as we always do, we pass in that operating system right there. More specifically, that specific object we want to work with. Now, let's console log the entries and see what we are working with. If we do that, it's going to look weird at first, so let's expand it. We have one array that contains three different arrays. And what do these arrays contain? Well, each one has a key and a value stored in a new array. So we have name and Ubuntu stored in one array, version and then the version stored in the other one, and then the license and open source stored in the third one. Basically, each key and value pair gets stored in a new array. Now that we have these key and value pairs, we can loop through them using the for each and then get the value. If we do this using just the basic for each where we get the entry of that specific array, the first thing in a nested array is going to be the key and the second thing in the nested array is going to be the value. We simply console log them and then you get something like this. You can see it looks like an object. Next one on our list is object.freeze. Object that freeze prevents modification to properties and values of an object and prevents properties from being added or removed from an object. Let's take this situation for example. We have a const user object. Let's take this situation for example. We have an object called user that has the username and password. Now, we never want to change that username. It's always going to stay like that. That's our admin user. So how can we freeze this object? How can we make it not change? Well, we can create a new variable called frozen user. Or you don't have to use this. You can use literally anything. In this case, maybe using the admin would be right. And then in there, you can use that object dot freeze. And you simply pass in there the object you want to freeze. In this case, our user object. Now, if you do that, and then you try changing something like admin dot password, to let's say one to three, one to three, one to three, and then admin that username to simply test. Now you try changing that admin and see if that's gonna work. As you can see, properties remain the same. That means that no one can change the admin. In the example above, we try to override it with test and then triple one to three, but all properties remain the same. Finally, we have a method that is extremely similar to object.freeze. If you only want to prevent new properties from being added to an object, but you want to allow modifications of existing properties, then you can use object.seal. Let's use the same example. Let's say that we have our user, which has the username of John, password of 123123, and then we simply want to seal it. So that's gonna be const new user, for example, is equal to object.seal. In there, we pass in our original object, which is the user, and now let's try changing some of the properties. For example, new user, that, password, and let's do test123. But now, let's also try adding a new property. For example, new user, that active is going to be equal to true. We are adding a new property. Now, if we console log the new user, Let's see what's gonna happen. You can see, definitely, the password changed from one to three, one to three, to test one to three, but the new active property wasn't added, and that happened because the object was sealed. In conclusion, objects have many useful methods to help us modify, protect, and iterate through them. In this video, we'll learn how to take the keys and or values of an object, and finally, freeze and seal an object. Of course, array methods are much more used. If you're still a bit confused and don't know when to use these methods you just saw for objects, that's completely normal. C to be completely honest with you, they are not used all that much in real world. On the other hand, array methods are used always. So if you don't understand these fully or if you have a hard time remembering them, that's fully okay. 
I would just say be good with array methods. That's going to help you a lot more. With objects, the only thing you really have to know is how to access and change properties using the dot notation and the square brackets notation. Hello everyone and welcome to another section of the course. In this section, we're going to talk about value versus reference, a topic that's quite hard for many developers. It's the first topic or at least one of the first topics we're going to be like, this shouldn't be true. Why is this the case? Why is JavaScript doing it this way? So in this section, we're going to make sure to learn value versus reference so that your code is predictable and it doesn't have any errors that value versus reference problems could cause. With that said, as always, we're going to create an index.html file and also a script.js file. I'm gonna copy the contents of the index.html file from any of our other sections and we're gonna paste it right here. With that said, we can now open our script, right click the index.html to open with live server. After that, a new empty document is going to be opened and then you can click inspect. Inside of here, you can click on these three dots and open the doc in a new window. After you open it, we're going to put it side by side by our Visual Studio code. We can start learning value versus reference. So far in this course, we already talked about different data types. More specifically, two big categories of data types. We have primitive values, in here these are numbers, strings, booleans, also nulls, undefined, and so on. And complex values are only objects, but arrays are also objects, so they are listed in here as well. So the problem or the concept of value versus reference comes once we try copying values. So let's see how we can copy primitive values. For example, if I create a variable called let x is going to be equal to one. And then if I do let y is going to be equal to x. In here, of course, we are setting the x to be equal to one, right? Then I'm going to change the variable x to be equal to two. Now we know that x should be two, right? And then I just want to console log both x and y, just so we can see what's happening. Okay, if I now save that, on the left side, you should see that we have two and one, exactly as we anticipated. Let's try a one more example with strings. So in here, I'm gonna say let first person is going to be equal to Mark. And then let's do let second person is going to be equal to first person. Now, if we change the first person to be equal to, for example, Austin, and console log both the first person and the second person, what do you think the output is going to be? Before saving it, let's try to see it. Well, first we set the first person to be Mark, but then we change it to Austin, right? So then this is going to be Austin. And in here, we immediately set the second person to be equal to first person while it was Mark. So second person should be Mark right here. Now, if we save that, you can see we get Austin and Mark. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, let's move to copying complex values. When copying complex values, JavaScript engine is not going to behave as you would initially think it would. Let me give you an example. Let's create an animals array. And in there, we can do something like dogs and cats. Now we're going to create a new variable called other animals. And then in there, we're going to just copy the animals array. So currently animals array is dogs and cats. We can put that here. And also this thing is dogs and cats as well, right? Now I'm going to call our initial animals array and then we're gonna use the push method we learned previously in the course. And we're gonna push one more animal in there. That animal can be llamas, for example. Now we're gonna console log animals and we are also going to console log other animals. Okay, let's save it. Okay, let's think about it. So in here we had animals. Okay, then we copied it to other animals. And now we are only changing the original animals where we are pushing the llamas. So now the animals should be equal to this thing plus the llamas at the end, right? So to put it just right there, 
animals is going to be equal to this, and then other animals should be equal to this, right? Well, let's save it and find out. And as you can see, we didn't think correctly. Both of the arrays are the same, although we anticipated that the second array is not going to have llamas. So wait, what? What happened here? Why are both arrays the same if we only push the value to the first array? Something just doesn't feel right, right? Let's try something similar with objects to see whether this behavior continues. I'm going to comment out this example and then let's do something with objects. Const person is going to be a person which is going to have a first name property of John and also a last name property of Snow. Now we're going to create another person, so const other person, and we're going to set it to be equal to the person. So now we know that this one is John Snow, this one is John Snow as well. Just so we can see everything more clearly, let's put this into one line like this. Great. Now we have it in one line and we have this right here. So now if I access the first person and more specifically person that first name and I set it to be equal to Johnny like this, Johnny Snow. And then I console log the person, but I also console log the other person like this. Again, what do you think the output is going to be? If we save it, you can see again, both the person and the other person changed, although we only changed the first name of the first person. So again, this doesn't look right. In the next lecture, we're going to explain why does this happen? It's going to make perfect sense. So continuing on from our last lecture, what the hell happened here? Well, when a variable is assigned a primitive value, it just copies that value. We saw that with number and strings example. On the other hand, when a variable is assigned a non-primitive value, such as an object, an array, or a function, it is given a reference to that object's location in memory. What do I mean by that? Well, if we collapse this a bit, so this is how JavaScript looks at it. As soon as we create an object or an array, JavaScript gives it a certain key or a location in the memory. These are just random numbers and letters right now, but you can think this of a location in the memory. When we reference to an object like we did in here, we set other person to be person, we didn't copy these values literally. What we did is just pointed to the same location in the memory. When a reference type value is copied to another variable like other person in this example, the object is copied by reference instead of value. In simple terms, person and other person don't have their own copy of the value. They point to the absolutely same location in the memory. I'm going to write that right here. Person and other person point to the same location in the memory. And this same here, same location is really important. They are absolutely the same object. That means that once we change one, the other one is also going to change. In our case, when a new item is pushed to the person, the array in the memory is modified, and as a result, the variable other person also reflects that change. We are never actually making a copy of a person object. We're just making a variable that points to the same location in memory. We're going to comment this out and just below, I'm going to write something really similar. Const person is going to have a name of John. And then below, I'm going to create another object, other person, but this time I'm going to literally type in the value right there. And it's also going to have the name of John. These two are identical. Now, if I do something like this, where I try to console log the equality of these two values, so person and then other person. What do you think? Are person and other person equal? Well, they should be, right? They look exactly the same. They have the same keys and values. Let's check it out. As you can see, we got false. You might expect that person triple equal to other person resolve to true, but that isn't the case. The reason behind that is that although person and other person contained identical objects, they still point to two distinct objects stored in different locations in memory. 
take a look at this. In here, I mocked that memory location key. In this case, we would have something that looks like this. This one would be 123 ASD, but the second one is completely different. So this one could be 321 and then DSA. These two are completely different because we're creating different objects and different variables containing these objects. That's why they're not the same. Now, let's create a copy of the person object by copying the object itself, rather than creating a completely new instance of it. In here, we can only do person. Now, as we discussed, the point in the memory is going to be completely the same. And what do you think? Are these two equal now? If we save it, you can see that is true. Person and another person hold reference to the same location in memory and therefore are considered equal. Awesome, we just learned that primitive values are copied by value and that objects are copied by reference. In the next lecture, we're going to learn how to make a real copy of an object that will allow us to copy an object and change it without being afraid that we'll change both objects at the same time. We've seen all the problems we could possibly encounter if we tried changing values of an object copied by a reference. So, how can we properly copy it and remove a reference? How can we create a complete clone of an object or an array? Let's first start with cloning arrays. There are a few ways on how we can properly clone an array. The first way is to use something known as a spread operator. Spread operator is a newer addition to JavaScript. Imagine you had an array. Const numbers is going to be equal to an array. In there, we can have one, two, three, four, and five. That's our array. So how could we use the spread operator on this array? Spread syntax allows you to spread the values of strings, objects, and arrays. How does it work? Let's see it in action on our numbers array. The syntax of a spread operator is represented just by three dots. To test it, we can write a console log where we're going to use the spread operator by writing three dots, dot, 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 and now we can use the numbers array. Take a look. In here, we get one, two, three, four, and five, all as separate numbers, not inside of an array. That means that we get back all the values from the array individually, one after the other, they got taken out from the array. So how can we use this? Take a look at this code. I'm going to do a new array called new numbers. And then in there, I'm going to create a completely new array where I'm going to spread the properties of numbers, dot, 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 numbers. Now, if I remove this console log, and if I just console log the new numbers, let's see what we're going to get. As you can see, we got an array back with one, two, three, four, and five. Looks exactly the same as the original numbers array. But what happened here? We get an array that looks identical to the one that we had at the beginning. But is it completely identical? Let's check the equality we're going to create another copy and then compare them. So const copied numbers, and then that's going to be equal to numbers. Remember, that's how we previously did it. We just referenced to the old array. So first of all, let's check the equality of numbers to copy numbers. If you watched the previous video, then you might assume that this is going to be true because these two arrays point to the same location in the memory. For example, one to three, ASD. They are completely the same. They represent the same array. We knew that, but now if we do another console log in there, we're going to try to do the comparison of numbers and new numbers. Just like that. If you now save that, let's see the console log. As you can see, we get back false. So for the first comparison, we got back true and for the second one false. What does this mean? This means that copied numbers array is pointing to the same place in memory where the original numbers array is pointing to. Therefore, if we change one or the other, they would both change and we do not want that. On the other hand, numbers and new numbers are not the same. They represent a completely different array. 
let's try changing the original array. Numbers dot push and let's push in the value of six. Now we're not gonna console log these things. We're gonna have three separate console logs. First, we're gonna console log the original array. Then we're going to console log the copied numbers. And finally, we're going to console log the new numbers. If we save this, take a look. We have three arrays back, numbers and copy numbers both changed, which is not good, but then new numbers remained completely the same, unchanged, because that's how it should be. We never pushed something to new numbers, right? That means that the newly created array, the array created using the spread operator was unchanged. This means that we created something called a shallow clone. The shallow part is going to make more sense once we introduce the deep clones. But this is it. You successfully created a shallow clone of the numbers array. This time, if I just mock this, it has a different reference to the memory. The second method to make a shallow clone is going to be array slice. We already talked about that array method. If you remember what it does, it basically just copies the entire array and allows you to take certain parts of it and put it in a new variable. If you just call slice without any parameters, it's going to take the whole array. So what we can do in here, we can say numbers dot slice, and this is going to be our new numbers. Now we're still doing the same thing, pushing here and cons logging all three things. And let's take a look. If we save it, we get the same output which means that using the array slice, we also got a completely changed array that points to a different location in the memory while these two remain the same. And now we're going to move to the part where we try cloning objects. There are also two good ways of how you can make a shallow clone of an object. And the first way is again using a spread operator. I'm gonna remove this and in this case, let's create a person object. That object is going to have a name of, let's do John, and also it's going to have age of, let's say 20. Great. To create the other person, we're going to declare a variable, other person, and we're going to make it equal to a new object, new empty object. Inside of that object, we're going to spread all the properties of a person object. This means that it's basically going to take everything that's inside, not including the actual location in the memory of the object, and it's simply going to put the values right here. Now, let's try changing the age of the original person. So that's going to be person.age is equal to, for example, 22. Now, if we console log both the person and the other person, you can see that our first object, age to 22, while the second one remained untacked, and that's exactly how it should be. The second way of how we can make a shallow clone of an object is using object that assign. In here, we can keep working on the same example. We have our original person, and to create the second person, we're gonna use the object dot assign. And that takes two properties. First property that it takes is where it's going to store certain values. So it's going to be a new empty object. And what values is it going to store? Well, all the values from the person object. It's basically going to add the properties from the person object to this new object. The premise behind these two ways, both using the spread operator and object assign are completely the same. Create a new object, new location in the memory, take all the properties, and then finally create that new object. Now, if we save this, you can see the situation is the same. In my personal opinion, the spread syntax looks just a bit cleaner, both for objects and the arrays. And this is the way you're gonna see it in the wild once you start creating real projects on your developer job. Awesome, we just learned two different ways for cloning both objects and arrays. As I mentioned, the two ways of cloning we just explored create shallow clones. In the next video, we're going to learn what is the difference between shallow and deep clones and how we can create a deep clone. In this video, we're going to keep adding knowledge to your knowledge base about value versus reference, shallow and deep cloning. To start this video, I would like to take the example we had in the last video and extend it a bit. So in this case, we're going to create a new object, again called person, 
but this time let's add a first name of, for example, Emma. And then Emma is going to have a car. A car needs to have a brand, right? So let's say that Emma is driving a BMW. Then the color of that car is going to be blue. And finally, the number of wheels on all cars is four, but let's also have that in there. Now, let's try creating a copy of that object in one of the ways we've learned in the previous lecture. For example, we can use the spread operator. Const new person is going to be equal to a new object, and then we spread it, dot, 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 person. That's it. We've learned that this removes the reference from the original object, right? So let's try changing the newly created object. For example, new person dot first name is going to be equal to Mia. And this time we expect only the new person to change, not the person. So if we cons log both the person and also the other person or the new person, let's see what the result is. As you can see, the first name is Emma, it remained Emma, and in here we changed it to Mia, and everything worked. As we learned, if we use the spread operator, the reference to the initial object gets deleted. Therefore, we can change the new object without having to worry. Oh, if only it were that simple. <laughs> Let's see what would happen if we try changing the properties of Mia's car. So, in here, if I try doing something like new person, and then dot car, and then dot color to be equal to red. If we add this, just to make this a bit easier to see, I'm going to immediately console log the car for both persons. If we do that, take a look. The color of Emma's car is red, as well as the color of Mia's car. They're both red, although we changed only the color of Mia's car. How did that happen? Well, we only removed the reference from the outer object, this one here, the person one. But notice how car is also an object. It also has its own reference and the same rules apply. If we want to remove, if we want a real copy, we need to remove a reference from the inner object as well. We could do that by spreading the properties of an inner object. In here, we can add a comma and then add a car property. Now that car is going to be equal to a newly created object where we're going to spread dot 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 person dot car. This makes sure that we also remove the reference from this object right here and not only the big one. Now, if we save that, everything should work as we anticipated. This one wasn't changed while this one was changed. So we fixed the issue, that's great. But this only works for two levels of depth. First level is when we are inside of the person object, for example, the first name Emma. And the second level is once we are inside of the car object, so that's these three properties. But if we had more nested objects, we'd need to spread everything, and that's not a solution. When we have deeply nested objects, we need to create a deep clone. For an object to be a deep clone, it needs to destroy all the references. There are two methods that are going to make this extremely easy for us. First one is called json.stringify, and the second one is called json.parse. Now, let's see them in action. We can use the same person object we declared above, but I'm going to remove this thing. First, we're going to use the json.stringify method. The json.stringify method converts a JavaScript object or any value to a string. All the references are destroyed. So we can do something like this. const stringified person is going to be equal to json.stringify. And in there, we can pass the person. Now let's console log the stringified person. If we save this, the thing that we get back is a string. That isn't at all valuable to us, so how can we turn it back to an object again? We can do that by using a JSON parse method. const new person is going to be equal to json.parse, and then in there we can pass in that stringified person, just like so. Now take a look at what we get back. 
This is an object, but an object that is a deep clone of the person object. The JSON parse method parses a string and it constructed the JavaScript value or an object containing the string. Before we start testing it out, there's one simple tweak we can make. We can do this in one line. We don't have to create this external variable called stringified person. We can just take the value of it and then paste it immediately right here. Now what's happening is that we are first stringifying a person and then we are immediately parsing that and then we get a new person. If we save it, you can see we get our object back. Let's prove that all of the references are indeed deleted and that the new person is indeed a deep clone. We can do the same thing with it before. New person dot first name and we can set that to be equal to Mia and also new person dot car dot color to be equal to the color of red. Now, if we console log the new person and also the person, let's see. Okay, in here we have Emma and Emma has a car and the color of the car is blue. So nothing was changed. And in here we have Mia. Mia has a car that has a color of red. That's it. You just mastered one of the hardest topic in the whole of JavaScript. If you're still a bit confused, that's completely normal. I suggest rewatching this section. Take it slow. Mastery takes time. In this section, for the first time ever in this course, we are not only going to work with JavaScript, we are also going to work with HTML. That's for the reason that DOM, the document object model, is the JavaScript standard to access and share documents over the internet. It allows us to modify the web pages HTML. So to start off, I'm going to open a new folder and then in there, I'm going to create an index.html folder. All of this is ordered, but maybe I changed the sections in the course. So DOM is going to be later on. We'll see. The only important thing is that you have the section for the DOM and then in there, you can create an index.html and also a script.js file. Inside of the index.html file, you can type HTML and then scroll down and click HTML5. That's going to generate the basic template. As always, at the end of the body, we can create a script tag with an SRC that's going to point to our script.js. With that said, we can right click index.html and click open with live server. It's going to open an empty HTML document. Right now, what we can do is go back in the code and create an h1 tag. In there, we're going to say hello world. Save that and then you should see hello world should appear on the website. You can right click and click inspect. This is going to be the only section of the course where we are not going to open the terminal in a separate window. Rather, we're going to have it on the side. We need to have it right here because we will be interacting with this DOM tree you can see right here if you head to elements. With that said, let's start explaining what the DOM is. DOM stands for Document Object Model, and it is a standard to access and share documents or websites over the internet. It represents how a particular document is structured. And it also helps programming languages like JavaScript and others to understand and modify the website. You can see we have HTML, we have the head, and then we have the body and a few headings. HTML DOM defines how an HTML page is structured. How can it be modified? How can we modify the properties? How we can add styles? In simple words, HTML DOM is a tree of nested HTML elements that are defined while designing the HTML page. Therefore, we must follow certain rules to actually define the HTML page. DOM is not a language, but more of a standard to represent a document over the web. We won't be focusing on DOM a lot. This course is here to teach you the fundamentals of JavaScript as a programming language. And for a good reason, you don't need to learn DOM in detail. And why is that? Well, as soon as you finish JavaScript, you're going to start writing code in certain framework or a library like React, Angular, Vue, or even back inside with Node. In React, for example, you won't have to directly access the DOM because there is something known as a virtual DOM and a syntax called JSX, which ties down together real HTML and JavaScript without needing you to use the DOM. Great. 
With that said, let's move to the next video where I'm going to show you how you can access elements using the DOM. As we mentioned in the last video, one of the things that we can do with JavaScript is to modify and manipulate existing elements. The first step which we need to do is to identify or you can say select the element. We cannot modify something unless we know what we want to modify. We are here aware that we want to modify the element below an input, so let's see how we can do the same in JavaScript. For now, I will remove these two h1s, create an input, we have to close it, and then just below, I'm going to create an h1 tag, which is going to say test for now. And that h1 of test is going to have an ID property, all lowercase, that's going to say element below input, just like that. Now, if you save that, go back, you can see at the top, we have the input and we have a big heading that says test. There are many ways to select an element. One of the ways is finding an HTML element by an ID. That is the easiest and most efficient way to find an element. We can assign some ID to an element and then select it like so. I'll show you how we can do that right now in the console. We know that our input has an ID of element below input. Great. I'm going to copy that ID. We can create a constant called L and that L is going to be equal to document. Document is the whole HTML website. It contains absolutely everything about our whole HTML page. One of the things we have in there is a method called get element by ID. We can call it as a method and then in there, we can put our element ID in a string. Now I'm going to paste element below input. We click enter. Since that is a method, it's going to return undefined. But now if we try console logging the element, you should see that we indeed get it. And there we go. We got back an element, an H1. As soon as we hover over it, you can see that it actually appears in the browser. It knows that this is that element we are talking about. Now let's explore the second way of targeting the same element. We can do that. We can target the element by tag name. Consider that for some reasons we want to manipulate all elements of a particular kind. Let's say we want to manipulate all headings in our website. So let's add a new one, which is going to say test one. And there we're going to remove the IDs from both of them. We just need a test. Great. We can also remove the input. Now we have two test H1s. Now, if we go back, what we can do is we can target or access the elements by tag name. We can do that like this document dot get elements by tag name. Notice how we have an S here. That means that it is plural. It's going to return an array of all elements. And then in there, it, it's again going to accept a string, but the string this time is going to be the name of the element. If we do it like this, as you can see, we get back an HTML collection which contains two different H1s. Third way of finding HTML elements is finding them by class name. Class names are assigned to elements to style them uniquely. Let's say that we want to style two out of our three H1s. We can have test, test1, and test2. Now we're going to give the same class only to the first two. So class can be something like test, just like that. Now, if we go back, we can access only the elements that have the test class. We can do that like so. Document dot get elements by class name. And then in there, we can pass in that class name. In our case, that's going to be test. If I click enter, you can see we get back an HTML collection that contains only two H1s not the third one because that one doesn't contain the test class. The last way you can find HTML elements is by CSS selectors. CSS selectors combine multiple classes, IDs, tags name, and many more things to actually select a particular element. To explore CSS selectors, I'm also going to give a class of test to our third H1. But now I'm going to change the last two H1s to actually be H2s. So if we go back, you can see that we get smaller text right there. Now our goal is to target only the H2 elements that have the class name of test, but not the H1s that have the class of test. 
that means that we won't be targeting elements by a class of test. Rather, we need to find all the H2s that have a class of test. To do that, we can use the document dot query selector all. And then in there, you can form that CSS selector. Inside of the string, we're going to say h2 and then dot test. This is going to make sure to find only the h2s that have a class name of test. If I now click enter, take a look. We targeted these two exact elements. Now that we mentioned the query selector, I just want to show you how powerful it is. You can use query selector to replace absolutely all other methods you learned so far. The document, get element by ID, get element by class name, tag name, anything. It works like this document dot query selector. There are two different possibilities. You can use the query selector if you want to target only one specific element, or you can use the query selector all to target multiple. So, how can you use it to replace everything else? Well, you know that when we have classes, classes start with a dot. So, you can just immediately target elements by class. There we go, we just targeted them by class. We can also add an ID property and that ID is going to be, for example, heading. We can target the IDs by using the hash symbol and then we can say heading. And as you can see, we immediately got that heading. Or we can also target elements by tag names. So the only thing you have to do is just say H1, which is going to give us the H1. Or we can also say H2 so the bottom two should be H2s. So query selector and query selector all are really versatile and there's no need to not use them. You can use query selectors to replace get element by ID, get element by tag name, class name, anything. Just use query selectors. In this video, we're going to talk about element properties and methods. HTML elements can have different attributes assigned to them, like IDs, classes, or types. There are standard attributes for different elements, and when a browser identifies a standard attribute, a corresponding DOM property is created and assigned to the element. Some attributes are applicable to all elements, while some are applicable only to particular ones only. For example, ID and classes are applicable for all elements, meaning whether you have an input, an H2, a paragraph, you can add the ID or a class. While type property is applicable to input elements and buttons only. If you assign type to a div and try to access it, it will be undefined. So let's explore some of the most important properties and methods of HTML elements. One of the most popular properties is called a class list. Let's try to add a few more classes to our H1. I added ABC and test one. Great, it also has one heading. Now, if we go back to the browser, let's try to access its class list. To do that, I'll try to target that element. So that's going to be document dot query selector. And inside of there, let's try to target it somehow. We can target it by a lot of things. We learned that it, we learned about that in the last video. We can use any of the classes, the ID, the tag name. But in this case, since we have the ID that's specific, we can use the ID. So in here, query selector, and then we can specify our ID by using the hash symbol and then saying the heading. Now we're going to store that in a variable, const element or L for short, and that's it. Now we have access to that element right here. Now let's try to use the class list to get access to all the classes. L dot class list, just like so, capital L. You can run it, and there we go. We get a DOM token list with all the classes that this element has. You can also try to target the class name property to only get a specific string of all the classes that that element has. Now we can also inspect the L.ID, that should work like a charm, we get the ID, and also L.innerHTML, just like so, all HTML needs to be uppercased. If we do that, you can see that inner HTML of our first heading is test. You can access all of these properties of absolutely any element on the website. Now, let's explore some of the most popular methods. 
For example, let's add a button. That button is going to be of a button HTML property and it's going to say something like submit. Great. Now we first have to target that button. So I'm going to say const button is going to be equal to document dot query selector. Now, since we don't have any other buttons on the side, I can simply say a string and we're going to target it by a tag name of button. There we go. If I inspect it, we get back the button as you can see right here on the page. Now, what can we do with that button? Well, first we can use button that add event listener. And that accepts two things. The first thing that it accepts is a type. In our case, since we're using a button, the type is going to be click, click event listener. And then we have to have a callback function on what is going to happen once we click on that button. So in here, I'm going to provide a callback function and let's do something like alert. Alert, you clicked on the button. Great. Now, if I click that, if I press enter and I click on the submit button, there we go. We get you clicked on the button. And anytime that you click it, this alert is going to pop up because with the add event listener method, we added an event that's going to happen on the button click. Let's explore some more properties. Button dot get bounding client rect. If you do this, this returns a function because we are now talking about the methods. So what you need to do is you need to call it as a function or like a method like so by specifying the opening and closing parentheses down here. If we do that, we get a lot of information. We get the height, width, left and top values of an element related to the browser. That's me, that means that the width of the element is 55 pixels, the height is 21, and then all the other properties mean how far or how close is it to a certain position on the screen. You can see it is fully to the left, that means that our left property is zero. Moving further, another method is called has attribute. This method checks if an element has an attribute type or not. For example, our button doesn't have a type of button, so we can check that. We can say button, dot has attribute. And then in there, we can pass in the name of the attribute we are looking for. So we are looking for a type attribute. And the answer is false. We don't have it. Now let's try adding it. So I'm going to go here. And then I'm going to say type is equal to button. Now we have to specify our button element one more time. So you can use the arrow up to scroll through the commands where we selected that button to this one here. And then you can use the arrow up a few more times to get to this button that has attribute. Now, if I save that, you can see we get true. But we can explore the other method, which is called button dot remove attribute. And you can use the remove attribute to, well, you guessed it, <laughs> remove the attribute. So in there, you can be, we can type type and click it. Now, we don't know whether it removed it or not. So what we can do is check the has attribute one more time. And there we go, it's deleted, we don't have it. That's it, we just explored the most popular properties and methods of the DOM. You're gonna learn about so much more methods, but you don't need to learn about them now. When you choose your framework of choice like React or Angular or Vue, in there, all the methods are going to be quite different from these ones. You won't have to access the element and then add the method. Everything is going to be much more straightforward. So I'm not going to bother you with learning all of this right now. In this video, we'll be working with classes. Mostly developers think that classes are used to style elements, but they can also be used by JavaScript to do something to elements with a certain class. Any number of class names can be given to any of the HTML elements. There isn't any restriction on that. However, if there are multiple classes, we need to separate them with a space as we did right here. Now, in this example, we're going to add some styles to our application. So just below the title, I'm going to create a style tag. Inside of there, we're going to add a class called dot menu item like this. And it's going to have a background color of black and it's also going to have a color of white. And now we're going to create another class, which is going to be dot menu item dot active. 
this thing is basically going to be inverted. So it's going to have a background color of white and it's also going to have a color of black. Now let's add something to our HTML. In here, I'm gonna remove this example, all of our buttons and H1s, and in there, I'll create a UL tag. UL stands for an unordered list. All allies are gonna have a class that's going to say menu item, like so. And I'm gonna copy this three more times. So we're gonna have menu one, menu two, menu three, and menu four. Now, only one of these is gonna have another class on it, and that class is gonna be called active, just like so. Now, let's save it and see how it looks like. As you can see, we have four different elements and only one of these has the active class turned on. That was an example of how we use classes to style elements. Now, let's see how we can mix it up with JavaScript. First, we need to select the elements with a certain class and for that, we can use the get elements by class name. I'm gonna create a function called menu clicked. Menu clicked just like so. And that's going to be an arrow function. Inside of there, it's going to accept a current element. So in here, I'm gonna say cur element just like so. Now in there, we're gonna loop through all these elements to get different menu items. To do that, we're gonna say const menu items is going to be equal to document dot get elements by class name. And then in here, we can specify the class name of menu item. To keep moving between the lines and not save the code, you can use the shift enter. That's only going to add a line and not going to store it immediately. So with shift enter, I'm moving forwards. And now, now that we have all the elements, we can use a for loop to loop over them. So in this case, I'm gonna create a for loop that's going to have let i is equal to zero. It's going to loop until it's less than menu items dot length. And it's gonna increment i for each iteration. Then I'm gonna open the block of code for that specific for loop. And what we can do right now is we can add or remove a specific class. To do that, I'm gonna say menu items, and then we need to get the current one for the current iteration dot class list dot remove. With that, we can remove the active class for each specific element. This currently removes all the active classes, but for the current element, we want to add the active class. So just after the for loop, we're gonna say event dot target dot class list dot add, and we're going to give it a class of active. The event target is the current element we clicked on. Don't save that yet. We're going to go back in here and then for each li, we're going to give it an on click listener. So you can say on click and then the on click is going to call the menu clicked function. And then we're gonna pass this. So we're passing the current element that we clicked on. Great, now if you save this, go back and now press enter. Now we have access to the menu clicked function. If you go ahead and click through the elements, you can see we're changing the menu item using CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, but primarily JavaScript. The code is here. You can also write this in the script file. So I'm gonna take that and move it to this script right there. It's going to be a bit cleaner. You can see we are currently not using the current element, but we are using the event.target. It says that the event target is deprecated. So instead of doing the event target that class list, we're gonna do current element that class list that add. If we save that and then go back, refresh, you can see we can keep going through the menu items using JavaScript to change different classes. That's great. In this video, we're gonna learn how to create, traverse around and remove nodes from an HTML website. Let's start with creating the elements. There are different ways to create an HTML element using JavaScript. The mostly used way is to use the document.createElement method. This is how it works. Let's first delete these styles and also all the current elements on the website. And now we can open our website in the browser. Great, we have our console right there. To create an element, we can use the document.createElement element syntax. 
And then in there, the only thing we have to provide is a string that's going to contain the name of the element. We can use an h1 in this example. There we go, we have an h1 element. But where is it? The created HTML element can be added attributes and content using the element properties and methods that we already know how to use. The above method just creates the element but doesn't add it to the DOM. To add it to the DOM, we will use the append child method. We can add it to any element or the main body as well. We will get the reference to the element to which we want to add a new element using the query selector. With this, we didn't do anything yet. What we have to do is we need to say const heading is going to be equal to document.createElement and now we have to pass that h1. Now, if we save that, now that heading is stored in a variable. What we can do right now is we need to target the body. So if you take a look, body is just a simple element. To target the body, we can do this. Const body is equal to document.querySelector and then in there, we can simply say body. Now, let's check it out. I'm gonna type body and there we go, we have the body. Now we can use the body variable to append a child. So you can say append child, and then in there we have to pass our heading. And there we go, nothing changed, right? But if you go to the elements and take a look at the body, there is it, there is an empty h1 tag. But why is it not visible? That's because it doesn't have any text in there. So to fix it, we can say heading dot inner text, and then we can make that inner text to something like hello world. Let's do that. There we go, huge title just appeared. That means that we created an element out of nothing using a create element. Then we appended it to the body. And then finally, we changed the inner text of an element to hello world. Now let's learn how we can traverse different elements on the page. To practice that, I'm gonna create another UL, which is an unordered list. That list is going to have a class of subjects. Inside of the subjects, I'm gonna create an LI, and then first one is simply going to be maths. The second one is going to be something like science, and the third one is going to be English. Now, let's say that the science has a class of fav subject, so that's going to be our favorite subject. Now we want to see what are different ways in how we can explore these different elements in our console. So make sure to save the file by pressing Command S and then we can go back in our console. Let's target all subjects by doing const subjects and then we can use the document.querySelector to get the first element that has a class of subjects. So that's going to be dot .subjects. Okay, let's save it and let's see what do we have under subjects. You can see that is a UL. This means that we accessed only one element, the whole UL, not each individual thing. Now let's see how we can use that UL to target each thing specifically. Now let's do something like this. Subjects dot first element child. There we go. First element child is the first child right there. Then we can also use the last element child to give us the last element in that list. But now, instead of targeting the whole list, let's target our fav subject. To do that, I'm gonna do const fav subject, and that's going to be equal to document.querySelector. We can put a string and say dot fav subject, just like that. Now, if we try console logging it, there we go we get that specific thing. Now we can use that fav subject and call the dot previous element sibling. And that's going to give us the previous sibling in the list. We can also call another thing called next element sibling, which is going to give us the next one in our list. And finally, you can also get the parent element of any HTML node by doing fav subject dot parent element. There we go, we get the whole UL. We have access to a lot more methods. I'm gonna show them right here, but I'm gonna paste them for you in the notes just below this video so you can take a look if you want to.
moving on to the last part of this video, and that is how we can remove HTML elements. Another major thing that is needed while manipulating HTML is removing elements that are not needed after some action. Let's say that we want to remove the favorite subject. To do that, we would do this, fav subject, and then simply call dot remove on it. Remove is a method, so you need to have opening and closing parentheses. Now, if we do that, that's it. The element is completely removed. In this video, we learned a lot about how we can add elements, traverse through the elements, and also remove elements from the DOM. And with that, we're coming to an end of the DOM section. We learned only a small portion of the DOM, but as I told you, as soon as you move to a certain framework, you're not going to need it anymore. With that said, once you come to the end of the course, I'm going to give you directions on how you can practice and learn a certain framework and what are the possible pathways for you to continue learning even after you finish the course. Hello everyone and welcome to another section of the course. In this section, we'll be talking about classes, the new keyword and this keyword. Three quite tricky concepts, but they are not used all that much. So I'm gonna let you know everything you need to know about them and then we can move on. In this lecture specifically, we're gonna talk about the new keyword. The new keyword has multiple aspects related to it, but for now, let's just consider the most basic functionality the new keyword offers. It creates a new object. Yeah, that's it. Not so difficult to grasp, right? The new keyword creates a new empty object. Enough of talking, let's dive into the code and create a person object. So far, we learned that we can create an object like this, const person is equal to, and then you simply specify an opening and a closing curly brace that denotes an object. But now we can use the same thing to create an object using the new keyword. We can do that like this, const person one is equal to new, and then we can use the object constructor, like so. Let's see what is the difference between the two approaches. Console.log, and there we're gonna console log the person, but we're also going to console log person one, just like so. As you can see, they are both empty objects. They seem normal so far. What this single line of code did is create an empty object called person. We can treat this person one object the same as we would treat the person. We can add new properties to it in the same way we did before. So person dot first name, and then we can make that equal to John, but let's do the same thing with the person one. As you can see, they are identical. They are completely the same. We can also use the type of operator on both of these objects, and they both return the same thing, an object. So you must be wondering, what are the differences? Why would we use this syntax instead of using this one? Well, the second way allows us to create something known as an object constructor. With that, we can create a lot of the objects of the same type. What is the difference between two approaches and why would you ever want to use the second one? The answer is, if you want to create a simple object, you never need to use the second approach. This is the same thing. This is simply a shorthand for absolutely the same thing. Let me show you a few more examples. In the same way, we can create an array. Const arr is equal to an array. This is it. This is the literal syntax, creating it immediately. In the same way, we can create an array using the new array thing, just like so. Now I can pass in one to three, or I can immediately add one to three in this array. Let's check the difference. Const log arr, and we can do arr1. Now, as you can see, they are identical. We use these things so often that they are literally ingrained in here. We use the literal syntax to create an array. No need to every time say new array. So when do we need to use that new keyword? Well, at the start of the course, we talked about dealing with dates in JavaScript. And that looks something like this. Const my date is equal to new date. And then in there, you can do something like August and let's do 11th of 2025. Okay, and now if we console log it, from that my date or the new date creator, JavaScript creates a date object. So that means that date is just a special object that is built into JavaScript. 
For that reason, we need to use the new date because there is no literal syntax for creating the date. There's not something, and I'm making things up now, there's no syntax that looks like this, for example, that's immediately going to create a date object. It's simply not necessary because we don't use dates all that often, so we can just use new date like so. And with this date, since it is a special type of an object, we can use a lot of things. So for example, we can now call a method called get full year. And that's going to give us a full year if we call it as a method. And there we go, 2025, it works. How does that work? Where did we get that method from? Same thing when we create an array, we automatically have all these new methods like pop, push, slice, splice, and so on. Where do these come from? This is because when you create a date, when you create an object, when you create an array, when you create a number or string or anything really, you're actually creating a new object in JavaScript that is extended off of the specific constructor. So let's take a look at all of these different data types. Consolog, and then in there, I'm gonna put the array constructor in there. We can also do something like this, object, Let's also do number and let's do date, for example, since we just mentioned it. As you can see, these are all functions that when they are run with the new keyword in front of them, they will return an object. And that's why we say that everything in JavaScript is an object. Because even though a number is just a number, when we create a new number, we have a bunch of methods to use on it. So if we do something like this, const my number, is equal to new number, and then we pass in a hundred. Now we can use a lot of built-in properties on this number. For example, my number that to fixed, and then we pass in zero. This is going to make sure that we don't want any decimals. Now let's console log that, and let's change the number to something like 100.234. Now, if we save it, you can see we get 100. This method did its thing, and that's it. So that's what we mean when we say that everything in JavaScript is an object, because even things that are numbers are a type of number, they are also an object, meaning they're packed with all of these little methods. So just for a second, let's go back to creating a normal array, const arr, and now in here, this is our array where we have one, two, three, four. Now on that array, we can do something like array.push and we can push five then we can console log it. As you can see, we get one, two, three, four, five. So you might be asking yourself, how are we getting all of these methods even though we didn't use the new keyword? Well, we can do that because of the literal syntax, just like that. And that behind the scenes creates an object with all of these properties. So the only difference between using this and using the new array is that this is the shorter syntax. Other things are exactly the same, but with some other things like dates, they don't have a literal syntax. So that's the only reason why we need to use the new keyword. I hope that this lesson clarified just a bit why we use the new keyword and how all data types in JavaScript behave. Why do we have these methods? Why is everything an object? Great, in further lectures of this section, we're gonna talk about this keyword and about classes. So far, we've already seen that we can use something known as a constructor to create a lot of different objects, but using the class syntax, that's going to be so much easier. So let's move on. Hello everyone, and welcome to the lecture where we're gonna talk about the this keyword. So first of all, what is the this keyword and what is it used for? Well, the this keyword is used to reference the object that is executing the current function. In other words, every function has a reference to it in its current execution context. For example, if we want to create a function that console logs a string using the this keyword, we would do it like this. Function, and make sure that it is a normal function declaration and not an error function because there we cannot use the this keyword. Then we can call it something like sentence and it's going to accept some words. Now this is our function. In that function, we're gonna set the this.words to be equal to words, just like that. And then we want to console log this. 
what is this? We want to console log it. So now let's do something like this. Const first string. And our first string is going to be equal to new sentence. And then in the sentence, we're going to pass our string. Hello. And let's collapse this a bit. This is a sentence just like that. Great. So let's save that. As you can see, we immediately get sentence, more specifically sentence that has words, and then the words are equal to the string we passed in into that new sentence. So let's see what is going on here. First off, we set a function with an input of words. And then inside, we set the this that words to be equal to our input. Then we console log this and create a variable that contains a new input of our sentence. It might be a bit confusing. And it is true that this keyword is one of the most confusing keywords in JavaScript. So let's explore it in more detail. That this keyword points to a particular object. Now, which one is that object depends on how a function which includes the this keyword is being called. So let's test it on a one more example. In here, we've been calling it inside of the function, but let's try it calling it inside of here. This, what is the this going to be equal to? As you can see, if this is called not inside of any of the scopes of the functions, it's going to be equal to, to the global window object. On that, you have a lot of properties you can use to interact with the DOM. As you can see, there's a lot and a lot of properties. You can know where on your screen is your cursor. You can do absolutely anything with it. The only thing you need to know is that if you console log the this keyword outside of all scopes, more specifically in the global scope, then it's going to be equal to, to the global window object. Now let's see how the this keyword behaves if it is inside of an object. So let's do something like this const person. And then that person is going to have a name of let's do again, John, we are overusing John, but that's okay. And then we have something like get name. And this is our function get name is a method more specifically, we learned about that functions are normal functions when they are declared outside. But when we have a function inside of an object, that's called a method. So now let's try console logging this inside of the person object. If I do that, you can see nothing happens, but what we can do is we can call person dot get name in that way, this code is going to be executed. If we do that, you can see this actually refers to the object this keyword is in. In this case, it refers to the person object whose name is John. Moving on to something you might not think has anything to do with objects or this keyword. It is a car factory. Let's create a car factory in this video. The only thing we have to do is let's do something like this const or more specifically function car. And then this is a function we call like this, and it's going to accept some properties. In this case, it's going to accept, let's say the color, uh, the brand, and let's say it has the number of wheels. We can also have cars, which are, I guess, motorcycles. Now we're going to bind all of these properties by saying this that color is equal to color, this that brand is equal to brand, and then we can do this that wheels is equal to wheels. Great. Now we created a constructor function that's going to create a lot of cars. So in this case, if we were to do something like let's do blue car is going to be equal to new car. Notice how we are using that new keyword we explored in the last video. Now let's pass a few things. We're going to pass blue. Let's pass BMW. Now let's try console logging the this keyword in here. Now, if I go ahead and save this, you can see it immediately knows that it is inside of the car factory or a function that produces a lot of different cars. And it knows in which car is it because we are calling it here, we're producing it, and then it console logs all of these different properties. Now, if we were to call it from a, let's say a red car, it can be a red, let's do something like Ferrari, let Ferrari, if we save it, you can see that this keyword two times in the same execution context, in the same scope, it is equal to two different things. 
I think you can see why this is causing a lot of confusion amongst JavaScript community. But here are my two cents in this situation. And not just to comfort you, JavaScript is moving more towards a functional programming approach. That means that JavaScript will more and more use everything in a function, const func, and that's going to be an error function, which is going to accept some parameters, and that's it. It's moving towards functional programming, opposed to something known as an object-oriented programming. In object-oriented programming, we use a lot of these constructors, known as objects, and we construct objects, and we use a lot of classes. We're going to talk about classes in the next video, but we're not going to go into details with classes or constructors, and that's for one simple reason. JavaScript is turning more and more functional every day. For example, right now I'm creating applications in the most popular JavaScript library right now for front-end applications. It's called React. Before, in React, to define something known as a component, you had to use something like this, class extends react.component, and then you would have to create a class, and then in there you had to have the constructor with props. You have to do this, all of these crazy stuff. You don't have to know any of this super props, you pass that in, and then you also have to define this, that state. It, it is absolutely crazy. You have to do all of this just to be able to show a simple H1, for example, render, and then a return. And now you can show a simple H1 here. You don't need to know any of this. Let me show you why. Functional components were introduced. And now you can basically create a function that's going to act as a component. And to do all of the things we did in the last example, the only thing you had to do is literally this, create an H1 heading, which is a function. You can see how much simpler the functional approach is. It does the same thing, but in less code. So for that reason, you don't have to know this keyword in detail. And also you don't need to know a lot about classes, which we're gonna mention in the next video. Great, you don't need to know any of this, but I just wanted to show you how it behaves. See you in the next one. Hello everyone, and let's get things going. So what is a class? A class is a schema for an object that can save many values. As an example, let's create an object. Const person is equal to, name can be something like Melissa, then we can have an age of let's say 24 and we can say something like is working to be equal to true. These are three different properties. Now look at this example. We have three different values, Melissa, 24 and true. And all three different values are of different types, string, number and Boolean. We'll create a class and we're going to provide it with these keys, name, age and working. Then we have to call our schema and pass in the values for these keys. So to do that, let's create this new structure called a class. Class person is going to be equal to, no more equals here, it's just an object. So this is how you declare a class. Class person and then object signs. This is not of course an object, this is a class. Now in there, we have something known as a constructor. And constructor is similar to parameters in a function. In here, we can pass all the things that it's going to accept. In this case, we want to pass in the keys, name, age, and is working. Now we have to set the same thing with it in the constructor object. This that name is equal to name. This that age is equal to age. And this that is working is equal to is working. In the code above, we say class person, and that is the way to initiate the class. The constructor is the receptor of values that we will send to create the object. And when we say this, that name, we make the reference of the key name of the class and we assign it to the value that comes in in the constructor, this name right here. So we already have the schema. This is it. What's next? we can initiate a variable with any name. It is always recommended to use a name that makes sense. In our case, since we have a person class, let's do something like this, const user. Const user is equal to new person, 
And now we can create the same thing we had here. Let's pass in the values. In this case, it's going to be Melissa. Then the second thing is the age of 24. And then we have true. When we say new person, we're telling JavaScript to create a new object with the same schema that the class person has. So to understand what JavaScript is doing with the values we're passing in Melissa 24 and true, check out this example. So in here, we are receiving that Melissa. So let's copy it. And then we are basically setting the name to be Melissa. And then we are receiving the age of 24 and setting it here. And finally, is working becomes true. So we are basically creating an object that has these properties, same as it had here. Let's bring it back. And now let's console log our user. Before that, I'm going to delete our first person here. Now, if we go down and say console log user, let's see how it looks like. As you can see, this is now a person type object that has a name of Melissa is working to true and age to 24. So why can't we declare our user like this using a normal object? Well, you absolutely can, and you should in most cases. The only way where the second approach would be more appropriate is when you have the schema for a specific thing. So all of these things need to follow a certain structure. So let's say that you have a person, then you have a second person with the name of John, age 12, working true. Then you have a third one, which is going to be two, three. This one is going to be something different and so on and so on. You can see how we have a lot of code here and every time we have to specify all of these properties. With the approach of using classes, what you can do is simply declare the constructor and then you can create as many users as you want and they're all going to follow the same thing. The only thing you have to change are the values. That's it. And now we're diving into a topic that is called object oriented programming. Java is the most popular programming language that uses object oriented programming, but JavaScript is turning away from it, at least from what I could personally notice in the last few years. So how would we do the same thing with it here using normal functions? Well, let me show you. Let's create a function called create person. It's going to be an arrow function. And then in there, we're going to have our user, or we can say user schema. That's it. Our user schema is going to have three different things as we always do name. Name is going to be equal to nothing yet. We're going to populate it later. Then we have the age. And then finally, we have the property is working just like so. Now, what do you think? Where are we going to get the actual values for these properties? Well, the only thing you have to do is you have to call the create person and you have to pass them in as parameters. So let's say that our first thing is Melissa 24 and then we have true. Now we get them here as params name, age and is working. Basically, now what you can do is you can use name, we can use age and we can also use the is working coming from the props. Of course, we have to have commas here. Now, if you remember what I told you, if the key and the value of an object have the same name, then you don't have to declare it like this. What you can do is simply space it by commas. Now that gives us our user schema. So the create person object, what is it going to do? Well, basically it's going to return our user. So it's going to return our user schema like so. Now, finally, let's store our create person in a variable. Const user is equal to create person. And then we can say console log user. As you can see, we get our object right there. The one small improvement we could make is that considering we are using this user schema variable only once, we can immediately use the value out of it and not even create a variable. To take only the value, you can copy it and then simply return it immediately without the need to create an object. If you do that, you can see the output is the same. Now, if you're already a pro with error functions, then you know that this is an instant return and we can simply do it in one line. If we do it like this, if we remove the return and stretch it all the way here, you might notice that there is small thing that's inconsistent here. Usually we just re remove the return, remove the curly braces and that's it. But we did that, right? But you can notice the curly braces are still there and these belong to an object. So 
to actually instantly return an object, you have to wrap it in parentheses like that. Now we have our create person function and it looks like this. As you can see, our output is still the same. We get back an object. This is the functional approach to solving the same thing we did before with classes. You can see we can create as many people as we want now, user two, user three, user four, and we can simply console log them. They are all following the same schema. Let's just change the name to A, B, and C. As you can see, they are there. That's it. You didn't only learn about classes, the this keyword, and the new keyword. You also learned a bit about object-oriented and functional programming, and how in JavaScript, you're mostly gonna use functions to do pretty much any task you want. And with that said, take a small break, and then we are moving to one of the last sections of the whole course, asynchronous JavaScript. Welcome to a new module in this course. I'm super excited for this one because we are going to understand some important concepts in JavaScript. These concepts will later help us provide functionalities to our app like fetching data and sending data to servers. Until now, in this course, we have been dealing with something called synchronous JavaScript. And now is the time to understand asynchronous JavaScript. You might not understand these terms now, but by the end of this section, you will know what they are and why these concepts are crucial to building real world apps. So let's get started. This first lecture is going to serve us as an introduction to asynchronous code. So first, before we start working with real asynchronous code, we're gonna mock everything using predefined timed intervals, meaning some of our actions are gonna take a specific amount of time. In JavaScript, there is a variety of pre-made functions that allow you to execute chunks of code in timed intervals, even while other code in the program is being executed. Imagine you're coding a video game and need a function that could execute certain operations every millisecond, or a local clock that takes the amount of time a user has spent in your site. You'd probably help yourself with the following. In here, we have something known as set interval. So how can you use the set interval? Well, the set interval allows you to execute a chunk of code every time a specified amount of milliseconds passes. For example, let's console log hello world every thousand milliseconds. That's one second. To do so, we would do something like this. Set interval, and that is a function, so we call it like so. That function accepts two different arguments. The first argument is a callback function, so we can define it like that. And then the second argument is the number of milliseconds. In here, let's do a thousand, that's one second. Now, in this function, you can do whatever you like, and that something is going to be executed every one second. So now for the example, let's just do a string of hello world. Now, if we save that, as you can see, it start counting, hello world, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Every second we get a new console log. That's great and all, but how do you prevent an interval from going on forever or store one for that matter? Well, any interval can be stored as a full variable that can later be cleared using the clear interval function. A more professional take on the example above would look like this. Const my interval is a variable and we're gonna set that interval to be equal to this variable we had just here. This is an instant return, so we can remove these curly braces and simply do everything in one line. You remember, arrow functions. So now this is our interval we're gonna set my interval variable to be equal to this set interval. Now, what we can do is we can use a clear interval function like so, and then pass in my interval. Now, that's going to clear my interval after a certain action. As you can see, in this case, it clears it immediately. The clear function is especially useful if you only want an interval to execute a certain amount of times and clear it once a condition such as millisecond counter getting to a certain value is reached. Now we covered the set interval and also the clear interval. But there is also another really powerful function and it's called set timeout. So in here, I'm gonna write a comment saying set timeout and let me explain how this works. The set timeout function allows you to wait a certain amount of time before executing a chunk of code. 
Do note that other code outside of the timeout will continue execution as normal. The way it's used is identical to set interval. So in this case, we can basically copy the same code right here. And then in here, we can call the set timeout instead of set interval. If we do that, let's see what happens. As you can see, the code first waits one second and then outputs this thing. Let's increase it to, for example, five seconds. In that way, it's going to be much more noticeable. I'm gonna save it right now. One, two, three, four, five, and there should be our console log. There we go. We got it after five seconds. So if you want to do something after a certain amount of time, then you can use the set timeout function. And as with the clear interval, in this case, we have clear timeout, just like so. So we can do the same thing to clear it like this. You just call the clear timeout and then pass in my interval. That's great. It's always a good practice to clear your intervals or timers. This is the first time you see JavaScript code that doesn't execute linearly from top to bottom. It is asynchronous. The code on the top can be executed after the code on the absolute bottom of the file. Let me show you that. We're gonna call our set timeout at the top of our file. So I'm gonna delete everything and simply console log hello world at the top of our file. And then I'm gonna place another console log right there. I'm gonna say hello world and then there at the bottom. And this one is gonna be hello world at the top. So now if we call that, take a look. We get hello world at the bottom and then only after five seconds are we going to get this one that is on the top. That is not being executed synchronously. If this was done synchronously as it is always done, then this console log would be first. But in this case, first time ever, you're seeing how the asynchronous code works. Just after this lecture, we're going to go into much more depth in terms of asynchronous JavaScript. Stay tuned. As promised, in this lecture, we're going to dive deeper into the differences between asynchronous and synchronous code. So what is synchronous code? Synchronous JavaScript is one in which the code is executed line by line and its tasks are completed instantly. There is no time delay in the completion of the tasks for those lines of code. For example, let's say that we have two functions, const function one, and that's going to be an arrow function. Then in there, we're gonna put a console log, which is going to say simply function one, like so. Then we're gonna create another function just below the function one, and it's going to be called function two, just like this. It's also going to be an error function. And then in there, we're going to simply console log function two. Now, what we're gonna do is inside of the function one, we're going to make a function call to function two. Function two, and then we are going to call it like so. Now, right after this console log, we are also going to put another console log, which is going to say function one, and then in there, comma, part two, just like this. So now we have three different console logs, two coming from the function one and one coming from the function two. And our function one is calling our function two. Finally, I'm going to call our function one right here. Pause this video, write down in the comments like this, one, two, and three, and now say which console log is going to happen in which order. If I now save this file, you'll be able to see that the first console log that happens is this one here, function one. That makes sense, right? We call the function here and function one gets executed first. Then we get function two, which is this one. Why is that happening? Well, because in here we called a function two and then our code immediately jumped in here and started executing whatever is in this function. Then finally, after it is done doing that, it, of course it comes log function two, and then it moved forwards, line seven, line eight, and then it executed this thing, function one, part two. So that's the reason why we got these console logs in this order. Well, now let's switch this to asynchronous code. So we're gonna use the same example and switch it to be asynchronous. In this case, what we're going to do is we're gonna call this function one. We're gonna do the same thing, 
also call this, call this, but in function two, we're gonna have that thing we learned in the last video, which is going to be a set timeout. Remember, set timeout is a function that accepts two parameters. First one is a callback function we want to execute, and then the second one is the number of milliseconds that have to pass until this function is ran. So what we're gonna do is we're simply going to console log function two, console.log, and then in there we can say function two, the same thing as we did before, but now with a two second delay. Now again, pause the video, write three different comments, one, two, and three, and guess in which order are the console logs going to be executed. If I save it, you can see now we get function one, function one part two, and only then after two seconds we get function two. It went through the code from line one. It skipped through all of these because these are just function declarations. They weren't called yet. So in here, we have line 15 calling our function, function one. So we go into our function one, line three, we start executing the code. So first we do this, right? We call it, we console log it. Then it moves to the call of the function two. As soon as it does that, we go right here in function two. Now we are on line 11, we go to line 12. It executes this thing, but this thing says, oh, let's wait two seconds. So I'm gonna put here waiting. While this is waiting, our JavaScript is gonna keep doing what it's doing, going to line seven, going to line eight, and then it's going to console log this. And then only after the wait is done, it's finally going to console log this. So that's how asynchronous JavaScript works. First, it does the things in order, but if there is a piece of code that needs to wait for something, it can keep doing other stuff while that is yet to be executed. Great, I hope this makes just a bit more sense. Here you might think, why does JavaScript engine not wait for the set timeout to end and then continue? So let's say that we might have some asynchronous code in our script. And after those lines, we have some code to handle DOM events. So if the JS engine stops for the things which take time, the users might interact with the web page at the time and those events will remain unhandled, leading to users to think that the website is not working. That is not good. So you see that this feature is in fact in our favor. We just have to handle these kinds of functionality differently. We have to learn how to use asynchronous code. So to reiterate, asynchronous JavaScript is one in which some lines of code take some time to run. These tasks are ran in the background while the JavaScript engine keeps executing other lines of code. When the result of the asynchronous tasks gets available, then it is used in the program. So the main concept behind asynchronous JavaScript is that we don't wait for a function to get executed and complete its task and only then handle the result. But we simply let the async function do its job in the background and we move on to execute the other lines of code. Now you're ready to understand what is happening and more importantly, why is it happening? All of this happens because of a concept known as the event loop. So to understand that, just at the end of this section, I provided a bonus lecture on the event loop. Stay tuned. Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to cover a lot of advanced JavaScript concepts, some of which are API data fetching, asynchronous code, callback functions, promises, and async await. Most tutorials simply cover the way to fetch something from an asynchronous source. This video is going to teach you how we can first simulate or create that asynchronous source and then how we can properly deal with the data coming out of it. Let's immediately dive into a real example of asynchronous JavaScript, and that is data fetching. With JavaScript, we can fetch data from a range of different APIs. API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it is simply something that you can access the data from. Once you fetch the data, depending on the size of the data we are fetching and our internet speed, the fetching is going to take a certain amount of time. Opposed to the set timeout where we always waited for two seconds, with real data fetching, we cannot be sure how long is it going to take. Now let's simulate that data fetching. Let's say that we are trying to fetch a user from the database. This is the problem. Let's create that function, const fetch user, 
and that is going to be a normal function, error function, which accepts one parameter, and that parameter is going to be username. So to fetch the user from the database, of course, we have to have his username. In this case, we are not simply going to return that user. So let's say user is equal to username. We are not simply going to return it. Why? Because this would be synchronous code. We want to make this asynchronous. We need to make this function wait some time to actually get the data. To do that, we can use the set timeout. So in here, I'm going to create a set timeout function. And if you remember, set timeout executes something after a certain period of time. So in here, it accepts two parameters. The first one is the callback function. And then the second one is the number of milliseconds when it is going to happen. So after two seconds. So what we want to do is expand this code block. And now inside of that, we actually want to return that thing. So in this case, we are saying, may our user be fetched after 2000 milliseconds. Now let's create a new variable and retrieve that user const user. And that's going to be equal to fetch user. And let's say that we want to fetch the user with the username of Michael. Let's try console logging the user. As you can see, we get undefined. That means that the user couldn't be fetched. Now, just for this to make more sense, let's change this from user to username, because in here we are inside of an object. And the only thing this object has is going to be the username. We could add some other things like age or something else, but now let's just have the username, which is equal to username. And if you know in objects, if you just have the same key and value, you can simply keep the key and it's immediately going to take the value. What we currently have is we have an object that has the username, which is equal to Michael because we are sending that over right in here and then setting in here. So that's what we are expecting, but we are not getting that. We're getting undefined. So let's try doing something more meaningful. I'm going to put a template string here and I'm going to say your name is, and then in here, a template string user dot username. So we're trying to get the username from this object. If we do that, we get cannot read property username of undefined, which means that user is indeed undefined. Why is that the case? The reason for this error and the reason why the user is undefined is that the data wasn't returned from the function immediately. It waited two seconds. All of this works perfectly, but we get the data after two seconds. And since JavaScript is by default synchronous, it just executes this in a millisecond. So how can we make JavaScript wait two seconds and then console log this data when it is fetched after two seconds? Here comes the concept of callback functions. We can pass in a callback function that's going to run when the data is fetched. To do that, we can modify our fetch user function. It is going to accept the same thing again, username, but this time we're going to add the second parameter. And the second parameter is going to be called callback. That is the callback function. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to still call the set timeout. In here, we can even do a console log. And let's say console log. Now we have the user. So after the set timeout is executed, then we have the user. And in here, what we're going to do is instead of returning the user, we are going to call the callback function, this one here and then pass the user in here as an argument. So in here, we are calling our callback function and then passing the data as the parameter or an argument of this callback function. But you might be asking, okay, we created this extra parameter here, but we are not doing anything in here. Of course, if you have two parameters, you have to pass in two arguments. So in here, we're going to add a comma and now what did we say? What is the data type of the callback? Well, you can see here that we are calling it. That means that it must be a function. So in here, I'm going to create an error function as the second parameter. And then as you can see in there, we are getting the actual object that contains the username. So in here, I know that this object represents the username. So in here, I'm going to do user. And then finally, what I can do in here is I can console log well, basically that same thing we had below. So your name is user dot username. Now let's see if that is going to work. If I save that, 
you can see we get nothing, but this time it waited two seconds. And then we get, now we have the user, your name is Michael. So what happened here is that we created a callback function right here, and we didn't return the data from the fetch user function. What we did is we called that callback function right here. Now it would be incorrect to store this in a new variable because the function is not storing anything. What we're doing is simply calling the fetch user function and then putting a console log right there. So if we do it one more time in here, before the set timeout, I can add another console log saying fetching dot, dot, dot. And then below, yeah, as you see it, fetching dot, dot, dot. And after two seconds, now we have the user we get the user, we pass it over as a callback in this callback function, and then this code here is being executed. I know that this is a bit harder to understand, a lot of moving between the function declaration and the function call. This is maybe the first time you're seeing the function as the actual argument to the function. So that's it. If I now delete these console logs, just so it's a bit easier to see and put it like this, let me try to highlight what's happening one more time we have this function declaration. Function declaration is not being executed yet. It is only executed after we make a function call. So that's happening right here. We call the function and we pass in the Michael as the username. Then our function goes into here, it waits two seconds, and then after two seconds, it passes that object containing the username over to the callback function as a parameter. And now in here, we have our callback function, which is being executed after two seconds. Basically, we're calling another function from our function declaration, and that is called a callback function. Callback because it calls back after a certain action. It happens after something is done. In this case, after the user is fetched. What you can see right here is just a simple example. But now let's add more things onto it because later on, we're going to exchange callback functions for both promises and async await. To complicate it, we're going to imagine that we are working on a social media platform of sorts. Once the user profile is fetched, then we want to fetch his photos. So let's create a function for that. So now we have the const fetch user, but just below, let's create another one. Const fetch user photos, and then in there, it's also going to be a function. It's going to accept username as a parameter and also the callback function. We're going to do the same thing with it above. I can even copy that set timeout function. So we have something happening after two seconds. And then what we're gonna do here is instead of sending back the user, we're going to send back an array that contains the photos. So in here, I can say an array of string one, which is going to say photo one, and then another string in there, which is going to be photo two, we're just going to mock it no real photos here. Just below our sets timeout in here, I'm going to create a console log that's going to say, now we have the photos just like that. Okay, and I can even put it in square brackets. So it's more noticeable. And I'm going to copy that console log and also put it at the top of our fetch user, because in there, we also want to say, now we have the user. So now what is happening is we are fetching user and only after the user is fetched, then we want to fetch his photos. Since this is a demo example, we have one inconsistency here. And that is that technically we could be calling both the fetch user and fetch user photos at the same time, because they don't depend on something. But in real case scenario, you would first have to authenticate the user and then based on his authentication key, for example, fetch the actual photos. But for simplicity purposes, what we're doing here is we are fetching each thing after another. So only after the fetch user is done, only then are we fetching the photos and everything else. Right now we are back where we were. We're just calling the fetch user, but we're not doing anything with fetch user photos. So how can we put that into play? Well, we're going to call that only after the user is fetched. Remember this console log here, and that is happening inside of the fetch user callback function. So now just inside of there, we can call our second function, fetch user photos, just like that. We have to pass in the username and we also have to pass in a callback function. So I'm going to create one 
like this. And then in there, we have to fetch some things. In this case, that's going to be user photos. How do we know that user photos are in there? Because if you take a look in here in the callback function, we are passing in the user photos as the one and only parameter. And that's the same thing here. This is the callback function. This is the one and only parameter and it is the user photos. Now let's console log these photos. We're going to do the same thing with it before console log and then something like your photos are and then in there user photos. And one small thing I notice in here, we should be sending the user dot username and not only the username because we don't have access to it. Our username is stored only after we fetch the specific user and then we have it under the user dot username. Now, if we save that, take a look. First, after two seconds, we get now we have the user, your name is Michael. And then after two seconds after that, we have now we have the photos, your photos are photo one and photo two. So now something is happening in succession, one thing after another. You can see this username here is grayed out, which means that we are not using it. So now we can say now we have the photos for and then in there we can say user name. So basically, we are saying we have the photos for which user just so we can make use of that username. Great. Now let's save it one more time to see what's happening. We wait two seconds. Now we have the user, your name is Michael. And then now we have the photos for Michael. Great. So we have to get the user and then we get the images for the user. As you can see, we have a lot of code here more than we've written in some sections of the course so far. This is already getting messy. Let's add just one more function and you'll easily notice the problem. Now that we have the photos, let's create one more thing and that is fetch photo details. You know how on Facebook, for example, or in other social media platforms, each photo has its own title, description and so on. So let's just mock that, create a demo code for that. So just below, I'm going to create another function, which is going to be called const fetch photo details. That's again going to be equal to a function. That function is going to accept a photo, a singular photo and a callback function. In there, we again have the same thing, the set timeout, which waits two seconds. In here, we can say now we have the photo details. So let's do that. We have the photo details for the photo. And then in here, we can add photo because that's going to be the name of the actual image. What do we want to pass over? Well, in this case, it's simply going to be a string that says details. We don't actually have to think about the username, description or stuff like that. We're just passing over details. Now, as you might have already figured, we are doing everything one after another. So in here, after we get the photos, only then do we want to actually try to fetch the photo details. So in this case, that's going to be fetch photo details. And then in this case, since our fetch photo details accepts one photo, let's for example, pass in only the first photo. So that's going to be user photos, and then zero, because we want to pass only the first element in the array. And then the second parameter is a callback function, as always. And then in there, we have details. Now, after we do that, we can say console log, also a template string, and we can say your photo details are, and then in there, we have the access to the details variable. Now, if we save the code, let's see what is happening. We wait two seconds, then we get access to Michael. Then after two seconds, we get Michael's photos. And then we have the details for photo one, your photo details are details. Now we're doing three asynchronous actions one after another, and each one is dependent on the previous one. For that reason, we're calling the fetch photo details inside of the fetch user photos, which is being called inside of the fetch user. Functions inceptions happening here, a lot of weird things. And our code is starting to look a bit weird, if you'd agree. If we remove these console logs right now and space this out like this, take a look what's happening. As you can see, if we use callbacks, we get this weird structure that just keeps moving to the right. If I just add a few more functions, take a look, we added a few more callbacks. And this is how our code would look like. <laughs> this is called callback hell. And basically, it becomes unreadable. Let me write that right there. 
the infamous callback hell. That's it. Our code just gets this weird triangle-like structure to the indentation. In this code, we can see on the left side, there's a triangle-like structure to the indentation. And this is infamously known as the callback hell. So what callbacks include is, in short, every function in here gets an argument to another function, that is this thing, and then one to another, to another, to another, and we just keep moving to the right side. It's difficult to manage a lot of callback functions. Even if you wrote them yourself, you're going to have a hard time understanding them once you come back to the code after some time. This pattern of coding, more specifically callbacks, at a large scale is not maintainable and it is confusing and also violates the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. And hence, it is a bad practice to follow. So, to resolve this issue, JavaScript introduced the concept of promises. In the next video, you're going to fully understand how promises work, and we're going to refactor this code to use promises. Stay tuned. In the last lecture, we witnessed the callback hell, but promises come to the rescue. So what are promises? Promises are objects that either return the successfully fetched data or the error. This might be a bit confusing, so let's create a promise. I'm gonna comment out all of this code here by highlighting it and then pressing command and then forward slash. Now we can keep writing code just below, but don't delete this because we're gonna come back to it and refactor it to use promises. So in here, great. Line 33, promises. So let's create a promise. And we can do that like this. Const promise is going to be equal to new promise. Notice how in here we are using that new constructor keyword. And then in there, promise accepts a callback function. So let's create a callback function right there and expand the block of code. In here, promise gets two different parameters, the resolve, and the reject. So what are we creating our promise for? Let's create it for the first example in our previous code, in here, the fetch user. So I'm gonna take that, paste it in here, just so we can see it. And now let's try to replicate that. Const promise is equal to new promise. And then the same thing is gonna be happening. In here, we have the set timeout and that set timeout is const logging something and then calling this callback. But notice how in here, we don't have access to the callback. The only thing we do have access to are those two built-in things, the resolve and the reject. So if you want to send something back, you simply call resolve and that's it. Resolve is acting as a callback. Now we can rename this promise. It doesn't have to be promise. It can be something like fetch user. And that's it. We're basically doing the same thing. We're creating a promise called fetch promise, which resolves with the user. And now in here, we don't yet have the value for the username. So let's make the username equal to Michael. Great. Now with this, how do we call our promise? Well, you can do something like this, fetch user. And now we have access to new syntax. It's called dot then. That then in here, you can see it, the callback to execute when the promise is resolved. So when we call this resolve, you're going to get the dot then and then in there, you're going to get whatever you passed in the resolve. In this case, we have a callback function. And then as the first parameter and the only parameter, we have this object, which is actually the user. So in here, we can say user. And then in here, we can do an instant return saying console log user dot username. So we are returning the username. Now let's save that and see what happens. As you can see, after two seconds, now we have the user, Michael, that's it. This still might be a bit weird for you seeing it for the first time, but I'm sure that you think it's just a bit easier than using the callbacks. Keep in mind that during the callbacks example, we didn't even test for the errors. When making requests, sometimes the data may not come back. The reason can be your internet connection, or maybe you're just fetching the data the wrong way. In any case, the fact is that sometimes you're not going to receive the data you were looking for, and we need to handle those cases. With promises, it's easy. You just replace the resolve with reject and pass our error message. In here, we can comment out this line and simply reject it. So we say reject user 
not found. So your question might be, okay, but where are we going to see this message? We are just rejecting it now. And it looks like this. With the dot then, we also have access to the dot catch in here. That catch is also a method which accepts a function, a callback function in there. But instead of the user in here, we get the actual error. So now what you can do is you can simply write console log error. Now if we remove this semicolon here, because these two are both being called on the same fetch user and save it, now we should get the reject user not found. And as you can see, it works perfectly. Now if we remove this reject and simply bring back the resolve, only that that then is going to be called and we're going to get Michael. In the last example with callback functions, we had a lot of functions. So how can we deal with all of this using promises? Well, let's do it step by step. We just did it for the promises. So let's remove some of these comments here, the reject and also remove these. And now we can take this over and paste it instead of the first function, which is the fetch user. Great. Now we can keep moving forwards and changing all of these callbacks to use promises. But before we start modifying these other things, let's first completely modify the fetch user. There's going to be a better way to actually put this. In here, we currently don't have the way to send over the parameter as a name. Notice that we hard coded it here. So to change that, I'm going to copy the whole part and then start changing it just below. I'm going to comment this out. So we have to copy this for now and then simply open the set of parentheses so that we can send our parameters in. In here, specifically, we are sending in the username. And now, just above the set timeout, we have to return a new promise, which is going to wrap our set timeout. So that should look something like this. And looks like we are missing one thing, maybe a parenthesis. If we do that, let's see how it looks. There we go, that's it. I'm gonna leave this in the description if you mess something up with the parentheses or curly braces, but generally this is it. We have a function which accepts the username and then it returns a new promise which resolves to that same username. So in here we can do username is equal to username or simply send over the object containing the username. That's it. Now we can delete this and I know it's tough, but we're gonna explain this two more times on two different functions. So in here, we have fetch user photos. The fetch user photos now is going to return a new promise. So we can say return new promise. Promise has a callback function. So we have to write it like this. And then in there, we always get the resolve and the reject, just like so. Now inside of that promise, we are simply going to copy the code for the set timeout and paste it there. The only thing we have to change is from callback to resolve. And then we can remove the callback from parameters. To repeat it one more time, let's go over to the last function. In there, our function is again, not going to need the callback and it's going to return a new promise. That is a new promise. Again, it accepts a callback function. In there, it has the resolve and the reject. And what we have to do is put this set timeout inside of that promise and exchange the callback with the resolve. That's the only thing we have to do. Now we successfully modified all three of our functions to use promises. And now finally, we have to call to get the output. No longer will it be using this, not using this. These are callbacks. So this is the function using callbacks. And now let me show you how easy it is to get the photo details. So the final thing we want to get using promises. So in here, we're going to call the fetch user and then we can specify what do we want to pass in, what name. So we said, Michael. Now you simply call the dot then on it, that then accepts a callback function. And then as the parameter of that function, we get something. Let's see what do we get. Well, we get the object, which is basically our user. So in here we can say, user. Once we have the user, we can start calling the second function and that is fetch user photos. And now we can pass in the user dot username for which we want to call the photos. Then again, this is a promise, right? So we can just add another dot. Then we are saying after you get the user here, then call fetch user photos. And now we are saying after you get the user photos, then do something. So in here, what do we get? 
we get the photos. And then after we get the photos, you can simply call fetch photo details and then in there pass the photos zero, just like so. And then finally, after we have the photo details, you can do another dot then because we are working with a promise again. And then in here, you get the details. And what do you want to do with the details? Well, the same thing we wanted to do here. Your details are, and then simply console log them. So now if I just fix this properly, we want to remove the comment and the indentation. There we go, console log, your photo details are details. Let's save it and see what do we get back. First of all, after two seconds, now we have the user, two more seconds, now we have the photos for Michael, two more seconds, now we have the photo details, and then photo details are details. So to conclude, this thing from line 40 to 43 is absolutely the same thing we have above. But notice how much easier this is to both read and write. We never again have to use callback functions. Promises are enabling us to write asynchronous code in a much easier way. But recently, there has been an addition to promises. It's called async await. And we're going to check it out in the next lecture. So stay tuned. In this video, we're going to continue where we left off and start talking about async await. I'm going to comment out the whole code right here by pressing command A and then command forward slash. And now we can just scroll down and explore async await a bit. So what is async await? Async await is simply an addition to promises. It is an easier and cleaner way to work with promises. The main advantage of asynchronous functions is that they look and behave more like synchronous functions we are all used to. Because of that, it's easier to work with them. Let's take a look at a simple example. Const fetch number. Let's say that we're calling a specific number. And then that's going to be a simple function. And that function is going to return a number, let's say 25. Now, of course, that you know how to retrieve the value of that, right? You put a console log and then simply call the fetch number function, just like so. This should result in 25. And we do get that in console right here. But now, let's say that we are fetching this from an asynchronous source. And let's make this function an async function. You do that by adding the async keyword in front of the arrow function, like so. If there is only one thing you're going to get from this video, that is that async functions, async functions return promises. So as soon as we made this function an async function, it is not going to return what we return right there. It's going to return a promise. Now let's save it and see what do we get. As you can see, we have fetch number async return 25. And then in the console, we got this promise fulfilled 25. We got back a promise and not the value itself. How can we know that? Well, if you try doing something like fetch number plus five, you can see it's going to be object promise and then five. It's not going to be simply value of 30. So how can we now retrieve the value of 25 from that promise? Well, of course you could do something with it so far. And that is simply call the fetch number on the fetch number. We can call the that then. And then as the parameter, we get back the number and then we can console log it. Console log number. If you do that, we get the value of 25. But now we didn't do anything differently. We are still using promises that then the only thing we made differently is that we created an async function. Running this code now returns 25. This means that the promise was fulfilled when returned. And as you saw, if we didn't have this that then it wouldn't work. We would simply get back the promise, but not the value. Now is the time to introduce the special await keyword. So when people talk about async, they always mention async and await. These two go hand in hand, they go together. The await keyword waits for the promise to return a result. How can we see that in action? Well, let's create a function const and let's do something like const console fetched number. And that is going to be a function. And then in there, we can explore that await keyword. What we can do is we can say this fetch number. So now we are calling this previous function right here. But remember, that function turns a promise. So if we were to do something like this, console log 
fetch number, let's see what would we get. We have to call the console fetch number function as well. And now, as you can see, we get the promise as we expected. But now is the time for that await keyword. So the only thing you have to do is you can put the await keyword in front of the promise. And that's going to result in the actual value you're going to get after the promise, in this case, 25. But there's one rule. If you want to use the await, you need to make that function asynchronous. So whenever you want to use the await, it needs to be inside of an asynchronous function. Now, if we save that, you can see we get the value of 25. Why is this special? Because you don't have to use the that then, that catch callbacks or anything else. You can make this code look like synchronous code. You can say const number is equal to await fetch number, and then you can console log the number. As you can see, this looks and behaves so much more like synchronous code. It is simply something you're already used to, and that's great. Now, to go back on our initial example, let's one more time refactor this thing, our whole application for fetching users, photos, and details. I'm going to uncomment all of that, and then below, we're going to compare three approaches. In here, we have the callbacks, in here, we have the promises, and then the third way is going to be an addition to promises, which is going to be an async await. The main thing to notice is that async await is simply an addition to promises. That means that we don't have to change anything about these three functions. The only thing we have to change is how we are calling them. So let's use async await that still uses promises, but with a nicer syntax. Down below, we can say const, and let's create a function called display data. That function is going to be an asynchronous function. And then in there, we can display anything we want. Let's call our display data function right now, just so we don't forget later. And then in there, we want to get access to all of the data we got here or here. To do that, we first have to call the fetch user function like so and pass in the name, like we did both in here and in here. But now take a look at the beauty of this. We can call it like this, and simply put the await keyword in front of it. This is going to make sure that we wait for the result of this fetch user. And then you can store that in a variable. Const user is equal to await fetch user. Now, after we get the user, we can do the photos. So const photos is equal to await fetch user photos, just like so. And then we pass in that user we got here. Since we're using the await keyword, we are not going to get the same error we had before. Remember, we tried console logging something, but that something didn't exist yet. Like your name is user.username, and then it couldn't console log it because it was undefined because it wasn't fetched yet. Await keyword is going to be 100% sure that this value here is already fetched, and only then is it going to move to the next line. So it waits on this line until this code is executed, and we have the value of user. Then we can use the user here to get the photos. And then since we have the photos, we can get the details. So details is going to be equal to await fetch photo details, and then we can pass photos zero. And afterwards, we were looking for details. So we can simply do console log details. In here, fetch user photos, we needed to put user.username and not just user because that's an object. After we run it, after two seconds, we should get, now we have the user. Two more, now we have the photos for Michael. And two more, now we have the photo details for the photo one. And then we get the string of details. Is it only me or the last way or the last approach looks so much more natural. It basically feels like the JavaScript we've been learning so far in this course. You don't have to use external that then syntax. You don't have to use callbacks everywhere. You simply declare a variable, put a wait, call the function, and that's it. Looks just like the synchronous code. And that's it. We've came to the end of a long section about asynchronous JavaScript. It is hard, so I would advise you to rewatch it if you don't understand everything fully yet. But don't worry, because once you actually start using promises, it's going to be so much easier than this. You won't have to create your own promises, most likely, you're simply going to have to fetch some data. The only thing you will have to do is do something like this, const data is equal to fetch data. 
But now you know how this works in depth. You know how JavaScript executes certain lines. So once you dive into real API data fetching, this is going to be so much simpler for you. People have a lot of trouble understanding asynchronous JavaScript, but now that shouldn't be the problem for you. Hello everyone. In this lecture, we're gonna explore ES6. So what exactly is ES6? Is it going to be hard? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, you're already writing ES6 JavaScript code. ECMAScript 6, or simply ES6, is the sixth edition of the set of standards specified by ECMA International to standardize JavaScript. In simpler terms, ES6 contains various features. There have been more than 10 editions of ECMAScript, with the latest release in 2020, but ES6 remains the most significant and widely implemented edition. That's because in ES6, we got all of the features we grew to love as a JavaScript community. You can think of it this way. ES6 is to JavaScript as your favorite update is to your favorite game. It is simply an update to the core functionality of the language. But what exactly did it bring, you may ask? So let's get into it. One of the most widely used features of ES6 are const and let. In this course, even since the beginning, I was teaching you the best practices of a language. So from the first lecture, when we started learning variables, you immediately learned about const and let. Before ES6, we only had var. Var can still be used, but let and const make the code easier to read and understand as they signal how a variable is used. Let's just repeat what are the differences. When using var, we can reassign variables. So if we do something like this, var age is equal to 27, and then we console.log.age, like this, you know we're gonna get 27, right? But we can also do something like this, var age is equal to 28 again, and then we can console log the age. We basically created two variables with the same name twice without knowing it. Let doesn't permit that if you're in the same block. So if we try doing that with let, let age is equal to 27, and then we can console log age. Let's comment these out. And now, what if we try doing let age again is equal to 28 and then console log age? As you can see, we get an error, uncaught syntax error, identifier age has already been declared. That's the way the code should work. If we just want to reassign a value to a variable, then you can simply do this and it is gonna work. But we cannot have two of the same variables with the same name. Using const, we can specify that the variable isn't going to change. So const password, and let's do one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, if we said password is equal to, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. And now if we tried const logging it, password, as you can see, assignment to a constant variable, that is indeed an error. That's great. If you never want to reassign variables, then we can use const. But you already knew all of this, so let's move to the next most widely used ES6 feature. And those are arrow functions. We've used them a lot throughout the course, and by now you should be really familiar with them. Arrow functions allow us to change our code from something that looks like this, function, multiply, and then we can have a parameter of x, and then we can return x times x, just like so. We can change that, to something that looks like this. Const multiply is equal to, we pass in parameter and then simply return x times x. But this is not a huge difference, right? Well, with arrow functions, we can also skip the brackets if we have only one return statement. So the most compact version of this arrow function would be just like so. You can see that this code is easier to read. Let's try console logging this. So console log something like two, and we have to call our function and pass two as a parameter. Now, if we do that, as you can see, we get the value of four. But you already knew error functions. From the start of the course, we've been writing the most modern JavaScript you can write. The third on our list are default parameters. If I'm not mistaken, we also mentioned default parameters in our function section. With default parameters, you can do exactly that. 
add default values to your parameters. So if we had a function called add, which is going to be an arrow function, and that function is going to accept three parameters, a, b, and c. Now, if you want to return a plus b plus c, just like so, great. Now let's try console logging the output of the called function. And let's pass parameters of two, two, and two. Now, if we save that, of course, we get six. But what would happen if one of the parameters is missing? If we do that, you can see we get nan. That is because JavaScript is trying to add two plus two plus undefined. And that is going to be not a number because we cannot do mathematical operations with undefined. For that reason, default parameters allow us to set default values to our parameters. And we can do that with a simple syntax. For example, if we get this back to a plus b plus c, now we're not passing the third value, right? So let's say if there is no third parameter provided, as you can see, there are only two here, may the third value be equal to, and you can set anything you want here. You can say hello, you can say zero, anything that suits your current needs. So in this case, what would make sense is to default all the parameters to be equal to zero if there are no values provided. So now if we call this function, you can see it doesn't care that we didn't provide a third parameter. We can even pass only one or we can pass zero parameters and it is still going to work because default parameters are going to add default values to parameters A, B, and C. Pretty handy, right? What if I told you you can add a variable or an object information directly as a string? Well, you would say, of course we know that. We already learned about template strings. Template strings are a huge addition to JavaScript. We've worked with them throughout the entire course. You should be familiar with them by now. And you guessed it, they were also introduced in ES6. For example, let's say that we want to show our customer the order details on our website. How do we do it? Cons customer is equal to something like John. Then const order is equal to an object that has a name. Let's do something like an iPad. And we're going to do a price of 1400, just like so. Now we can display a message in an old way. So the old way, and we're going to just say ugly because you're going to see how it looks like const message is equal to and then a string of hello. Let's do something like plus and then customer plus comma space. Do you want to buy space plus order dot name plus a string of four plus order dot price. You can see how bad this looks like. I even got lost typing that. So now let me put a console log and then let's see what do we have. Hello, John, you can see we are missing a space there. Do you want to buy iPad for 1400? Let me show you how we can do the same thing using template strings. It would look something like this. Const message is equal to, now we use backticks, hello, and then we can simply do dollar sign curly braces, customer, do you want to buy an, and then in there we can put order dot name for, again, dollar sign curly braces, order dot price bucks. That's it. As you can see, we get hello, John, do you want to buy an iPad for 1400 bucks? That's it. You can see how natural it feels to write this as it should be. It's simply a string with dynamic parameters or dynamic values embedded into it. That's the power of template strings. These are the four most used things from ES6. And as you can see, you know almost all of them. We also talk about promises, async await. Did you know that async await came from ES7, which is an even newer edition of JavaScript? So basically, you're already writing the newest possible JavaScript code. In the next few lectures, we're gonna learn some of the things that are not all that used in the next few lectures, we're going to cover some of the things that we didn't mention so far during our course, but I would like you to know them. They are also new and modern. Some of these are going to be imports and exports, rest and spread operators, and then object and array destructuring coming up just after this video. In this lecture, we're going to talk about imports and exports. So far, all of our JavaScript was always in a single file, and that's okay for now. 
until our code is not huge, we don't have to traverse the code between multiple files. But as soon as you start learning a framework or a library like Angular, Vue, React, or Node, your applications are going to get much larger and you will need to have multiple files. For that reason, let's see how we can use imports and exports in JavaScript. To do that, you can open the Explorer and then in this folder we're currently in, let's create a new file. We're gonna call this file docs.js. It doesn't really matter how you call it, but let's do it like that for now. I'm gonna collapse this. And now in there, let's create an array of dogs. Const dogs is equal to an array. And then let's put some dogs names like bear, fluffy, and let's do something like doggo, just like that. Now, my question for you is, how would you get these dogs over to the script.js file. For example, let's say that you want to do something like this, console.log, a template string, my dogs are, and now in here you want to list them, but we don't have access to the dogs array in the script.js file. So how can we get them from the dogs.js over to the script.js? To do that, I'm going to open the files side by side. You can drag and drop it here and then put it on the right side. That way, we're gonna have our script.js on the left side and our docs.js on the right side. Now, the only thing we have to do is export the docs. So we can do something like this, export default docs. If you use this syntax, export default docs, that's going to mean that we are trying to export the docs array from the docs file. And now on top of the script.js file, you can do something like this, import dogs from, and then we have to target our path. So that's going to be a string from dot slash. Dot slash means that the file is in the same folder as our current file. So you can see we are currently in the script.js and we want to take it from the dogs.js. So you can do it simply like this, import dogs from dogs. To be able to do this, you first have to export dogs. So now what we can do, my dogs are, and then in here we can use the dollar sign and curly braces to show the dogs. And for this to work, there's only one more thing we have to do. You can open your files, head to the index.html file, and then in here, the only thing you have to add to your script is a type equal to module. If you add this, that's going to allow you to use the import export syntax. Now, if we save that, we can go back, save the script file, and you can see my dogs are bear, fluffy, and doggo. That's it. You successfully use JavaScript written in the file dogs.js inside of the file script.js. And I completely understand if you cannot see the purpose of this right now, but later on, on bigger applications, that's going to make our applications so much more scalable which means that you will be able to add features without it being overwhelming or unorganized. Now, there's also something more to imports and exports. In this case, we use the export default syntax. Export default is used if there is only one thing that you want to export from one singular file. Now, the export from our docs file is not going to be export default because we're gonna add a second thing there. We're gonna say something like this, const number of docs and that's going to be equal to dogs.length, just like so. Now we have both dogs and number of dogs. So how can we export multiple things out of one file? Well, the simplest way is to simply add the export syntax just before the const. So you say export const dogs or export const number of dogs. And then as you can see, we currently have an error in this file, but what you can do right now is if you have multiple files, you cannot do it simply like this. You have to add a curly brace right there. And then inside of there, you can specify those names. For example, dogs or number of dogs. Now we can say something like this, console log, and then I have number of dogs, dogs. So we're having two console logs. One says I have three dogs and the other one says my dogs are and then their names. So you can notice the difference. In here, we need to use curly braces and then specify the names of our imports. Just to reiterate, let's create one more file, which is going to be called test.js. 
So inside of our modern JavaScript folder, I'm going to create test.js and inside of there, we want to have only one export. So that's going to be, let's call it only one thing. And that's going to be equal to test. So just to let you know, when you have only one thing that you want to export from one file, only in that case, do you use the export default syntax, only one thing. Now from test, we are exporting something using the export default. And from docs, we are simply exporting them using export const. This allows you to export multiple things. Now, how are we going to import that only one thing from the test file? Well, we can say import only one thing. And that's going to be coming from dot slash test dot JS, or you can simply say test. Now to be sure that we properly imported that, let's just do console log. And then in there, I'll say only one thing. And there we have it. Test, I have three dogs and my dogs are. One last thing to let you know is that if you have a default export, you can name it anything you like. For example, you don't have to name this only one thing as we named it right here. You can name it, for example, the letter A, and it's still going to work. Why is that? Well, since there is only one export from that single file, it's always going to be the same thing, test. There is no need to have the same name because JavaScript always knows that that's that same thing. It's only one, singular. So we can name it anything you like. You can name it A, you can name it ABC, or you can simply name it how you exported them from there. Definitely the best practice is to simply call it as you call it right there. In this case, only one thing. This was the default import. On the other hand, while we're talking about named imports and exports, you have to call them exactly how you call them right there. You can see export cons dogs or number of dogs in here. If you did something like a, you're going to get an error saying the requested module does not provide an export named a, you have to name it dogs exactly how you named it in the file where you exported it from. Great. That's all that there is to imports and exports. This is going to be extremely valuable to you once you start learning react. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the rest and spread operators also added in ES6. Well, first of all, let's start with an example. Let's say that we have a function called add and that we want to add a few elements. For example, let's say that we have a and B. Now, simply we want to return a plus B. That's it. Now, if we go ahead and type console log, we're going to call the add function and let's pass two plus two. As you can see, the output is four. But what do you think would happen if we add additional parameters like two, two and two? Now we have five times two. What do you think would happen? If I save this, you can see the output is still four. So what if we don't know how many parameters should our function take in? Like in this case, it can be two, it can be five or it can be 10. How can we make our function accept as many parameters as we want? Well, to do that, we can use the rest operator. The syntax is simply three dots. And then in there, you can say arguments or something like that. So you use the rest operator on the arguments. Now, first of all, let's type console log and see what our arguments are. I'm going to comment out this return a plus B. As you can see, we get back an array of all the arguments we've sent in five times two in an array. Now we can use that to actually do something with it. In this example, we could use the reduce method we learned before to sum these numbers up. So to do that, we're going to do return. And then we're going to say arguments dot reduce in there. If you remember, we have the accumulator and the current value. So we can say val. What we have to do now is simply add the accumulator plus the value. That is it. Now, if we save this, you can see we get back 10. And if you keep adding parameters, all of these are going to add up. Our function can take as many parameters as you want to pass into it. The only thing you're learning in this lecture is how to use this rest operator. If you forgot how to use the reduce method, I was just going back to the reduce array method in arrays in detail section. But with that said, that's it. This is the rest operator. Now let's move to the operator that's just a bit more useful. It's called the spread operator. 
Some people also call it spread syntax. And you can use the spread syntax if you have an array. So let's say that we have an array of numbers and then we have one, two, three, four, and five, let's say. Now, of course, if you do a console.log and then you console log those numbers, you're gonna see an array where we have five numbers in. But what if you wanted to take each and every value outside of this numbers array and simply console log it as such? For that, you can use the spread operator, dot, 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 numbers. That's going to take the numbers outside of the array and then console log them. Now, in this situation, it's not all that useful, but let me show you a few cases where this could be extremely useful. For example, let's say that you want to add a number to the numbers array. That would be numbers dot push, right? And with that, let's push the number six. Now, if we console log the numbers, we get back six. But this means that we mutated the original array. You can see we changed it and then we console logged it. In React or in other frameworks, this is not a good practice and you won't be able to mutate your variables. This is not optimal. So what is the other way to update the value of the numbers but not to mutate it? Well, you can do it using the spread operator. You can do something like this. Const new numbers is equal to a new array and then in that array, you're gonna spread all the numbers from the original array and you might've guessed it, you're gonna add a comma and add the new number. Now, what happens is numbers array wasn't changed. We can see that if you console log it here. But if you console log new numbers, you will be able to see that that array is indeed changed. So here's the trick, how to know if some methods are mutable or if they're not. If you have to put something on the left side of something you're doing and then make it equal to that, that means that you're not mutating the original array because you're storing it in a new variable. But if you notice with numbers.push, we had nothing on the left side. We were simply adding it, which means changing it. You don't want to do that. So in this case, what we're doing is we're creating a new array right here. We are spreading the numbers. Spreading the numbers means taking out all of the values from the numbers like this, putting them here, and then simply adding what we want to add to it. That's it. And that's gonna create a new array and not going to change the original. You can do the same thing with objects. And I think we already talked about that while we were going through the section of reference versus value. Let's create an object, const object, and that's going to have something like name of John, and it can have an age of 25, for example. This is our object. Now, let's make a copy of that object, for example, object one, and then we want to make that equal to the object. So now both objects are the same. If I console log them, you can see object should be equal to object one, and they are. But what would happen if I changed one? So for example, I go ahead and change the object one dot name to be equal to something like Jenny. You can see both objects changed. If you're not sure why this is happening, revisit the reference versus value section. But with that said, the goal here is to spread all of the properties from the original object, but inside of a new one. So instead of simply copying the object, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new object and simply spread all the properties of an object and then simply change the name to what we want or not do anything. We can do it like this and that's it. You can see now we have John and Jenny. Or you could also do it in one line, copy it and then simply add a comma and change the name to Jenny. This is also going to work. Great, that's all that there is to spread and rest operators. Two really useful operators that also came in ES6. Hello everyone, and in this video, we're gonna talk about object destructuring. What is that? Let's say that you have an object. That object is going to be called person, and that person is going to have a first name. Let's do something like Gary, and then it's also going to have the last name, which is going to be something like V, Gary V. Now, now let's say that Gary V also has a car, and that car has a color, color can be red and also that car has a number of wheels so that's going to be equal to four let's also say that gary has a few animals so that animals can be an object and then there we're going to have a dog 
Gary's dog has a name of Fluffy, just like that. And he can also have a cat, so let's do a cat. And cat's name is going to be equal to something like kitty, just like that. Now, both dog and the cat have age, so their age can be something like three years old. Now, my question for you is to console.log separately each and every one of Gary's properties. To do that, we would do something like this. console.log person.firstName. Person.lastName. As you can see, we get Gary V. Now, if we keep moving forwards, let's see what's going to happen person.car that color and we also need to do person.car that wheels okay moving forward we need to do person dot animals dot dog dot name and we also have to do person that animals that dog dot age you can see how repetitive does this code get we shouldn't be writing dry code dry stands for don't repeat yourself and as you can see, this is quite repetitive. We are always saying person, always repeating car, always repeating person.car.animals. And if we just finish it up, person.animals.cat.age and then person.animals.cat.name, just like that. So if you see that, there's a lot of repetition happening here. How can we solve that using object destructuring? Object destructuring allows you to take some properties outside of an object. You take them and you bring them out. The syntax is as follows. Const, and then immediately you don't have a variable name, you put a set of an opening and closing curly brace. And then you say equal to, and in here you put the name of the object you want to take things from. In our case, it's called person. Now, what do we put in curly braces? In there, we put things we want to take outside from that object. In this case, we want to take the first name. We also want to take in the last name. So we can say a last name. We can also take the car and animals, right? Now what's happening is we're bringing these properties or these variables outside in the global scope. What we can do now is now you don't have to say person.firstName. You can simply say first name and it's going to work because as you can see, we brought it right there. With this, we can now remove all instances of person and everything is still gonna work. As you can see, if I do that, there we go. Everything is still here, all the data, even though we just made our code much less repetitive. Now you can see there are still some things we are repeating, like car is being repeated three times, also animals is being repeated four times. So to fix that, we can now take things outside from the car. You can see the car is here, but how do we take out properties from the car? You put a colon sign and then another pair of opening and closing curly brace. In there, you can take all the other properties like color and wheels. And I just noticed I have wheels two times here, so I'm gonna get rid of that. And now what you can do is you can simply say color and that's it, and wheels. You don't have to repeat color.car and so on. We are taking all of these properties outside from that person object. Now let's remove these and let's focus just on animals. So I'm gonna get rid of everything besides the animals and let's just repeat one more time how we can do that. First, we have the person object. To access that, we have to do person.animals.dog.name. In this case, what you can do, person, you take animals from the person, then you take out the dog and the cat from the person and now you can get rid of the animals. You can just use the dog and cat variable. As you can see, everything still works. Of course, you could go one step forward and take the name and the age from the dog and the cat, but then you would have the same variable names. So let's just leave it like this for now. And that's what it is. If you're repeating some properties really often, then you might want to use object destructuring just to remove the need to repeat yourself so often. This is used a lot in a few cases. For example, if you start working on back inside JavaScript with Node, in there, you're gonna have something that looks like this. Const, you're gonna have some sort of a function there, so const test, and you're gonna get two different things as params, request and the response. If you remember, on the right side, we specify where are we taking things from, in this case, from the request object, and in here, you can say, what are you taking off? 
Usually we have the body, we have the params and so on. So you really will be using object destruction a lot. And then if you take a look at the React example, in React, you're gonna have some components that look like this. Component is going to be an arrow function. And then in there, you're gonna get something known as props. People also always destructure the props. So you can immediately take the keys and values from those props like so using the destructuring. That's it. But everything in the right time. Right now you know what object destructuring is. So if you see it in a tutorial or in a video or somewhere else while learning these frameworks, you're gonna know what it is. And with object destructuring, we also have array destructuring. It is a bit less used, but still it is there. So let me show you how it works. Let's say that you have an array and that's gonna look something like this. Const introduction and it's gonna contain a few words inside of it. Hello is gonna be the first word. Then we're gonna have I, then we're gonna have something like M and then let's do something like Sarah. Hello, I am Sarah. So how would you take the greeting from this array? You would have to do something like this. Const greeting is equal to and then in there you can say introduction and specify the index. In this case, zero, we want to get hello. And now you can do the same thing with the name. So const name, and that's going to be under the index of three, just like so. Now we can finally console log the greeting and we can console log the name and we get a hello, Sarah. Now that's a lot of work just to do that. So we can use array destructuring. Array destructuring allows you to take only some of the values from an array. In this case, let's do something like this. The syntax is the syntax is similar to object destructuring, but you do it like this, const, and then you put square brackets here, and then is equal to, and then from where you want to take the properties out, in this case, introduction. Now, in objects, you specify the keys you wanted to take out, like person, name, animals, car, whatever. But in, in arrays, we don't have keys, right? So by what logic can you take properties out? Well, by indexes. So what you can do is you can specify, for example, something like greeting. And what do you think this greeting is going to be equal to? Let's console log it. As you can see, we get hello. So greeting is the zero index or the first value here. And that corresponds to the zero index or the first value in the array. And then if we add something like this, second thing, so let's do something like A, what is A going to be equal to? Well, it is equal to, to the second thing in the array. Now, what you can do is you can add empty commas. So if you only want to take the last thing is you can add two empty commas there, and then you can get to the last thing, which is a name. Now we can console log that name. And as you can see, we get hello, Sarah. Not all that useful because this is also not a big deal to do. We can easily do that, but you can see if you need it, you have it. This is array destructuring. Object destructuring is used much more often because it has so much more functionalities, but now you know both object and array destructuring. And with that, we covered all of the most modern JavaScript features, ES6+. Everything that you need to know, now you know. Let's move forwards.